Yes, this one. One of the best views of the hospital. It's over the water. I just turn off some of those lights. That's all. Okay. Yeah, I think that's fine. So thank you, Lucky. Uh, thank you, Harsh. Uh, I've enjoyed the meeting. And uh, my talk today is surgery for adult hemispheric gliomas. And in particular, how do we uh, maximize our surgical resection? Now, the debate about surgery for gliomas has been uh, time immemorial and has swung, the pendulum has swung between biopsy, decompression, or resection. And it keeps varying. But in recent times, it is now swinging more towards resection as there is increasing evidence that the extent of resection is a very important uh, prognostic factor that reduces the recurrences and the malignant transformation in low-grade glioma and the progression in high-grade gliomas. The aim of surgery thus is to ensure a maximal safe resection without adding to the patient's morbidity. So how does this benefit? It reduces disease burden, improves the efficacy and tolerance of adjuvant treatment, it preserves and sometimes enhances cognition and other neurological deficits your patient might have. And as with everything else, the focus, the, out, the focus of outcome has shifted from not only preservation of life, but improvement of the quality of life. So there are innumerable studies that, uh, that uh, document the overwhelming advantage of uh, Resection. This is a study on low-grade gliomas, where uh, estimated five-year survival uh, was 74 to 60 percent. And uh, what is interesting is the malignant transformation. The incidence of malignant transformation is also significantly reduced, and this can alter the natural history of the disease. So again, uh, other studies on volumetric resection of low-grade gliomas. The less the extent of resection, the uh, long-term survival drops. Uh, similarly, for high-grade gliomas, for glioblastomas, uh, the greater the extent of resection, a more than 98% extent of resection is necessary for improved survival. And time to progression has a strong correlation with uh, the extent of resection. Uh, over the years, we have uh, our figures. So over the years, these are the figures that we have had at our place. Uh, the spectrum of gliomas, a total of 490 as of uh, 21. And uh, we have uh, achieved the gross total, a new total resection in uh, an average of 48% higher in low grades. And we have over the years increasingly adopted the practice of awake surgery. So the ultimate goal is, uh, again, to obtain maximal resection. The problem here is why, where the practical difficulty for the surgeon lies is in the intraoperative 
uh, differentiation between what is tumor and what is normal brain, which can sometimes be very, very difficult. And uh, most surgeons, many surgeons rely on their experience and in low-grade tumors very often their tactile uh, sensitivity to help you to distinguish. But this statement is also very much true which all of us know. A surgeon's extent, the surgeon's assessment of extent of resection is more often than not incorrect. And the only way to document this is by a post-operative imaging, a post-operative MRI, which should be and is mandatory in all glioma surgery. So, uh, like I said, the problem lies with delineation, the differentiation between normal tissue and the abnormal tissue. There are many different ways of doing it, apart from the physical differences. There are technologies that help the intraoperative imaging, functional assessment and mapping, and uh, uh, using various dyes and markers and uh, newer techniques that can help. So uh, the commonly used ones are intraoperative guidance and navigation uh, using uh, either a standard navigation or imaging. Uh, dyes like fluorescein and ala. And uh, the, it starts off with planning the resection, planning the surgery well before by a, a good understanding of the deficits which the disease has caused the patient and the extent of involvement using uh, different kinds of imaging techniques. Uh, the present generation MRI sequences are extremely sensitive and using a variety of them one can not only uh, determine the extension of the tumor not only the visible margins of the tumor, but where all it has extended, the tracts and the functional areas that are involved by the tumor. And this helps the surgeon to plan the procedure. So navigation is probably one of the most common ways uh, that uh, surgeons use to uh, uh, identify the tumor margins. It's very effective, very practical, the biggest problem in intraaxial tumors is, the, is, the, is to compensate for brain shift that will invariably happen as you remove the tumor. So what navigation also does uh, is to allow an integration with other modalities like an ultrasound that you can use to update the registration and compensate for shifts. You can also use them in innovative ways like using trackers on many of the tools that you use like in the, like the ultrasonic surgical aspirator and use that to guide where uh, uh, to, to chase the, the depths of the tumor or the margins of the tumor. One can also use an old technology, the fence post by placing markers at the periphery of the tumor using a navigation before the dura is opened and these help you and these will shift as a brain shifts. So it always gives you that not only the margins but also the depth which can sometimes be a problem in gliomas. Ultrasound like I said is extremely useful and increasingly used now and uh, this is an example of an intraoperative imaging, a frontal tumor, which is well seen on the ultrasound and after resection. Uh, this is a confirmation of resection, which is corroborated by the postoperative MRI. What is also now available in select cases is uh, the use of contrast enhanced ultrasound by using micro bubbles that can show not only vascular anatomy, but like uh, 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 a standard dye for a vascular tumor. It can delineate the tumor a lot better. So intraoperative MRI is nice but not always available. So we use what is called an extraoperative MRI. Uh, 
uh, we uh, shift the patient straight to the MR suite from the theater and get an imaging done immediately after the surgery. So if there is a significant residue, we always have the option of taking the patient back straight into the theater. This is an example of a young man who had uh, this temporal lesion. The immediate post-op scan showed a residual disease. So we took him back in and we were able to take it out and this man has remained stable five years now since the surgery. Uh, electrophysiological mapping and uh, cortical and subcortical mapping is extremely important to uh, and gives the surgeon an idea of the functional status and uh, helps the surgeon to protect and preserve functional areas and connections within the brain and helps to maintain the quality of life and allows the resection to be pushed while maintaining the safety of the patient. So uh, this is supplemented by direct cortical and subcortical stimulation and by awake surgery. Preoperatively, the use of transcranial magnetic stimulation coupled with uh, navigation can help to map some of these functional areas before surgery and uh, allow the surgeon to plan a resection. So the standard ways of, uh, uh, this is probably one of the most common ways of uh, electrophysiological mapping, the central sulcus mapping using phase reversal. And like I said, we increasingly use awake craniotomy that allows us to monitor a whole range of uh, cortical functions, motor, language, and other cognitive functions. Cognition is extremely important and the patient's cognitive status often correlates with the tumor progression or the response to treatment. You can see in this series of images this uh, lady who had this uh, small left frontal lesion way back and as the tumor progressed she began to develop deficits, cognitive deficits. The initial treatment, this was a, uh, this was a uh, uh, glioblastoma. After the initial uh, resection, her cognitive status improved. She remained on follow-up with a constant monitoring and the drop in the cognitive performance predated the changes on the MR and she was retreated. Unfortunately, she succumbed a, a few months after the progression in spite of uh, second-line therapy. The extent of resection can also be used by using staged procedures rather than sticking to a single stage procedure. This also helps to take advantage of the brain's uh, ability to reorganize its functions, the plasticity. So this is a large dominant hemisphere uh, glioma, which uh, you can see the functional MRI, the language localization was at the posterior edge of the tumor. This was resected. You can see the marker on, on the edge of the, of the cavity, which still showed, uh, reject, uh, built, which still uh, was, uh, showed speech arrest on stimulation. A year later, the MRI has shown, the functional MRI has shown a shift in the, in the language uh, areas as, as were identified on the scan. The concept of supramaximal resection is not new. It is old, described as early as uh, 1925 by Dandy. And uh, over time, this has made a resurgence with increasing uh, ability to map the functional areas and to, and to image. And uh, though the outcomes, though the effect of this is, is not yet very clear, but there is, there seems to be a definite advantage to uh, doing a supramaximal resection wherever possible. So uh, the visually enhanced methods, the most common one is the 5-ALA and the fluorescein, which are fairly commonly used now. And they uh, do correlate, there are enough publications showing the good correlation between the extent of resection using these techniques and the improvement in outcomes. 
it's also though it is largely uh, applicable in in high grade tumors low grade tumors are also being shown to take up fluorocene which can be identified by confocal microscopy and this device called the convivo is now available for uh, uh, to uh, for intraoperative identification of uh, of fluorescence at the tumor edge there are other techniques like the use of uh, raman spectroscopy which can delineate tumor from normal areas though this is not yet in uh, 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 widely available so these are some examples some case examples uh, showing how a good extent of resection can be obtained a young lady with a large hemispheric lesion a large frontal lesion that can be completely excised using all these techniques as have been described and like i said all these do correlate with the progression or the prevention of progression and the malignant transformation in the lower grade gliomas and the progression in higher grade gliomas now this was a young man who was initially uh, decompressed elsewhere and referred for radiation the radiation oncologist sent the patient uh to us for resection and we were able to get it out completely it's now 3 years after the surgery he's not required radiation and he continues to remain on follow up so uh the importance of functional deficits now this is a middle aged lady with a parietal lesion and uh, you know when we took it out we stopped because she started saying that my hand is feeling clumsy it's been 6 years now since the surgery and to date she still says my hand is clumsy and for a housewife she's not happy she cannot work at home she cannot cook so it's not just a weakness it's a very subtle deficit that that sometimes matter for these people and there are times when you do have to call it quits like this young man who had operated way back in 2010 uh this was a uh, uh, dominant side grade 2 initially uh it we had treated him at that time because he there was substantial residual disease he was followed up over the years and uh, about 4 years later he recovered had a resurgery underwent radiation and chemotherapy the family was still very very keen to push but if you see the scans at the bottom this is a point where everyone would say no more there is a point beyond which you will not push and i think this is very very important to understand a discussion with the patient and the family so that everybody is very clear as to what the goals of surgery are the goals of treatment are is probably extremely important to them so in conclusion surgery for gliomas has progressed from the early days of just a simple biopsy we now look at gross total excision the supra marginal excisions functional preservation is extremely important and we do know now that there is a lot of correlation between how far about a good surgery and a long term survival for these people thank you thank you thank you panikya for a great lecture and teaching us how you can uh, one can maximize excision for these difficult tumors and uh, uh, also you know you have a large experience of more than close to 500 cases what i thought you know initially you told uh, around uh, 290 or things were in the frontal lobe yes yeah. Uh, but you know uh, this uh, something which i learned uh, when i went for a meeting to bangalore uh, so you know people have found that you know increasingly that uh, frontal parietal and occipital lesions are more of uh, oligodendroglioma and temporal and insular lesions more of astrocytoma mm. and uh, another very important thing which has happened other than maximizing resection is you know people have found that you know if as you correctly told astrocytomas one have one has to be 
as radical as possible. If you leave something there, it can grow, as opposed to oligos. Oligos, even if you leave something, they respond reasonably well to PCV and radiation. As opposed to astros, they may not respond to adjuvant treatment. And what has happened very recently is, you know, that IDH mutated uh, things could be either oligo, 1P19Q deleted, is co-deleted is oligo, or ATRX loss is astro. If IDH is wild type, immediately it becomes GBM. Yeah. So that is the thing, IDH wild type becomes GBM. But unfortunately, some, sometimes IDH wild type will have low histology. Histology may look like benign. Yeah. But then what people have told is look for three mutations. One is EGFR amplification, TURT mutation, and uh, uh, one more thing which I for forgot. I think MIC amplification. Sorry, 1P, sorry, uh, chromosome 7 gain and 10 loss. 7, 10. If these hmm. three things are there, even if it is histologically looking low grade for a IDH wild type, it, you have to go up front and blast that thing with adjuvant treatment. Same, same way the CDKN2AB. Absolutely, that is for low grade. Low grade the homozygous deletion IDH, of CDKN2AB. Uh, uh, See, pathology has become a major confounder now. Yeah, yeah. And that has changed many things. Uh, yeah. But still, yeah. in spite of all that, yeah. for the surgeon, yeah. this remains a fundamental and the first step Absolutely. in getting a good outcome yeah. in Absolutely. treatment. Can I ask a question? Just one more. The other thing is, you know, you can, there are so many advances have come in imaging also yeah. to tell whether it is oligo or astro. And oligos are, uh, say they are not homo inhomogeneous, indistic margin, mm. they can show high perfusion. What is characteristic, not there is, you know, this flare, uh, T2 flare mismatch, which is characteristic for IDS mutated uh, low grade glioma. Mm. For oligos, that mismatch won't be there. There is, there is another thing on, on imaging for. Uh for in the using FA values, if yeah. you compute the FA values, yeah. there is a correlation with the IDH uh, status. Again, these are all studies. And them, also, none of them have come into standard use yeah. as yet. Very good. And uh, I'll I'm going to ask a question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, Dilip, a very practical question. Uh, you say not intra-op but outside of MRI. Mm. How do you close? Do you just primarily do the full closure and take or just do the skin attacking stitch and then take the patient down and come back and do no. the closure later? No, we close. You primarily we close? We primarily close. So if the MRI is good, patient goes to the ICU. Okay. If the MRI is not because good, then, patient then you have comes to come back. back and reopen the whole thing. You have to reopen. Okay. That's so here what happens is we don't... But you do don't extubate? We don't extubate. It's on ventilator. Okay. Or, or if it's an awake, it's straight away. Yeah. But the fact is... The wound is closed. At the end of surgery, the wound is closed. And then? You do the MRI. I do the okay. MRI. Second point is, that means you extubate all these patients in the ICU only. Yeah. Most of my gliomas now have shifted to awake. So, okay. so you, sort of. Okay. Third question, the marker which you place, what do you use? <laughs> right. Because it should not move once you start operating. No. You put ventric cats. Sorry? You just put ventriclostomy tubes. It's very simple. Right, right, right. You no, 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 get your trajectory to the depth. No. What is also described, there is, I mean, I've read this, I have not tried this so far, is uh, where your tumor is abutting a tract and you want to protect it, put a depth electrode there. So while you're operating on the tumor, you can, you can stimulate through the depth electrode and ensure, uh, yeah. So if you have a pre-motor glioma and your, and your corticospinals are bent over that, you can put a depth between the tumor, between the visible margin of the tumor and the tract as you see on the MR. And while you're operating, you can keep stimulating the depth. So you're getting not only a surface, but even a subcortical stimulation there. Okay. Thanks, Monique. And Thank we you. have to move on. And uh, may I invite my co-chair, uh, Dwaraganath Srinivas, who is head of the Department of uh, Neurosurgery at National Institute of Mental Health Sciences and, uh, at Bangalore. Uh, Dwaraga, you are sitting from here and talking. No, 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 yeah. no, no, no. And he is going to talk to us on complex MC aneurysms, the management options. Thank
Thanks for reaching here, Dwaraka. You reach 3 a.m. or 4 a.m. I, I was going to say, on, the, on behalf of all of us, really thankful to Dwaraka because he finished yesterday's uh, demands program and took a midnight flight. Thank you, Dwaraka, for being here. Good morning and uh, thanks to Professor Tripathi for inviting me. I'm sorry I could not come because we had our, uh, we had our Imhans alumni meet which got over yesterday afternoon. Um, so I'll be speaking on complex aneurysms, MC aneurysms and the strategies in managing them. So uh, just a moment. Yeah. How do I hide this? No, no, here on my screen. Uh, so, th so these are the, uh, some of the aneurysms which we have operated. These are quite simple. I mean, you could uh, treat them with one or two clips and most of the MC aneurysms can be obliterated completely. Learning the problems of a hybrid meeting. So, uh, but the problem remains with MC aneurysms that because of the shape of the uh, shape of the neck, sometimes you are unable to obliterate with one or two clips, and you might have to use some curved clips or some small clips to uh, clip the residual neck. But usually with uh, either two or three clips, it's usually uh, possible to uh, clip an MC aneurysm. So I will not be discussing about that. What I will be discussing is about complex aneurysms. So complex aneurysms are what we call either a giant or large aneurysms or those aneurysms which incorporate the parent artery or the adjacent arterial branches at the base of the fundus. Uh, calcification or atherosclerotic neck of the atherosclerotic thickening of the aneurysm neck, which makes placing a clip impossible because the clip tends to slip onto the parent vessel. Dissecting aneurysms and blister aneurysms, though not very common in MCA, they are more common in the ICA. And those which cannot be treated by endovascular methods or recurrent aneurysms following, following coiling. So for these cases, what management modalities do we have? Uh, we have clipping, uh, the good old standard, reconstruction, exclusion from circulation with either a bypass, which could either be a low flow or a high flow bypass, or sacrifice of a parent vessel. Even though the sacrifice of the parent vessel is usually done in ICA aneurysms, it's not uh, usually po possible with an MC aneurysm. So the question is first, you have to ask yourself whether these can be clipped. So the clipping techniques vary. You could either use intersecting clips, booster clips, tandem clips, tandem angle fenestrated clips, counter clips, or vertical dome stacking with reconstruction. So uh, this is a small. Sorry. So for example, this we uh, this video we operated during the peak of COVID. This was a young girl uh, with an aneurysm. So if you see closely, uh, you could see that the aneurysm appears to incorporate the M2 segment. You see the branch over here and this was a large thrombosed aneurysm. But what happened was after we put the temporary clip and evacuated the hematoma, we were able to place the clip. So sometimes the aneurysms might not look as complex as they appear on scans. 
but these are tougher aneurysms. When the aneurysm starts incorporating the parent vessel, then you'll have to use multiple clips to uh, clip the aneurysm. For example, like this, you'll have to reconstruct the uh, uh, parent vessel. So this is the aneurysm I'm talking about. If you can see carefully, this is the M uh, segment, and you can see this is this is the proximal and this is the distal, and the aneurysm neck has. Uh, incorporated the parent vessel itself. So whenever you try to put a single clip, what happens is the uh, parent vessel starts getting kinked and the distal flow stops. So for these cases, then you'll have to use uh, multiple fenestrated stack uh, clips to reconstruct the parent vessel. Uh, the, the amount of uh, fenestrated clips required varies upon the size and shape of the aneurysm. For example, in this patient, we used five fenestrated straight clips and reconstructed the parent vessel. So here we are, we have used total of five clips, reconstructed the parent vessel and you can see the flow distally to it very well. So this is another, um, a little more complicated uh, example in which it's a trifoliate pattern involving both the proximal MC and the, uh, both the M2 branches and uh, here, and also was thrombo. So here also we used five clips, uh, sorry, seven clips of various sizes and uh, the reconstruction was done. Now the question is what happens is when reconstruction is not possible. So when reconstruction is not possible, uh, we'll have to use a bypass. Uh, Dr. Shaker classified bypasses into either a local or a ECIC bypass. So the li local bypasses include the interposition grafts. Even though they appear to be the simplest, they're actually the most complicated because you have a double uh, occlusion time in which you have to do both the proximal and the distal anastomosis. Then you have an end-to-end -end re-suture or a side-to-side -side, uh, suture, most probably, most usually done for the A3 or the pica pica bypasses or a re-implantation. Then you have the ECIC bypasses in which you could either use a low flow origin like the uh, STA or the, not the MCA, sorry, either the STA or the occipital artery and uh, anastomose it to the posterior circulation or the anterior circulation or use a high flow graft like the greater saphenous vein or the radial artery to, you, uh, to do the bypass. So these are a di diagrammatic representation. This is what I was saying. This is an interposition graft. So what happens with the interposition graft is the clamping time doubles because the proximal uh, feeder has to be occluded for a longer time because you have to do both the proximal anastomosis as well as the distal anastomosis. And this is a side-to-side -side anastomosis but which is not used in MCA but it's used for pica and the uh, A3 segments. And this is a representation of the ECA M2 bypass with the greater saphenous vein graft. So how do we classify bypasses? The, basic, the bypasses are classified as either low flow bypass, intermediate by flow bypass, or a high flow bypass. Uh, I will, uh, the STMCA bypass is used for a lot of things, including Moya Moya disease, so most of you are familiar with it. But the high flow bypass is one thing which is rarely used. So the, the difference between the radial artery and the saphenous vein is that the saphenous vein has a higher diameter. But the greatest advantage of saphenous vein is the length. You can get a very good length with a saphenous vein, which sometimes may not be possible with the radial artery. And you always have to do the Allen's test as well as an ultrasonic uh, measurement of the diameter of the radial artery to find out the caliber of the radial artery and whether it is suitable for harvesting. <coughs> but the advantage of radial artery is that it's easier to suture. There's a more likelihood that the diameter will match with the uh, door, uh, with the recipient vessel. But the drawbacks of the radial artery is that many, pay, many people have reported problems of uh, vasospasm, which, uh, was dis which can be overcome by the pressure distension technique which was initially described by Dr. Shaker. And like I mentioned, the patency of the palmar art and the limited length is a flow, uh, drawback. The saphenous vein on the other hand is a very good graft uh, because of the length and the caliber. But the problem is the shorter, uh, lesser short-term patency rates. Uh, and, the, and the one thing you have to remember with the saphenous vein is that because of the valves, it always in unidirectional flow. By mistake, if you happen to reverse the direction of saphenous vein, the graft will 100% fail. And then there is a size mismatch. And saphenous vein uh, grafts usually require long-term ecostomy. So there was this beautiful article by uh, Lawton on the classification of bypasses. He divided it into uh, four generations, seven generations, 
and depending on the number of anastomoses. So what I'll do is I'll just go through the uh, types of bypasses we, uh, they, we have done. So this is, this is a classical example in which uh, we could reconstruct the parent vessel. What happened was even though the parent vessel was, uh, sorry, the aneurysm was incorporating one of the M2 segments, the other M2 was uh, free. So what we thought was we could sacrifice one of the M2 and do an STMCA bypass to that. So we did an STMCA bypass to one of the vessel, one of the M2s and then the aneurysm was trapped and the other M2 was getting supply from the ICA itself. So this was the this was the example of how we manage that aneurysm. Then you could do a double barrel bypass so in which you take both the uh, anterior and the temporal branches of the ST and anastomosis to both the branches of the M2. Uh, so this is what we did in this case in which both the branches were incorporated in the aneurysm. Uh, even though the patient did well on the post-op scan we could see that one of the uh, barrels had failed, but luckily this was the non-dominant one. Probably it could be a flow-related flow failure, but uh, this failed, but the patient was well preserved and he had, he just had a small infarct. The other is the intermediate flow bypasses uh, in the MCA in which you could re-implant one of the MCA trunks onto the other MCA trunk. For, the, for example, if you see this, in this aneurysm, uh, this branch, this is the MCA and this is the bifurcation, the post bifurcation one of the M2s is incorporated in the aneurysm. So these are basically very difficult to reconstruct uh, and this patient also was COVID positive unfortunately. So all this was done under with, uh, with full of full PPEs. So what we decided was on table we tried, uh, we exposed the aneurysms and we tried clipping the aneurysms. And this is an example, we put multiple stack clips, we did all this sort of drama in the OT. And uh, unfortunately, whatever we tried, the aneurysm was not being, uh, uh, could not be clipped properly. So there was always a residual here, here, here. So uh, what we thought was we will uh, excise the aneurysm, take the branch distal to it, uh, take the part of the MCA distal to it, bring it to the other MCA trunk, uh, MC M2, and then re-implant it onto this. So the uh, so both of the MCS were getting, uh, both of the trunks were getting fed, fed from the proximal single trunk. So this is what we did, in which this is the MCA parent, and the, both the MCA trunks are getting fed from the proximal part of one MCA trunk, uh, M2 trunk, and the other one is blocked completely. Then coming to high flow bypasses. High flow bypasses can be used, see, most of the MCAs are, once they start becoming either fusiform or giant aneurysms, what happens is that the, it's difficult to put a flow diverter because the, the distal landing area is quite difficult to achieve and most of the time the vessel becomes very tortuous. So this is an example of a giant thrombose serpentine aneurysm uh, uh, who presented with uh, WFNS grade 1 bleed and this was the uh, uh, reconstruction but in reality the aneurysm was actually much bigger than what it was on angiogram. This is because the thrombus is generally not seen on the angiogram. Uh, it is usually better seen on either on a CT or an MRI. So then what we did was we, because both of the distal MCS had to be, uh, M2s had to be occluded, we thought we will do a ECA M2 bypass uh, using the saphenous vein. So this is the Sylvian Fisher opening. The the MCA is uh, MCA bifurcation is dissected and exposed. <coughs> so this is one M2 segment and this is the other M2 segment. These are the pro proximal M2 segments and the, and the MCA trunk and aneurysm is somewhere down here. So here we use the greater saphenous vein as a graft. I generally prefer to do the distal anastomosis first because it gives a little more flexibility. This is the graft preparation. You fishtail it. We generally use either a 8O or a 9O for the uh, distal anastomosis. Uh, 
The surgery is done on, with heparin cover around uh, 3,000 to 4,000 units depending upon the body weight of the patient. The first, the uh, principles of uh, bypass include you first uh, make sure that the graft is sitting well aligned with the recipient. So you put the heel stitch first. Greatest difficulty with the MC aneurysms, which is actually much more with the posterior flow, posterior circulation bypasses, is the depth in which you are operating. So you need good long instruments uh, and uh, to reach the depths. So this is this is in the surgeon fissure. First you do the heel stitch, then you do the toe stitch. So once I'll just go a little faster. Once the toe stitch is done. You do the opposite side, uh, which is slightly difficult. But generally, because the proximal anastomosis is not done, both the sides are almost equally easy. Then you do the same side anastomosis. You always should remember that the aneurysm should come at, an, at the, see, the graft should come at, in a, at an angle to the uh, uh, vessel in which you are trying to implant it. So here, after the clip is open, then we do the. Generally, I use the ECA for as the do, as the donor vessel. Here the, both the CCAs, the ICAs are clamped and uh, this is the opening on the uh, ECA. Uh, you could either use a carotid punch or you could use a scissors and excise a part of the wall and make a generous opening. Again uh, the same principles are used but here we use a 6O or a 7O proline or a ethylon, uh, round body 3, 3 eighth of a needle. Here again we do the toe stitch and the heel stitch. But the difference is here you could do it as, as a continuous suture compared to the cranial anastomosis. So that was the uh, heel stitch and this is the toe stitch. Like I said, we do the opposite side first because that's a more difficult side. Uh, in fact, uh, in the cranial anastomy, in this uh, high flow bypasses the neck. Neck is the usual side where the blockage occurs, so you have to be very careful regarding how you do the anastomosis. The cranial side is invariably free. It's the neck which is the one which gets blocked. I, it could be due to a variety of factors like either a clot or uh, kinking of the vessels or an inadequate opening in the parent uh, ECA. So once you do the dis, uh, opposite side, you do the distal side, sorry, the same side, and here we are again doing a continuous suture, and here the uh, anastomosis is almost complete, and uh, after the clips are removed, you can see the good pulsations of the uh, graft. Then what we do is, now, we done, now that we know that the graft is patent, you have a lot of time to dissect. You could either try opening the aneurysm and uh, dissecting it and trying to reconstruct it or you could occlude the parent, uh, uh, the vessel itself. So this is the bypass. You could see the blood flowing from the uh, uh, graft into the distal vessels. So now that you have confirmed the patency, the uh, MCA trunk is uh, dissected. Uh, the, the only worry here would be the lenticulostriates. The lenticulostriates somehow in these aneurysms have already occluded gradually. So, I mean, so far we have not had problems uh, luckily. Uh, but you always have to be careful of the uh, trunks and occlude as much possible close to the base of the aneurysm as possible. So that was the proximal at the ICA bifurcation. And then we dis dissect out the uh, distal uh, MCA bifurcation and then re replace the temporary clip with the permanent clip. Uh, we generally prefer trapping even though uh, people say that you could just do a proximal clipping and leave the aneurysm. So what happens is sometimes there could be a distal reflux into the aneurysm and the aneurysm can enlarge and uh, rupture. So I, uh, I generally prefer to uh, trap the aneurysm on both sides so there is no blood flow at all and then the hemostasis is achieved. 
So this is the post-operative imaging. You can see the uh, bypass from here, from the ECA onto the uh, parent vessel with a good distance. So this is another case of a giant thrombosed MCA aneurysm in which we use a radial graft. If you carefully see that the M one of the MCAs is rounded over here, so that means this implies there's a huge thrombus here. Again, uh, this, this is a radial artery graft. This was done in a workshop yesterday by Dr. Shaker himself. And uh, this is uh, uh, this is the post-operative angio showing good uh, flow into the distal MCAs with the aneurysm completely obliterated. So then you come to the other co other um, uh, complex MC aneurysms, which are, which are flow-related aneurysms with the AVMs. So these are some of the flow-related aneurysms. Uh, sorry, here it is. So in which the aneurysms are associated with distal AVMs. I mean, here you could, I mean, you could, uh, some people would like to try embolization, try it riding over the crisis and then going and excising it. But with these grade 1 uh, spatula martin or grade 2 spatula martin which have flow related aneurysms, especially where the aneurysm can be clipped easily, I somehow prefer to excise them with uh, and then uh, clip the aneurysm. So this is what we did in this case. So uh, we excise the AVM and uh, clip the aneurysm at the neck. Sir, done. So then you have the multiple aneurysms. The trick is to treat each aneurysm as separate aneurysms and you can invariably clip them. We've had combinations MCA with Bacillar, MCA with ACOMS. So treat each of them separately and uh, most of them are clippable. So over the last 10 years we've had 279 giant aneurysms that are institute of various territories. I'll just stick to the MCA territory aneurysm. The data is still till 2019-2020. Uh, we've had 33 large and giant aneurysms because most were clipped uh, and we did a high, high flow bypass in the rest. But wa and, and the pa patients had a reasonably good outcome. But what was interesting was that uh, the endovascular out of the two cases, one had a good outcome, the data is too small. But eight patients who either refused surgery or wanted conservative management or did not want surgery immediately and wanted to wait for longer time only one patient survived at the end of six months. So the natural history of this giant and giant and large aneurysm is quite dismal and some treatment is required even though the patient presents either with uh, warning bleed or no bleed at all. So like I mentioned, uh, these are last two slides. Sir. The lenticlostriates are the ones which are important. You have to keep them in mind. Uh, clipping, they might be a residual neck, so we might have to add on smaller clips to uh, manage the residual necks. Always preserve the FTA when you're doing the craniotomy. You never know when you need it. Uh, you have to do a patency check, especially with the greater saphenous vein. You should make sure that it is not reversed. The other problem with the greater saphenous vein is that the proximal and the distal end may have different diameters. And usually the distal one is a, uh, has a larger diameter and the proximal one has a smaller diameter. And in the patient, it's actually ULTA. The uh, ECA has a larger caliber and the MCA has a smaller caliber. So there is... Most, most of the times, GSV, there is usually a unusable, uh, the, uh, lumen size mismatch. Early complications include visospasm and thrombosis. Incomplete trapping, like I mentioned, can lead to aneurysm rupture. EDH and V-perfusion injuries can occur. We've had one case of EDH post-op, usually due to heparin. Uh, delayed blockage, very unusual. Once the patient survives for three, to, uh, once the graft survives for three to five days, uh, blockage usually does not occur unless the patient stops aspirin in, uh, for a greater saphenous vein grafts infection. So I, I would like to end by saying a thorough study of the anatomy is necessary. Surgery is still the best modality for MC aneurysms, especially the complex ones. You need to have suitable clips, always preserve the STA, bypass good results and unlike IC aneurysms, trapping and sacrifice is generally not an option and you either need to clip the aneurysm or have to use a bypass to manage these patients. Thank you. Great lecture. Uh, so, super, super lecture. Uh, let me ask you a couple of questions before I give to the audience. Say, for all aneurysm, suppose IC aneurysm is there. Uh, say, do, do you still do uh, distal anastomosis first or it's only for MC aneurysm? Sir, whenever there is a, so IC aneurysm is a different uh, thing because 
all the IC aneurysms undergo balloon occlusion. Uh, yeah. Balloon occlusion. Yeah. Balloon occlusion testing. Yeah. So once in the balloon occlusion testing, you basically have three stages. One is the immediate balloon occlusion. One is the, dis uh, the uh, delayed balloon occlusion. Then you have the hypotensive challenge. Yeah. So in if the patient fails uh, uh, immediate balloon occlusion, the patient needs a high flow bypass. Yeah. Uh, if the patient has a delayed occlusion, uh, sorry, a delayed uh, deterioration symptoms, especially during the high flow yeah. challenge, that means there is some cross flow across the ACOM into the, uh, the opposite side or through the PCOM into the, uh, into the anterior circulation. Then in these patients, you could do a low flow bypass with an STA and then do the, uh, uh, then, then treat the address. But always generally if the patient has failed a balloon occlusion test in an IC aneurysm, it's wiser to do an distal anastomosis first and then try treating that. And uh, also you told uh, uh, that, you know, because of some landing area, difficulty for giant serpentine aneurysm, flow diverter may, be an op may not be an option. Yes. Uh, but with the technology coming, do you think in future uh, they, these things all will be managed by endovascular technique? Could be, sir. Uh, yeah. In fact, the aneurysm which I showed you, the second case, in fact, day before yesterday, Dr. Shekhar and myself, we did it for the workshop at Nimhan. Yeah. Uh, this was precisely the problem. The patient went in for flow diverter. Yeah. They could not uh, uh, guide the catheter through it and they could not do the distal landing. And if you see, most of these times, sometimes these vessels are not very healthy with healthy vessels. They have some sort of uh, changes, uh, vasculitic changes which occur. So it becomes very distal, difficult to put a flow diverter distal to it. Proximal is generally okay unless the vessel is very tortuous or the patient has some vasculitis-like features. Uh, but generally, these flow diverters are quite difficult to put in this patient. Uh, other problem with the flow diverters is the lenticulostrides can still get blocked. And uh, just one more thing, that one AVM with flow related yes. aneurysm. I say a long time back, you know, we have taught people that you take care of that AVM aneurysms will disappear. Is it still holds good or you treated both, you know? Sir, uh, that depends on where the aneurysm is. There are two yeah. types of aneurysm. One is intranidal aneurysms and other is not so flow, like flow related flow, aneurysms. Flow, yeah. So flow related aneurysms, what happens is it depends on where you are operating. For example, this aneurysm which I showed was from the uh, temporal branch of the uh, yeah. temporal branch of the MC. Yeah. So then uh, you could uh, access the aneurysm and uh, trap uh, clip it. Thank you. Yeah. Say, uh, Dr. Just yeah. quickly, you said one case you abandoned. What was the reason? Was it very complicated or one of the cases you? So, yes, yeah, that was one of the old cases where we are still not started doing bypass. We started doing bypasses for the last four or five years. So these are some of our early cases in which we abandoned. I think we have to move on. And uh, may I invite uh, Secretary of Neurological Society of India, uh, the, the one and only case leader, to give his <laughs> talk on uh, neurosurgery. neurosurgery and tinnitus. Yeah. Good morning uh, to everybody and uh, thank you to Professor Ellen Tripathi for having me here, uh, though a little late. Uh, I came only yesterday evening and thanks for the opportunity to join this wonderful meeting. I'm going to talk on something which is a uh, little odd, uh, not very well recognized as a problem which can be solved by neurosurgeons, uh, but which is slowly now we are finding that there are reports of good uh, outcomes and what neurosurgeons can do for patients with tinnitus. You must understand that it's a very, very functionally disabling problem uh, which uh, many patients have, but most often we don't see them. It goes to our ENT colleagues. And uh, let us see what is happening now. We all know that Peter Janetta was the person who actually popularized this issue of uh, neurovascular conflict and uh, he's been talking about it not only for the trigeminal nerve but also for uh, the glossopharyngeal nerve 
uh, he also spoke about this in this 1977 paper uh, about it in the uh, about the acoustic nerve dysfunction meaning tinnitus and vertigo so this has been going on for some time but somehow things have not worked out well when we spoke about uh, microvascular decompression now but first let us understand what is tinnitus now tinnitus is defined as a perception of sound in the absence of a matching external stimulus so it can be described variably different patients have different types of sounds that they hear it may be pulsatile non pulsatile it may be high pitch medium pitch low pitch so it can be unilateral it can be bilateral but the thing to remember for us is that there are several conditions that can produce tinnitus and it includes all the ent conditions but it also includes tumors demyelination autoimmune disorders and also psychiatric disorders now on mri especially with the modern day mri we find the neurovascular conflict of the cochlear vestibular nerve very frequently though we do, those patients some of those patients don't have any tinnitus however with patients of tinnitus those who have a neurovascular conflict there are increasing reports of good outcomes but while the outcomes following mbd surgery for trigeminal neuralgia the good outcome is around 90% 95% in various series the good outcomes following mbd for intractable tinnitus is around 60 to 80% only a little bit about the anatomy because there are residents here this is from rotens article in 2000 uh, you can see that this is the 8th uh, 7th uh, 8th nerve complex which you see here and is actually what you see when you approach from the retrosigmoid approach is actually the superior and inferior vestibular nerves you must remember that these both these nerves fuse close to the meatus and then they come down as one nerve and then if you separate them as is separated here you would see the cochlear nerve anterior to the inferior vestibular nerve and then the facial nerve uh, above the superior that is the facial nerve is anterior to the superior vestibular nerve and then the cochlear nerve is anterior to the uh, inferior vestibular nerve but very interesting i want you to draw your attention to the diagram on the right where you can see that this is the facial nerve and this is the uh, cochlear nerve and there is a twist in the nerves as they approach the brain stem and this has been described very well in this article in 2004 by d reader at all where they talk about the 90 degree rotation as it approaches the uh, brain stem and therefore when you look at the orientation of the nerves as they come towards the brain stem the facial nerve is at, uh, near the brain stem in the lowermost position then comes the cochlear and then the vestibular and this is something which has to be understood when you are doing a microvascular decompression and also they have tried to correlate the pitch of the tinnitus to where the neurovascular conflict arises now what happens is there have been some papers including this one which have shown that there is a tonographical and topographical reorganization not only in the nerve in the nucleus but along the auditory pathway which happens over a period of time when there is tinnitus and that is probably the reason why some of these patients don't improve following microvascular decompression now the neurovascular conflicts there are four types which have been described with uh, respect to the vestibular cochlear nerve the type 1 which is a point compression type 2 a longitudinal compression type 3 a loop compression and type 4 an indentation now these are the different types which i am shown here uh, so let us look at some of what is happening in literature in 29 patients described uh, in this paper in 1998 tinnitus decreased or disappeared in 20 which is a very good result looking at the overall aspect of tinnitus now factors which impact the result positively include abnormal uh, brain stem uh, responses vertigo which is associated hearing loss associated and a low pitch or high pitch continuous tinnitus and also the shorter the duration of the tinnitus the better are the results in this particular paper in 2012 by zhang et al mvd was done in 35 patients of which 22 patients had tinnitus and the cure and effective rates 
uh, respectively were 56 and 84 percent. Though the cure was only in 56, it was really effective for the patient in 84 percent. And they advised that the surgical intervention should be done as soon as possible. In this particular paper in 2017, in 2000, yeah, 2017, 35 studies were looked at with 572 patients. The evidence was low, but they found that only 28% of patients with tinnitus and 32% with vertigo had complete relief. But when both vertigo and tinnitus were present, complete relief was present in 62%. So what they concluded was that if you had combined symptoms of both vertigo and tinnitus, it's more likely that the neurovascular conflict is the underlying pathology. They, however, showed a large number of complications, which to my mind, many are, uh, should not be happening and should be avoided. And this paper uh, spoke about techniques, surgical techniques on how to reduce these complications, which included sharp, sharp dissection of the arachnoid, avoiding stretching and monitoring of uh, the BAER and the cochlear compound potentials, and of course the use of the endoscope to look all around, because you must remember the cochlear is anterior. Now the endoscopic assisted retrosigmoid approach is the approach to be used for these patients and this is what is now the current gold standard when you're trying to do uh, MVD for tinnitus. So this is our uh, theater setup, how we do it. Uh, we don't have integration of the endoscope into the microscope, so we push the microscope away and then look through the endoscope. Now my personal series is 13 patients operated in the last one year or so. Uh, two patients, we did bilateral uh, surgeries on, at the same anesthesia for 15 years. Now we have follow a protocol which we have uh, learned that we should do and this is what we have been doing. The tinnitus handicap score is filled up by the patient first. All patients have a complete audiology evaluation including all the tests, uh, PTA, uh, BAER, tintogram, impedance, audiometry, etc. All patients should have had history of treatment with the ENT surgeon and clearance with ENT, and also treatment like masking and tinnitus uh, uh, retraining, etc., which should have failed before they come to us. Then, most important, a psychological evaluation and counseling. We also have the neuroradiologist involved to look at the MRI brain, where we have a tinnitus protocol to look at the neurovascular conflict and the 3D aspects of it to make sure that there is a conflict and we are not just seeing a vessel near the nerves. And then finally a patient counseling is done who are very clearly informed that the success rate is only about 75 to 80 percent and over a period of time. So this is a protocol which I think is very, very important if we are embarking on something which has got different causes, different connotations and a lot of psychological overlay can happen when you're dealing with a thing like tinnitus. Because many of these patients, they may actually have tinnitus, but because of the tinnitus, many of them get depressed uh, and get uh, anx uh, anxiety neurosis and things like that. And those have to be looked at and addressed before we can actually do any good work. We must remember that some of these cases also cause tinnitus. For example, a high-riding jugular bulb can be a very common cause of pulsatile tinnitus. And very often the patient will say that if they press the neck just under the jawbone, the tinnitus disappears. And that is a clue to say that probably it's a high-riding jugular which causes the tinnitus. This particular uh, MRI came to me from the US, uh, an Indian uh, doctor there who had severe tinnitus. Nobody was able to find the reason. But when we looked at the scan, our radiologist picked up this dot on the cochlear, probably the cochlear nerve, where it could probably a tumor. So we don't know what it is, but this was the only probable cause of this. So you must remember that you can have even small acoustics or vestibular schwannomas or things like that, which can cause tinnitus, which may be hidden. So this is my personal series data, uh, very busy slide. So I operate on these patients, supine head turned, uh, the intraoperative monitoring is basically facial AMG to make sure I'm not disturbing the facial nerve too much. Uh, the retrosigmoid approach is done, endoscopic assisted microsurgical MVD. So this is one case, 47 year old, four years bilateral tinnitus, but we operated on the left side because it was most severe on that side. It was a type three conflict on the left side, you can see here. 
So this is the, uh, you can see the arachnoid needs to be completely uh, dissected and then you sharply dissect it, remove, clear all the arachnoid. And then once the arachnoid is cleared, what we saw here was right near the meatus here was this loop. That's the cochlear nerve. And this was the loop uh, which was going under this between the two bundles and going there and causing the uh, neurovascular conflict. So uh, that was uh, taken care of. I use autologous muscle, which is a very controversial th topic, and we'll, uh, but I feel comfortable with it, and this is what was done. The patient improved to a 30% disability in three months, and the patient as such is very happy. This is another man from Delhi who came, 32-year-old male, left-sided tinnitus, but with mild to moderate depression, very disturbed due to tinnitus. He was not able to work. He, uh, he was getting married. He was very worried whether he will be able to lead a married life and things like that. We, we treated his depression for a, for a while, uh, but then he was insistent that his marriage date was coming, so he said, please operate on me, and, and I'll, I'm sure I'll stop getting depressed. So we operated on him. A uh, lot of thick arachnoid in this patient with the ICA loop on the nerve. The arachnoid dissection has to be sharp. You must make sure that the small vessels are not stretched. Uh, good dissection should be done. And then we use the endoscope to make sure that we are not missing anything. And we've thought that probably that loop going there uh, superiorly is, is the problem. And uh, that is what we, we ultimately uh, did. We put the muscle graft. But he didn't do very well. He only had a 10% disability drop even at six months. So not a very good result. Uh, he said, yeah, yeah, I'm better, I'm feeling better. But we actually looked at the scores and things like that. It was not very, very satisfying. This young man uh, had a seven-month uh, duration of severe tinnitus. His, his uh, tinnitus handicap score was almost 92. Uh, and he had a loop uh, here on the right side, which, which went right into the IAM. And uh, it was a definite cause, probably, of, of the tinnitus. So we operated on him, and this is the uh, complex. You can see this is the loop, which is going in here, and then right in, and then coming out. Now, we thought whether we should drill uh, the meatus and try to get it, but we were able to pull the loop out and, and push it superiorly. And uh, that's what we did, because that's why uh, I showed you the anatomy in the initial part. So we pushed it superiorly so that it was away from the cochlear component. And once we did that, we, we put a graft uh, near the brainstem. We put another graft uh, into the meatus to make sure the meatal part did not again come back and hitch on the nerve. And then here, uh, see, the thing bet between trigeminal neuralgia and this is that there is nothing to hold the graft uh, anterior to the complex. So sometimes if you put too small a graft, the graft will just drop into the CP angle cistern. So you have to make it large enough to hold. And therefore, in this case, we thought uh, we put a little bit of uh, fibrin glue to just hold the whole thing together. Uh, and uh, he did well. He improved to almost 70% improvement uh, on the, just the second post-operative day. It has just been uh, about three weeks since the surgery. So we hope that he will do better. So this is the immediate outcome on 14 days. You can see that many have improved, some have not. So if you look at it as a, a bar diagram, you will see that uh, uh, the, there is a, not a good outcome in, in, six, in uh, 14 days. Six had a poor outcome, meaning more than 80% residual disability. Moderate, which means 40 to 80% disability in six patients, but a good outcome uh, in 14 days in three patients. Now, when we looked at the three-month disability, 
what happened was that this improved to a, a, a more than 80% disability state in only two patients. The moderate disability improved to uh, seven patients and the good disability, uh, good uh, outcome improved to six patients, which was very, very satisfying. And when we looked at the 12 month uh, outcomes, uh, we found that the poor outcomes, those, those two patients did not improve any further after three months. And that is uh, something which we learned that probably after three months, if you don't improve, you may not improve. And uh, the moderate and the good also improved. And therefore, this was quite satisfying because what we have seen is that uh, gradually over a period of time, the patients have improved. And though the intensity and the loudness of the tinnitus reduce slowly, what happens is that majority of the patients start feeling comfortable and less affected by the tinnitus. Their quality of life changes. The sound is there, but they say, no, I'm not bothered by it. I can do my work. I can concentrate on my studies. And that for them is, is, a, is a good response for them when you look at satisfaction. I have not yet done the satisfaction scores because I want to give it a little more time. But this is the basic thing that we are doing now. Three are two minutes. Yes, finishing. Mortality was nil. Facial palsy, luckily, was nil. Nil increased hearing impairment. Three patients had transient vertigo and imbalance because of the handling of the vestibular nerve. Uh, but this disappeared uh, over uh, four to five days. Wound problems in two patients. So in conclusion, microvascular decompression, I think, is something which we must look at very seriously for intractable tinnitus. However, you must have a proper protocol-based patient selection because that is the most important thing which will affect your results. You must have a neuroradiologist who helps you with the, uh, with the uh, uh, diagnosis of a neurovascular conflict. You must use the endoscope in these patients, in all these patients to make sure. But the expectations should only be around 80% success. Don't tell the patient that you will become all right because you won't. The most important thing is what you do is you're improving their quality of life. Thank you very much. Thanks, Reader, uh, for again an informative lecture. A couple of uh, comments and one or two questions. Uh, the thing, uh, uh, comments is, you know, uh, say normally for, you know, it's a very low profile symptom. That is what always tinnitus. But of course, you have shown that some of the patients you had, they had the tinnitus as a very disabling symptom. Normally, tinnitus is a low profile symptom. So what? what no, no, that is what we think. Yeah. See, uh, that is what we think. And if you, when you start looking at these patients, they come to you and they say, we have gone, we are disturbed, we are not able to study. One of the patients has discontinued his studies in the US, come back, yeah, because do. he says, I can't study anymore. So some of these, lot of patients, it is very a low profile symptom, but many, it's a huge group where our ENT colleagues have told them nothing more can be done, live with it. Okay, Th that's it. And another thing, you know, vestibular schwannomas, they present with uh, tinnitus. And, you know, uh, they present with hearing loss and tinnitus. But what is very important is, you know, once they lose hearing, uh, tinnitus, we, 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 I usually we ask whether uh, tinnitus can still be there or it will disappear. The thing is, you know, even if patient becomes deaf, tinnitus can persist. Even if you damage the cochlear nerve with surgery, which most of us do with large tumors, their tinnitus can persist. By what does that mean? It is in a tinnitus could be a deafferentation problem, very similar to that phantom pain and because of cortical maladaptation. So that also will come but I'm surprising because, you know, even for trigeminal neuralgia, patients can have a dip in hearing with our surgery because that CSF dynamics will get altered. Your patient, fortunately, they didn't have any dip in hearing, even if you're working near the cochlear nerve. Even for trigeminal neuralgia surgery, excellent surgery, because of CSF alteration in dynamics, your dissection, and there is a, a dip in hearing can occur, even though you have not even touched that area. So always, you know, contraindication for this surgery is always opposite side of this. That's what I have to tell. Opposite side, if it is deaf, you should not do it. Please. Shridhar, I didn't hear your lecture. I know. But it must be very fantastic. Now, I want to introduce to you another symptom complex, like tinnitus, associated with symptom 
called brain fog. Brain fog. Have you heard this? Yeah. Brain fog. Episodes of vertigo. Episodes of limb weakness and other things like generalized this. This can these can be manifestation of Atlanto actual instability. Oh, I thought we were talking about no, no. vestibular cochlear now. <laughs> no, no, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just telling you. Because, you know what, there have been, uh, I had published a, a paper on central Atlanto actual instability a few year, years ago. And in that, I had mentioned one, all these symptoms which I mentioned to you. And you'll be surprised, at today, I am having at least 10 patients from America, from Canada, from Spain, having a symptom of brain fog. This is mainly a psychiatry. I mean, I'm not saying I will treat them for Atlanto action. But you know, this brain fog has taken over as a very important symptom of Atlanto action instability. See, you mentioned vertigo. Vertigo can happen, Bowman syndrome like thing. You can, patients can also get vertigo due to an Atlanto axial causing compression of the vertebral artery. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Vidar. We have to move on and, uh, and may I invite my previous colleague at Sriji Tarthirinal Institute of Medical Sciences, Sugalyan, as he come, difficult yeah, aneurysm. Yeah, Sugalya, nice to see you. How are you? And then uh, a difficult aneurysm is their a role for intervention. So Sugalyan did this DM in neuroradiology at our institute. Welcome, Sugalya. I, I just put a, a good word for Sugalyan. He is a great savior in Calcutta. Wonderful work. Thank you, Sukhalan. Thank you. <laughs> Good morning, all of you, my teachers and uh, my friends. So we have uh, learned uh, and have seen how to deal with the complex aneurysm by Professor Srinivas. So my job is a bit uh, easier because I'll not be dealing with the complex aneurysms and only the bit uh, difficult aneurysms. So may I have the slides here? And uh, yeah. So I'm extremely thankful to Professor Tripathi and team for giving me this opportunity. Right. So. <coughs> So initially when we started uh, coiling the aneurysm in Sri Chitra in very early days when I joined as a student, so Sarah was there and we learned a lot of uh, things from them. And those aneurysms used to come to us which probably they didn't want to do or patient uh, sometimes wanted that is there any other alternative that we can do and these were usually the aneurysms and the, uh, which were pretty simple to work with. At the same time that uh, at that point of time, the, the imaging instruments and the materials, what we do use as an interventionist, were not that advanced. So most uh, of the time, it was pretty difficult to deal with uh, those aneurysms, but over time, it has uh, progressed a lot. And this is one aneurysm. So when we are talking about difficult or complex aneurysm, sometimes the simple aneurysm can turn out to be complex over a period of time. Like one such example, here this aneurysm was clipped for an anterior communicating artery and the patient had persistent headache. And when the headache was too much for him, unbearable, so he again came to the surgeon. And this is what uh, he saw in the CT scan. So, and MR was done. So, and this was the DSA picture of that aneurysm. So at that point of time, we can see that the clip is there, but probably it has a bit slipped. Uh, he didn't want to go again and do it and probably the patient also didn't want. So he uh, came to us for whether we can do something about it. So here again what we see that what makes an aneurysm complex for us as an interventionist is the anatomy and the morphology of the aneurysm. So anatomy starts from the neck, it can be a very tortuous aorta, uh, sorry, arch which sometimes will be very difficult to negotiate but most of the cases we can do that but when the vessel comes out from the aneurysm, it becomes pretty difficult. So uh, as we have seen that it might be a good case for surgery with bypass, but uh, with this technique of uh, different, now actually endovascular previously what we thought that only the coils are there for us. But nowadays uh, we have stents, we have 
other neck reconstruction devices, which pretty is helpful when we deal with the complex aneurysm. And what is most important for us to understand is the anatomy. So without doing a 3D uh, uh, reconstructed image, it is very difficult for all of us to understand what the real anatomy is. It is not possible in 2D images. So when uh, we have a biplane instrument, I have a single plane instrument, I don't have biplane in Institute of Neuroscience at this point of time. So sometimes it is difficult to exactly get a working angle, but uh, with uh, experience and uh, uh, with your, uh, with your uh, differently changing these views, you can get it. Uh, so you coil this aneurysm, and definitely in this broad neck aneurysm, when you reconstruct, you have to put a flow diverter or some sort of a braided stent. And you get a decent, decent outcome. But is it the end? No, this is not the end. So the patient did well. His headache went down, uh, did well. But, uh, and this is, uh, you know, when the patient comes after three months or uh, probably to six months. So again, there is recurrence. So this complex aneurysm, so I, I just wanted to say that, that when you do it, that, uh, you know, you reconstruct with the cleaves or do a lot of, uh, you know, coiling with this thing. Sometimes the patient, these aneurysms can come with a recurrence. So what is most important is, um, and this is the lateral view, and this is what we see after six months. So again, the patient was treated with coiling and flow diverter. Now, I'll not be talking about uh, too much about the posterior circulation because we know that posterior circulation territory are better dealt with endovascular means, endovascular surgery or endovascular intervention, what we say, because all these new neurosurgeons, they call them some hybrid neurosurgeons and would do endovascular, and they call it an endovascular surgery. So it has been, so sometimes these sort of very broad neck, aneurysms are pretty difficult. So we have, again, a lot of things like you reconstruct the neck, we put a Y stent, and uh, you can have a durable result in this sort of cases. There is no doubt about it. Sometimes the anatomy, as I said, this patient uh, was, uh, is a case of autoarthritis, and his, uh, all those uh, arteries and the anterior circulations are blocked, and it was the only artery was one vertebral. So again, getting into different instruments with one vessel is a bit difficult, but it is doable and it can give um, um, uh, pretty good results. Now, this distal aneurysms, you know, uh, as you have seen that these are pretty easy for surgery and it is easier for endovascular. So you can take that, you can sacrifice the artery, and most of the cases what I have seen in my experience, this, they develop over time some good collaterals. When you deal with these patients, they have a good collaterals, and when you sacrifice, this is just a you know five minutes job with one drop of glue, you can have a good result. Now, aneurysm like this, which where the vessel arises from that, and again you can reconstruct the vessel, and you can do a good job, and this is uh, six months follow-up. So whether the, all this reconstruction is possible nowadays with braided stents and coils. These are a bit uh, uh, ugly looking aneurysms, but very easy to deal with endovascular means. Sometimes, yes, I do agree, these are dissecting aneurysms. They can have a proximal tight narrowing or a distal tight narrowing where the landing of this flow diverter is, might be a bit difficult. But you can go ahead and do an angioplasty, open the vessel, and put a flow diverter, and you can get a decent result after three months. Now this patient was, uh, had a bleed, and uh, so in case of a bleed, sometimes it is a bit difficult to treat in an acute stage because uh, you have to put the patient on antiplatelet, but if you do not have any other choice, you have to go ahead and do that. But in case of a blood aneurysm, we tend to put few coils in that. Why we uh, tend to put coils in the larger or uh, dissecting aneurysm is not to uh, you know, block this sac with the coils, but to reduce the load of thrombus. Because when we, uh, when we do those aneurysms without putting any coil, the large amount of thrombus can form in a very short period of time, which can be very toxic and which can be inflammatory and which can come out with further bleed. So uh, this is, again, a follow-up of uh, six months. Pica aneurysms, again, a good surgical territory, but you can go ahead and do a good endovascular reconstructions and coiling with the pica aneurysms. <coughs> follow-up. Now, these IC aneurysms, previously, uh, uh, definitely you can go ahead and do bypass, and, uh, but with the advent of flow diverters, it has become easy. So uh, this is one such older cases when we did it only with coiling, but I can, and all of you know that coiling is not the answer for these aneurysms. So they come out 
come to you with recurrence. So this is an ugly looking uh, difficult aneurysm, I, not tell very difficult but these are a bit tortuous. So when these are uh, below this uh, cavernous segment, you can just go ahead and put a flow diverter and you can get an excellent result uh, after three to six months. This is the follow-up. Now when you are dealing with the, uh, the supraclinoid aneurysms which are bled, uh, so this is on such cases who, who had a bleed uh, and this, is, this was the recent city which came after some time where we don't find the bleed anymore. So these aneurysms, again, we have to go ahead and put few coils, again, to reduce the load of thrombus and uh, put a flow diverter or a braided stent and you can go ahead and do. But, uh, you know, these flow diverters and these braided stents, they are not also very, uh, very safe sometimes because they need a follow-up. They can have a neointimal thickening stenosis which might be uh, required for the treatment with balloons and angioplasty but although it happens in a very small percentage of cases. Now these aneurysms sometimes when you see the pica which is a fetal PCA uh, sorry PCA which is a fetal in uh, origin can develop from this base of the aneurysm so you can't sacrifice the whole of uh, whole of the aneurysm with uh, either by clipping or by uh, coiling. So we tend to put uh, uh, the coil where it is, uh, where you think that this has bled and the rest of the aneurysms can be taken care of by a flow diverter. So how this aneurysm get reconstructed over time, we can appreciate that. Now multiple aneurysms. The multiple aneurysms are one such area where it is very easy for us to treat because you can go ahead uh, and treat multiple aneurysms. So this is the one which had bled and we can see a blister sort of uh, broad neck aneurysm. So the one which is bled, we can put coil and then the other one which you can put a flow diverter or a braided stand and you can get a good result. Now we know that the petrous and cavernous segments aneurysms are easily dealt, can be dealt with the endovascular means. Now coming up with uh, this, uh, the ICA bifurcation, the ICA bifurcation aneurysms are sometimes uh, are very nasty aneurysms because that usually in our experience what we see that they do not behave the way the, the aneurysms behave in anterior communicating artery or the middle cerebral artery because these are very fragile aneurysms and sometimes most of the cases it can be dissecting and broad neck and very ugly looking. So you need some devices to treat that. So uh, the, 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 the single most factor to uh, the stop or to reduce the recurrence is a tight packing. And that is very important. So if you think that you are not packing the aneurysms very tightly, the aneurysm will come back to you with recurrence, but they may not come to you with bleed. So that is one thing which is important, but uh, that is very important. And this is the follow-up stable result. Now, a uh, bit. Uh, difficult aneurysm when you can see that the ACA is taking off from the aneurysm. So again, it is very, uh, very, uh, both for clipping, you cannot go ahead and do that because the opposite side was not filling properly. So reconstruction is what is more important. So again, with this uh, stent and coil, and nowadays uh, we are dealing with this aneurysms with a, uh, with a device called Piconas or uh, the other neck bridging devices, which are very easy for us. So this is the immediate result. Now, A1 aneurysm, so you can go ahead and do nice reconstruction and, uh, and preserve the parent artery as you can see it here. MC aneurysms, MC dissecting aneurysms. So again, these are uh, when the anatomy is straightforward. This is a straightforward anatomy, so it is very easy to go ahead and put a flow diverter or maybe telescopic braided stents. Nowadays, a long braided stent is available where you can reconstruct the vessel from the MCA to ICA. And you will not find an immediate, uh, you know, it, uh, it reduces. But over time, over three to six months, the aneurysm, uh, aneurysm reduces. But all the aneurysms will not behave like this. That, that is also very important, especially when you are dealing with the aneurysms of the posterior circulation. So they behave differently as compared to the anterior circulation. So this is uh, after uh, three or six months. So MC aneurysms, I, can, I still think that uh, if the patient wants, it can go for surgery because it's very, uh, most of the cases, the easy aneurysms are very easy to clip and also to coil, but difficult aneurysms are difficult for both. But the complex aneurysms are prob uh, obviously, it, it, uh, it, it is better dealt with surgery in MCA. So this is a broad neck irregular, you can reconstruct uh, irregular broad neck aneurysms, you can reconstruct with singular double balloon. Uh, the, the foreign intervention is like us, the, the aneurysm is difficult when it is, it, is, it takes up uh, uh, from the origin of a large vessel and so where you need the reconstruction, where it is multiple, where it is bilobed and has, has a broad neck. So obviously you need uh, 
different materials to treat that, but you can do a good job and you can perfectly reconstruct. So there are multiple aneurysms in these, ACOM, large aneurysm and MCA. So distal uh, M2 segment dissection. So f again, uh, f uh, if, you, uh, if you think that uh, you are not doing bypass and if the anatomy allows, if there is not too much of uh, uh, stenosis proximal or distal, you can go ahead and put coils and stents and you can perfectly reconstruct. Um, sorry, this is another MCA. It's uh, nicely, you can take the whole of neck with putting a single or wide stand. This is probably wide stand. And these are easy aneurysms, but sometimes it's uh, difficult to do without any adjuvant devices. Now, this is a dis dissection. I had a couple of cases, but I just uh, put once the patient had bled. You can see that uh, there was hematoma, mass effect. So acutely, you can go ahead, go ahead and reconstruct with few calls. They do not have a proper wall. So if you are uh, packing it tightly, sometimes this aneurysm rupture, and uh, you can reconstruct with uh, <coughs> coils and stents, braided stents, and this is after three months, the aneurysm has progressive decrease in the filling and you can do that. Now, the uh, broad neck uh, MCAs, uh, so obviously if, if your surgeon is not interested to clip it, you can go ahead and do that with the neck bridging devices and uh, with few coils, neck bridging device. Uh, so immediately again, you will not find that this aneurysm is completely uh, blocked. So these are progressive follow-up and this is what it comes after three months. So uh, this is what you can see, the broad base. The, the, the base is reconstructed by this uh, neck bridging device. So, uh, but they need a follow-up. And if after that uh, uh, it is required, you can go ahead and put a braided stand. But, you know, the whole thing, it becomes too costly for the patient. So that also we have to remember in an Indian scenario like this. So anterior communicating artery aneurysm for an interventionist, a superiorly and posteriorly directed anterior communicating artery aneurysm is pretty difficult, but this is pretty easy for the surgeon. But you can go ahead and do that, and this is the five years follow-up for this patient. It's quite a stable result and doing well. Now, this is an, uh, not a broad neck, not much of a broad neck compared to the size of the aneurysm, but this is a dream for an interventionist to start with. So these are inferiorly directed aneurysms, so you can easily go ahead and take uh, the coil and uh, put that. But uh, if uh, the, again, the, the problem remains that you have to pack it with nicely with um, coils to prevent recurrence. So this is the follow-up. You can see that there is mild neck recurrence. And probably this is the five years follow-up recently the patient has came and you can go ahead and put a... So broad neck uh, ECOM. Reconstruction is easy and possible nowadays. Again, broad neck ECOM. Stent assisted. You can easily totally reconstruct this wall of this aneurysm. So difficult uh, uh, bulging sort of uh, neck in this, in this ECOM area. And again, you can go ahead and do that. Uh, a nice uh, reconstruction. So multiple, multi-lobed ECOM with little bit of, uh, so again the three-dimensional view is very important and you can judge the anatomy from all aspects and you can plan your devices and whether you can do a single stent, Y stent, it is not a problem at all and you can perfectly reconstruct the neck. Multiple aneurysms, you can see that, anterior communicating artery aneurysm, ICA, bifurca bi ICA bifurcation aneurysm, and uh, probably in the superior, uh, uh, the choroidal segment aneurysms, you can go ahead and treat this aneurysm in one single sitting and uh, you can prevent recurrence. So you can see that on the left side, this is the anterior communicating artery, broad neck, barrel shaped aneurysms, and in the second picture, the other two are also coiled. Um, so can you have two minutes? Two minutes, yes. So I'll just skip this. Uh, these are again a bit of a difficult anatomy because one side was blocked with so the broad neck uh, uh, aneurysms. You can go ahead and reconstruct the neck and uh, preserve this uh, artery also. Another patient. So I'll just skip that. So this was uh, one such patient who came uh, who had a bleed and he fell down and he had uh, multiple contusions and a broad neck, uh, difficult uh, anterior communicating artery aneurysm. So after decompression, we, ha we went there and did an intrasecular flow diversion and this is the patient progressive and this is after six months. Uh, the patient's uh, reconstruction. Again, you can see that the broad base is the, the, is the new neck, what has been formed by this neck bridging device, and this is not recurrence. Now, uh, distal ACA, probably I'll just show a couple of uh, nasty distal ACA cases. So uh, for any, any uh, uh, surgery or for endovascular, this sort of uh, uh, neck uh, and this sort of takeoff from this uh, 
dissected sort of ACOM is very difficult to treat. So what we do, we go ahead and treat it in two different settings and perfectly reconstruct. So this is again another patient with what you can see that perfectly reconstruction of the neck. Sometimes these sort of tiny aneurysms can be very difficult uh, and can come with this sort of nasty bleed and vasospasm can complicate the issue at all. So again, you have to go ahead and do endovascular vasospasm treatment. So dissecting aneurysms in A2 segment, sometimes uh, it can be very easily. So I don't know whether it will run. So probably it is not fun, but uh, it is treated with FD. Yes, sir, finished. So <laughs> distal ACA with uh, flow diverter, very complex distal ACA aneurysm. You can again reconstruct the neck and get a good result. So to conclude, obviously the aneurysm surgery has got two arms, open uh, surgery and the endovascular. So we have to judiciously take up the patients where the, and also take the patients uh, what the patient wants. And obviously, few aneurysms are good for endovascular, few aneurysms are good for surgery. And uh, for endovascular and for surgery, the skill is very important. What uh, uh, is good for me may not be good for others. What is good for uh, other experience may not be good for me. And one is vo very important thing is that we have to follow up these aneurysms, either after clipping or after coiling, because both, after both, the patient can have recurrence. So that is very important for us to understand and do it accordingly. Thank you. Oh. Thank you, Dr. Sukalyan. This is a very nice lecture and uh, with the endovascular technology improving, so the indications are going to increase. Right. But I had a few comments. Yes. One was for blister aneurysms. Mm -hmm. Flow diverter is still not a good modality because sometimes what happens is because since it's still a braided uh, stent, the blister aneurysms can still bleed after a flow diverter. So blister yes. aneurysms, there's no perfect treatment as yet. Bypass is an option for a blister aneurysm. Secondly, uh, most of the wide-necked aneurysms, uh, even the recent K web, web devices, they have a tendency to fall back into the parent vessel as with coils. So again, for a wide-necked aneurysms, I'm not sure that just simple coiling is good enough and you might have to put a stent or a flow diverter. But then what happens with stent and flow diverters is the patient goes on to long-term uh, uh, anti-platelet uh, agents. So whether these are actually good cases for endovascular coiling is still uh, doubtful because once you start putting a stent everywhere, then the long-term outcomes for chronic subdurals and all the other complications of eco sprint come into. These are actually very good cases for surgery, white neck aneurysms. Uh, Posture circulation aneurysms, I do agree that most of them are done endovascularly, but still there's a few nice category of SCA, pica, and top of basilar aneurysms. Uh, which are very good for surgery itself. Uh, so these are some of the few comments I had. Absolutely. So uh, just to uh, tell you about this antiplatelets. So antiplatelets, uh, we give two antiplatelets. Uh, nowadays, this, uh, in most of the stands, we are giving single antiplatelet. But out of two antiplatelets, one is for uh, six months, and the rest is uh, for probably a year and a half or two years. So after two years, you stop it. And as far as the blister is concerned, there is uh, no good modality. So uh, uh, the, uh, one of the better modality in endovascular is a flow diverter stent. But I completely agree with you that we take a chance and put flow diverter because the patient is on a double antiplatelet and the patient can come with bleed. But in a practical scenario, usually they don't bleed. I don't know why. They don't bleed and come. <laughs> That's the thing. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Experience and wonderful cases. You have got a beautiful collection of some tremendously complex cases. And I congratulate you. Thanks. And I wish you all the best. And I want you to go further on this. Thank you, sir. Thanks. Okay. Uh, I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Harsh Jain, who will be speaking on management of some difficult cases. Just uh, want to remind our moderators to be good and uh, time keeping, please. Moderators, please. Yeah. You're already running late. No.
रक्षा बैठ तो सही तरह कम ये कम है Welcome to everyone, and uh, thank you, Dr. Tripathi, for organizing this meeting and literally begging me to present something. Uh, literally begging me to present something. You know my general reluctance to speak, but um, I'll just share some. Take this opportunity to share some uh, challenges that I faced, and I think I use this term challenging very broadly. It is a function of surgeon experience, and I think. Uh, probably our inexperience in certain cases may come to fore. The way I look at uh, these two or three cases that I recently did is, you know, anywhere between a near miss and a near disaster, really. Uh, and I very much appreciate questions, comments, and criticisms from the uh, masters in front of me. So, <clears throat> this very quickly, and I'll uh, I'll sort of purposely go gloss over some. Uh, clinical details, it's very, very obvious. I'll just come down to the technical problems that uh, we face. So this is a 51-year-old lady who came to us from Mizoram with typical uh, Cushingoid uh, features, and those were her pre-op uh, uh, hormone levels. And again, typical Cushingoid faces and all the features, the buffalo hump and everything. So <clears throat> this is going on to the MRI scan, and hopefully that is showing that, hey, the pointer is there's a point of oh. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, again, no surprises here, but basically there is this what was uh, measured to be eight by eight into six millimeter uh, pituitary microadenoma on the left, and uh, you can see those on the contrast imaging. But what is perhaps more important, or what I thought needed to be. Uh, looked into is that the, the cellar was not really very uh, well pneumatized, rather the uh, sphenoid sinus was not very pneumatized and the clivus was extending pretty much up to, you know, 50% of the cellar face. So not an enlarged uh, cellar floor, the clivus extending all up to here. So I was a bit concerned and I thought it would be a good uh, occasion to use neuronavigation. We don't have very much experience by using neuronavigation for pituitaries, but I thought this would be very useful. Uh, <clears throat> after a successful uh, registration during the procedure, for whatever reason, intranasally, the probe did not work. And not only did it not work, it sort of disoriented us, the, both me and my ENT colleague. And uh, unfortunately, also the recording device uh, from the endoscopic uh, view was not working that day, so I could just manage to grab a little clip from the, uh, the monitor directly, and this is what I will show you. And 
So here we see the opening and initially, in fact, the navigation took us to this place most superiorly towards the planum and tuberculum, which is what I initially drilled and got to CSF leak straight away. Uh, then reoriented and as you can see that pretty much the, uh, uh, the, the face, the, the cellar area was featureless. You couldn't, at least I couldn't appreciate the prominence, the carotid prominence very well, the OCRs and as I said the clivus was coming up pretty much up onto the you know, half of the cellar flow which I also drilled and ultimately I managed to get this opening. It was more on sort of intuition and uh, continuing rather than you know relying on navigation it, it just didn't work but ultimately managed to get this kind of resection so open the uh, the dura and fortunately there was a good interface that that is surge cell in the cavity after t removing the tumor I don't know if that little thing works so that's looking inside and uh, so there was a very good plane so and uh, from the MRI the, the tumor was actually abutting the carotid artery and I could get that so all in all, uh, I, I think the conduct of the surgery was not very satisfactory, but these are the kind of problems we faced. We obviously had a CSF leak, but we had prepared, so there was a good Haddad flap, and uh, that was put in with and reinforced with uh, Tisil. And uh, so that was what happened in the post-op period. That was within a month now. So uh, in the immediate post-op period, uh, her packs were removed on day three lumbar drain on day five as I would normally want to do and the 6 a.m. cortisol within um, I think post of day six was below two so that seems very very encouraging and these are a picture sent from uh, sent from the patient a month later and you can see there has been very good resolution of her Cushing white features so there was dramatic weight loss within a week and uh, improvement in all her uh, parameters so I think uh, this case to us or to me felt like almost a near miss uh, and I'm not sure what I would have done differently. I think I would have loved the navigation to have worked very well and uh, uh, subsequently maybe the surgery would have been a bit less challenging but I'd like to hear comments after this. So just moving on quickly to this next case. So this lady also present from Mizoram came to us with this uh, large olfactory groove meningioma and that's the, those are the contrast images and the, those are the T2, so a lot of uh, T2 hyper intensities, lot of edema and uh, I've done these in the past for a combination of either bifrontal approach or even terional approach for whatever reason I decided to do it by a bifrontal approach on this occasion it was rather large, I wanted a good wide exposure of both the frontal lobes but uh, somehow during the first surgery the tumor just bled excessively it just continued to bleed despite whatever we did uh, I went through the base coagulated the origin uh, the, the, the normal usual pattern of uh, operation I thought was was adequate was happening but it just continued to bleed so at one point the blood loss was so severe I had to stop uh, and we abandoned the procedure and <coughs> took the bone flap out and so uh, that's what we had to do, we remove the bone flap, uh, ventilate her postoperatively but fortunately we could discharge her at about day 15 and that was her in about I think day 3. Uh, no limb deficits, she had this large uh, you know fullness here because of the swelling and the accumulation of uh, CSF and subgalial fluid. Uh, got her back 4 months later and that's her uh, MRI scan and as uh, expected there was a large amount of tumor still remaining and of course no bone flap and a lot of gliosis in the frontal lobes. So took her back to theater just, uh, just about a month ago and just briefly show you the video. So after uh, exposing the carotid artery and then uh, debulking the tumor and getting down seeing the carotid artery, optic nerve carotid complex here and then the number of tumor still devascularizing, seeing the contralateral optic nerve, continuing to uh, dissect and delineate the opposite side A, uh, A1 uh, complex and then the tumor could be peeled off gradually from the H of the anterior communicating complex and seem to be proceeding okay. 
So that's a contralateral A1, ipsilateral A1, communicating artery here. Optic nerve, ipsilateral, contralateral here. <coughs> So intermittently putting patties with papaverin just to hopefully avoid some vasospasm and uh, getting to the opposite side, separating from the opposite frontal lobe, still coagulating the base and excising the tumor as commonly done and getting a good plane overall. So seemed to be going well until suddenly while lifting the tumor. So just the last nubbin left, dissected all around it, last nubbin left, peeling off reasonably well, till there was this gush of blood. And uh, this is obviously originating from the ACA complex. I thought I had it all dissected out but this then again just bled incessantly. So again with standard techniques of tamponade and then rapidly elevating the tumor, removing the last remnant. Fortunately, the enough dissection had been done that this last bit could be taken out without much event. Continued to bleed, you could see a absolute you know, shower of uh, blood coming out from one of the arteries. So then decided because uh, repeated attempts at tamponade coagulation did not work. So uh, identified the ipsilateral or rather defined more the ips both the A1s. And temporary clips to both of them. Then gradually reduce the tamponade and to definitively identify the bleeding points and they just happen to be sort of blowouts of the side walls probably the frontopolar or the frontopolar arteries or even maybe the hubner so releasing the temporary clip caused the bleeding again so the temporary clips back on and then definitively looking for the source of bleeding again tried coagulation but didn't really work so again after releasing the clip it would start bleeding again. So this time put uh, mini clips onto these side walls. Again that there was a, another point of bleeding that necessitated temporary clippage. And, uh, and applying another mini clip. So by this time I was quite concerned about the patency of the contralateral A2 and uh, checking with the Doppler, the ipsilateral A2 was very good. The contralateral was definitely weaker than uh, what we started off with and uh, I uh, genuinely expected her by this time to be uh, having a, a deficit even contemplated doing a side-to-side -side bypass, but I don't have much experience, or rather any experience with those. So, uh, and so that's the end result. You can see a panoramic view and both optics and the entire uh, the complex. And we were right to the floor with the craniotomy. So I, you know, to this point, I don't really uh, understand what went wrong the first time, why it bled so much, but it did, and this is what we had to resort to. Fortunately, that's her, that is her immediate post-op CT scan, so I also took the opportunity to put the bone flap back and uh, the uh, CT did not show any obvious ACA abnormalities, uh, hypodensities, and that's her in the post-op period uh, about to be discharged. So, I think 
probably converted a near disaster to a you know more satisfactory conclusion uh, and, and you know that's that case just moving on to this last so this is a six year old girl who presented with uh, headaches and imbalance and this is a very large multi compartment and cystic craniopharyngioma with a good central uh, calcific element and in fact uh, at the age of two she had been diagnosed with the lesion which was very small but was not uh, attended to but that's how she came to us I think I only have these T2 images so uh, took her to surgery from the with the right peroneal approach and uh, uh, firstly defining the cyst uh, uh, doing the arachnoid dissection separating the cyst from the brain the sharp dissection and then decompressing the cyst all the contents separating the cyst wall from the brain <clears throat> and then progressively uh, excising the wall then proceeded to remove a lot of the calcific element and uh, enroll uh, enrolling the cyst wall this is the opposite side of the cyst which was easily separable from the contralateral uh, or rather the frontal lobe it's a very large uh, calcific uh, portion and then turning the attention to the optic nerve and the ICA sharp dissection to separate the tumor from these structures <clears throat> and uh, here that's that's the important thing that i wanted to show you that the ACA complex is very very closely applied to the uh, cyst wall here the tumor wall so trying to separate and any attempts to uh, pull the cyst wall we were obviously tugging on the anterior perforated substance so separating from the op opposite olfactory the optic nerve ICA and uh, so that's the ICA and probably a glimpse of the stalk probably so yeah so that's the important thing that I wanted to really show you that the uh, uh, the ACA complex is really really very adherent to the tumor capsule and uh, try as I might I, I really could not uh, mobilize the capsule away in, a, in any good subarachnoid plane so continue to cut and debulk the tumor as much as I could as close to possible the ACA segment or ACA complex rather and more of the large calcific parts coming into view
So then here I was getting to a kind of a stalemate situation where as much as I would pull on the tumor, the ACA complex seemed to get jeopardized every time. So this is what eventually then prompted me to stop uh, and uh, after some more debulking, but making sure that the ACA complex was patent. Two minutes for Okay. So, so yes. So, uh, the point I'm trying to make here is that uh, any further attempts at debulking uh, seem to jeopardize the anterior complex. So, I decided to stop. And uh, fortunately, uh, she did well. Uh, she had no deficits. This was her post-operative scan, predictably because of the very large cystic component, the brain completely slumped. But I was genuinely disappointed to see how much of the calcific portion is still left behind. Uh, so I'm re not really sure what to call this, I mean, a near miss, disaster, I don't know. Uh, I felt I could have been a bit more aggressive, removed uh, some more of the tumor, and I think I have sort of consigned her to uh, further procedures, uh, radiation therapy, and even maybe further surgery. So uh, that's about it. I'd really appreciate some comments, questions, and criticisms from the audience. Thank you very much. So thank you, Dr. Harish. That was a wonderful presentation. There's a small comment on uh, at meningioma. We also have had a case and uh, olfactory group meningioma, I was dissecting and suddenly started bleeding. And then we went further and dissected. We found an aneurysm at the A1 A com complex. Right. So then we went back and searched literature. There was a paper uh, published in 2020 in clinical neurology and neurosurgery. Uh, where almost 0.7 to 7 percent of all uh, 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 tumors are associated with aneurysms. And right. this could be a underrepresentation because we do not ask either a CT angio or an MR angio or a DSA for most of our tumor patients. Okay. Right? And among the tumors which are the most commonly associated with aneurysms, meningiomas and growth hormone secreting pituitary adenomas were the most common associated with men uh, aneurysms. Right. So probably inadvertently, you might have clipped the aneurysm, and right. that's why the bleeding stopped. Right. I mean, that could be a possibility. Um, but right. even now, it's too, unless you do a DSA, it'll be very difficult because the both the CT and MR, the clip will be throwing artifacts. Okay. So if you could do a DSA and just check it, probably you could, you could find an aneurysm there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, that, that's why traditionally we were preoperatively embolizing the large uh, meningiomas. And but thereby doing DSAs, but we've done that before here, but with time we've grown directly to surgery then. One comment about that uh, Cushing's case when this time, you know, when your navigation doesn't work, you, you can always use the, you know, CM. CM, put a pointer and see where you are. That works out very well. Yeah, so but many the problem was getting the side to side, you know, to know how much to open. Yeah, I mean, you can take an AP view also to right. see whether in the midline. So that is just a salvage, you know, right. when you have this type of problem. Sorry, Dr. Santra, would you like to say something? Uh, I think uh, at times it becomes very difficult to really identify the normal structures and all that. But what I have found is that uh, in most of these cases, uh, the optic protuberances, you know, the optic uh, prominences are seen very well, no matter how. Uh, how the anatomy has been distorted, uh, except in cases of uh, hyperostosis due to meningiomas, where it is a little difficult. In your case also, I, when I was showing, I was looking at it very carefully. You could see the optic uh, protuberances, and then if you really go more laterally, you can find out how far you should go. Right. But yes, I agree with you, it's very difficult. Thank you very much. No, she did not have smell. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Thank Harsh. And it's my great pleasure to uh, invite Professor Goel, sir, uh, who will be speaking on evolving concepts of craniovertebral and uh, spinal stability. And I'm sure, sir, doesn't need any introduction to any of us. 
So I will not introduce him. So good afternoon, everybody. <clears throat> so what I'm going to do is I'm going to rapidly run through some of new concepts. I have to tell you before I start that all these material which I'm going to present are very heavily published in very heavy journals. So if there is a controversy in your mind, you can go and read those articles. Basically, I want you to understand a different perspective a different thought process. Means you keep your mind supple. You keep ready to accept a change. You be ready to ex look at things in a different way. So that is the basis of what I'm going to show you. So I'm sure there must be, there should be and there have to be controversies and different because you are also, many of you are senior neurosurgeons. So try to be a little bit supple. So first thing what I want to show you is a concept of central or axial atlantoaxial instability. So this concept is not there in the literature or at least it was not there 10 years ago. So this is the, and many of you have of course heard me on several occasions but enjoy it again. So human body is different from all other animals because we are standing human position. We stand and run and walk throughout our, our lives and all our muscles are located at our back. There is nothing in front. You see in front of vertebral body there is only a thin strip of longus coli. There is nothing in relationship to the disc, nothing in relationship to the vertebral bodies. Everything is focused behind. All the muscles attached to transverse process, to spinous process, are ultimately focused on the facets, okay? So facet is the fulcrum of all movements of human body. Unlike a bird where the movements are in the shoulders, in the wings, in the, here. In a four-legged animals, the movements are in the hands and legs, shoulders and hips. So the spine is quite free in these animals, unlike human body. So this is another concept which I'm going to present to you, concept of vertical facetal instability. So when you stand and when you walk and if your muscles become weak due to disuse, due to abuse, due to misuse or due to injury, there is a concept of vertical spinal instability or telescoping of the spine. If you see your grandmother, for instance, your grandmother would have become shorter by age. Even, you know, I'm not sure if my height is becoming shorter, but as you age, you become shorter because there is a telescoping of your spine, because there is reduction of liquid and fluids in all your joints, including knee joint, hip joint, and why your knee joint pains? Because the fluid in the joint goes and the bone to bone rubs. And that is why they like to put artificial joint because they don't want bone and bone contact. So bone and bone contact is a very painful affair. So facetal instability, all the instability which occurs in the spine is focused on the facets, okay? 
And these, whatever statements I'm making, I'm showing you some papers, but these are very heavily published concepts over the last 10 years. Now, what we did was, there was a concept 20, 25 years ago of fixed Atlanto axial instability. This was a very, very, you know, commonly understood concept. There were two types of instability. One was mobile and one was reduced, uh, fixed. So mobile was treated by fixation. Fixed was treated by decompression. This was a worldwide concept. concept. So this paper of mine, I think completely we introduced the concept that there is nothing like fixed atlanto axial instability. It is an unstable joint. It is pathologically unstable joint. And decompression is not the treatment. Stabilization is the treatment, and that has been this concept is very well accepted in the field of craniovertebral junction surgery now. So these kind of fixed atlanto axial dislocation, the concept was decompression, transoral decompression or posterior decompression. Decompression was the concept worldwide. Every neurosurgical meeting you attended 15, 20 years ago, there was a complete session on transoral decompression, transoral surgery and subtleties of this operation. So this concept has changed the treatment for fixed atlanto axial instability. We introduced that in, uh, open the joint, distract the facet, reduce the instability. So the instability as a concept of basilar invagination we introduced in 1999 and compared basilar invagination to listhesis of facets. You see this listhesis of facets? And like lumbosacral listhesis, like you treat lumbosacral listhesis, you should treat basilar invagination. Similarly, in 2004, we had this classification, which is very uh, well cited in the literature. We introduced two kinds of dislocation, uh, basilar invagination. In one, odontoid process goes up. In the other, the tonsil comes down. So earlier concept was that you do transoral decompression for this and foramen magnum decompression for this because instability was not the issue. Fixed dislocation was the issue. And this was a new term of craniovertebral junction realignment. So this is basilar invagination and realignment, more than realignment. Now, uh, mark my words very carefully. More than realignment, stabilization is the issue. So this is basilar invagination, listhesis is the problem, stabilization is the treatment. There is no role at all for decompression. Whether the realignment is complete or incomplete, instability is the issue and stabilization is the treatment. Okay, so that is a very important change from what was happening earlier. About 15 years ago, we introduced a brand new concept and this concept you know, any controversy in anybody's mind is not my issue. This concept is a complete revolution. Mark this word also. Complete revolution, not only in craniovertebral junction surgery, but in a lot of spinal surgery. If you read this between the lines here, it is in degenerative spine, OPLL, Hirayama disease, and various other problems. There can be central or axial atlanto axial instability. So I would like to introduce this concept to you. Now, as I mentioned in 1999, we said that basilar invagination is due to listhesis of C1 over C2 like this. And there is an atlanto dental interval disturbance. There is compression of the cord. Listhesis is the issue and stabilization is the treatment. Okay, so this is type one. Now carefully see this slide, this is basilar invagination, the whole world still till today, I don't think anybody in the world will do any other treatment other than foramen magnum decompression. But I have to completely clearly without any doubt tell you that that is an absolutely wrong treatment. So this kind of basilar invagination where there is no neural compression, there is no atlantodental interval disturbance, there can be facetal malalignment. You see the facet of C1 behind facet of C2. This is clearly and clearly an unstable issue and stabilization is the treatment. There is no controversy at all. So when there is no atlantodental interval disturbance, I like to call it central or axial atlantoaxial instability. As we progress further, 
into the business of craniovertebral junction, we realized a very fantastic thing. Like whenever there is platybasia, assimilation of atlas, clipal file abnormality, Chiari malformation, syringomyelia, and a host of other anomalies, they are all carefully listened because revolution is there. All these, when, like basilar invagination, present in association with carry, in association with syringomyelia, in association with platybasia, in association with osodontoidium, association with bifid spine, or discreetly, when they are in present in cohort or discreetly, even when there is no compression of the craniovertebral junction neural structures, even when there is no demonstrable instability by dynamic images, it indicates one thing and that thing is atlantoaxial instability and stabilization is the treatment. Okay, like in this case there is like in this situation in this last type 3 there is no no evidence of instability but there is platybasia there is assimilation there is carry there is syrinx so if there is only carry only syrinx only platybasia only basilar invagination then also there is atlantoaxial instability irrespective of whether there is any of these kind of malalignment and you do atlantoaxial stabilization and magic is the result magic magic means a tremendous in the evening of operation if i have done more about 400 450 cases by now of carry i have got 450 patients telling me in the evening of operation that i have got a new life there are only two things that you can do at this time. Either you don't agree or believe in me or believe in me. It is better for you, you believe me because I have videos of all my patients in the evening of operation. Not after one month or two months or ten months. You might improve or you might improve. That is all that you... I ask one question. Have you got a new life after surgery? And if the answer is here and there, then that is nothing for me. He has to say yes. And the answer is always yes. Okay. This concept is clear. This concept is done with and dusted, and it is it will be here for to stay. The problem is to do atlantoaxial fixation in a situation like this when there is syringomyelia. When there is a syringomyelia, the cord is very flabby and the extradural space is loaded with venous plexus. When there is platybasia and assimilation of atlas, the, the, the reaching of atlantoaxial articulation is not an easy process. The question is, operation is difficult, operation is complex, and operation can be by itself dangerous. If you are ready to accept that challenge, then this is the thing. If you are not a foramen magnum decompression, you don't have to go to the theater, ask some of your junior residents who say, do foramen magnum and done with. You see, the problem is in most of the commercial enterprises in the world, not in India and, you know, in China, many people are doing this. If you are doing foramen magnum decompression, the, the compensation by the... Uh, is same. If you do C1, C2 fixation, the compensation is same. If you do C1, C2 fixation, you might be, you know, if there is some issue and you're not familiar, you might be in problem, but decompression, you will never be in problem. So those controversies apart. So instability, basilar invagination is due to an unstable atlantoaxial. Occipital joint is not an issue. Craniovertebral junction is a center for mobility, center for stability. Mobility is C1, C2, stability is O, C1. More the mobility, more the potential of instability. Atlantoaxial joint is the most mobile joint of the body, most unstable joint of the body, most under-recognized instability, most under-treated clinical entity. So we have got now several patients for both group A and group B where we have done only atlantoaxial fixation, no decompression. So this is my favorite slide where I have shown. Now, the, you know, you must remember, 
lucky don't stop me let me just i will not give my other lectures okay this will be the only lecture so just enjoy it because i am enjoying to speak now okay and i am sure these concepts are here to stay and here to revolutionize lot of things and you just listen to me carefully so there are two types of things in spinal instability one is acute instability like you have trauma there is spasm and um neurological acute deficits and thing like that and other is chronic instability over several months and years and decades so in a situation of chronic atlanto axial instability nature nature comes into play and nature protects the human spinal cord and body from potential and manifest atlanto axial instability and changes itself the whole body changes whole body changes now you see here this is the father chronic atlanto axial instability is the father bifid c23 fusion clipel file platybasia carry syring external syringomyelia syringobulbia external syringobulbia kyphoscoliosis torticollis short neck these are only some these are the children of chronic atlanto axial instability when they pre are present in a cohort or whenever they are present even singly they indicate the presence of atlanto axial instability they are all secondary they are all protective and they are all potentially reversible all these things which i have mentioned all these things which i have mentioned are not primary pathologies they are all secondary they are protective and reversible so my concept is in a chronic situation compression is not the issue decompression is not the treatment compression is always secondary compression is always protective and compression is always reversible so on the basis of this concept i move on further into this okay so basilar invagination instability is the issue and stabilization is the treatment there is no controversy now whole world is following this even when there is no atlanto dental interval disturbance even when there is no facetal mal alignment even when there is no basilar invagination even when there is no other bony abnormality presence of tonsillar herniation is an indicator of an unstable atlanto axial joint this concept of tight posterior fossa tight posterior fossa you have heard of a tight post this was introduced by me in 1996 and published for the first time and i am now saying today that tight posterior fossa concept and decompression concept is a negative concept so you see the facetal mal alignment and stabilization is the treatment whenever you see basilar invagination or any other thing don't only look at the mri look at the ct scan and the facets so this kind of basilar there is no tight posterior fossa there is no tight cranio vertebral junction there is no need for decompression the issue is instability and the treatment is stabilization so we have got now several patients like this the concept which is now in discussion throughout the world and many of you know it now like uh, my dear lokendra was saying when i am doing shairi and people are talking the shair becomes disturbed is that right loki and when i am talking and people are discussing i really get disturbed for your information my dear friend he is not a neurosurgery person he is a cameraman so i will excuse him <laughs> but now the listen to this is atlanto axial instability the cause of chiari and is atlanto axial stabilization that is the treatment that is the most you know now very heavily cited paper in 2000 i published my series that all chiari all chiari of course not with hydrocephalus and chiari tumor and chiari spina bifida and chiari no those are apart but all our regular chiari with syrings 
are related to atlanto axial instability and stabilization is the treatment okay so i have got this publication you must you know those who have um, those who are more interested in this subject must read this because th this was also quite a discussed paper so when there is no atlanto dental they look at the facets carry syrinx atlanto axial fixation i am again repeating you do this operation properly you don't do a flimsy c1 c2 fixation you do flimsy then nothing will happen if you do a solid fixation open the joint introduce bone graft in the joint do good fixation in the evening of operation the patient will 100% of time say that i have got a new life i am able to breathe properly i am able to sleep properly all my symptoms in my limbs have remarkably reduced and i am happy the question is whether you will be able to do or not or whether you are even thinking of doing or not or whether you want to continue to argue with you know argue or not like the whole world is doing with me the question is if there is an arguments if somebody is publishing a series of 400 cases there are only two things either believe him or don't believe him if you don't believe him you are a scientific human being you can come to mumbai and spend like many people in the world have done even the topmost pediatric neurosurgeon the whole pediatric neurosurgery community of north america had written a letter that we don't agree with this this may be suitable for cranio vertebral basilar invagination situation may be suitable for india but does not suit in america this kind of statements were made in scientific journal of neurosurgery essentially the meaning was indians are different and we are different you, you understand but now they have come themselves and now you show me one person talking negative about this show me of course they don't agree don't agree because they cannot do it why chinese are agree because they have now experience why chinese are doing basilar distraction because they can do it why americans are not doing because they have fda regulations they have very strict laws and they are not doing it whether they are doing it or not but they cannot say americans are different and indians are different the question is about syringomyelia i have said now syringomyelia in association with carry or not association with carry in association with basilar or not association in association with any other bone abnormality or no bone abnormality you do atlanto axial fixation syringe will disappear not disappear regress in 100% of cases 100% of cases if you do imaging after about 1 year and regress remarkably and the regression will start after 10 days of surgery i have done scan even 2 or 3 days after surgery and i have demonstrated like probably in this case in the immediate post operative period regression so whether they are bone abnormalities or no bone abnormalities carry is an indicator of atlanto axial instability and these are the cases and there are now several cases with me with this kind of reduction in syrings more than reduction of syrings it is the magical clinical recovery so this is a nature's air bag cervical fusion as i mentioned a secondary if you read the literature there are many types of corpectomies and all these kind of decompressions have been described for bony fusions i am saying they are not primary they are secondary and protective and atlanto axial instability is the issue and stabilization is the treatment bifid anti and posterior arches is a protective phenomena when you see bifid it is unstable atlanto axial joint when you see os odontoidium it is a unstable atlanto axial joint whether you are able to demonstrate or not you see this is atlanto axial instability os odontoidium i published this series here you can, you must read this beautiful article where i have mentioned protective phenomena in bifid paper i have mentioned protective phenomena so this word every statement which i am making is all heavily published you have controversy you must have controversy but if you have you must go and see so when you see this kind of uh, os odontoidium always do atlanto axial fixation as i mentioned yesterday even the topmost group in america today are doing trans oral decompression and occipito axial fixation for this kind of 
problem. I think, you know, they have to be only the patient have to be sorry and the doctor has to be, you know, repentant or not. That is their problem. So even when there is no compression at the craniovertebral junction, bone fusions like this and bifid like this are indicator of atlantoaxial instability. Syringomyelia is helpful, not uh, harmful. And you see this kind of idiopathic syringe where there is no chiari, as I mentioned, whether discreetly or in cohort, they are indicator of atlantoaxial instability and stabilization is the treatment. And this kind of, you know, torticolis, short neck, they are all secondary. You do atlantoaxial fixation, the neck can become after, you know, quickly in the post-operative period. And you see, neck can become long and neck can become straight. In the immediate post-operative, like in scolio, if there is a disc herniation, the person walks like this. You do discoidectomy or whatever you do, the person walks like this immediately in the evening of operation. Similarly, these things happen here. So there are many patients like another beautiful thing, beautiful thing. You know, don't underestimate the statements I'm making. Don't underestimate. Don't make that mistake. You don't agree or not, that is your issue. You see, this kind of kyphoscoliosis you have seen often, okay? And you have seen that many people do multi-level screw and long rod fixation. In this age group, in this age group, which you can see adolescents, young boys and young adults, in this age group, it is almost more than 80% of cases when atlantoaxial instability is the issue. Whether there is carry and whether there is ceiling, that is not an issue. There can be rotatory atlantoaxial instability. You stabilize and the back can become straight, the breathing can become normal, the symptoms can disappear and you can have instantly everything disappear. And the person will be remarkably. So, you know, there is a potential for change and potential for thinking differently. So central or axial atlantoaxial instability can be itself a cause of myelopathy. You see, there is no compression here, but there is bifid. So it is an unstable atlantoaxial joint. If there is a syringe, it is an unstable atlantoaxial joint. Now I want to move on further, so I will give you a breathing time. Uh, I took five minutes more. Five no, no, what I'll do is, I will give you some breathing time. In my second lecture, I will continue from here. I have got two lectures. Okay, fine. Okay? Okay. I thought you are taking both lectures together. No, no, I will take this separately because this is still... <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, so we enjoyed your lecture. I think uh, we are... Because, you know, today there is some function, son-in-law function in Calcutta. People... So, like if you... Some, Jama is a stay. Yeah. Some, okay, uh, it's good. Time to reach the airport. I think uh, we enjoyed your talk and we understood your concept. Okay, Atul. But I want to give you more. No, no. <laughs> and I think we'll go ahead with the second session. No, no, no. And before no. that, some, uh, yeah. some small handy announcement. So, uh, I'd like, uh, Hars, Hars, I'd like uh, to felicitate all our speakers and the moderators in the first session. So, moderators first, Professor Suresh Nair. Roman, uh, give the bro, give the prize. No mentor. Yeah, it's some more there. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Suresh. You're wonderful having you. We won't give you next time another prize, but so thank you. So, Doctor uh, Srinivas, please. Dwarka, thank you again for being here. Odd hours and being, making it today. Thank you very much. A small token of appreciation and little memento. God bless you. Keep on doing good work. Thank you. Make us proud. So, uh, speakers then, uh, Dr. Dilip Panikar, please. Dilip. So I think he has flown the maximum uh, in a sky from south. So thank you, Dilip, for coming. And I, I gather you have to leave at 11.15 or something. 
So uh, then I will ask Dr. Sivastav to carry on moderating after. So he's got plenty of time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dilip. Wonderful having you. I enjoyed the meeting. I'm sorry to have to leave early, but I have a flight to catch. But uh, I wish you all the best. And uh, thank you, Lucky, and thank you, Harsh, to your entire team. Thank you so much. Thanks for coming. Thank you. The next is uh, Dr. Uh, K. Sridhar. Sridhar, please. So, like I said earlier, Sridhar flew from Dhaka yesterday. Thank you for being here and making the two conferences. So, thank you, Sridhar. Thank you. One and only. <laughs> yes, one and only. <laughs> the one and only Sridhar. I hope that's a compliment from Suresh. <laughs> thank you so much. Thanks a lot. Yeah, it's been wonderful. I've, I'm sorry I missed the first half of it, and especially Atul's surgery. Anyway, we have all seen Atul operating, but it's never a, uh, you know, it's always a joy to, to see it. Uh, but it's so nice to be here in the morning and uh, fantastic job, uh, the whole team of mine and uh, great job. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you Sudhir. Thank you very much. I also gather he has to leave early, so, um, but next time, Sridhar, not no forgiving. You have to be there for three days. Yes, sir. So it is in March 6, 7 and 8, declared. 2023, 6, 7 and, yeah, so <laughs> it's coming anyway. So uh, next is uh, Sukarlan, Dr. Sukarlan Prakash, please. So as I said, he is our great savior. Whenever we are in trouble, Sukarlan helps us. So he's, uh, although uh, stationed more in INK, but he's our man and in his, uh, our vascular team. Thank you, Sukarlan. He's uh, always graceful. And I had that carotid injury during uh, pituitary. So it was my first injury, and he came and, and put the fluid diverter, and we saved the patient. Well done. Thank you very much, Sukalan. Thank you. Really grateful. So next is, of course, yourself, Hers. May, may I felicitate you? Thank you. It was a wonderful talk, as always. You also deserve a gift. So, Subro, uh, just it up. I think uh, the last but not the least is uh, our friend. Dr. Atul Goel, <laughs> uh, can't say in words what he has uh, contributed to the field of neurosciences and to our friendship meetings, uh, last 11 and counting. Thank you, Atul. So next year booked, six, seven, eight. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> will be, will be. Yeah. Okay. Uh, for the I have one more. I will. I'll. Okay. I'll. I'll, I'll give it to you. Thank you very much. Thanks. Uh, lovely. Okay. Yeah. We will collect, recollect, and recirculate. Don't worry. <laughs> they will not die out till the evening anyway. So sorry. And uh, so that finishes the session one. Uh, I hope I have not missed anyone. The second session will be uh, chaired by Dr. Srivastav and Dr. Dilip Panikar, who will probably leave in the middle, unless he's left already. Dilip is left, so uh, I think Dr. Sivastav is good enough <laughs> to, to moderate any session. Uh, over to you, sir. You, need a, you have the program, thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Tripathi. So now move on, we move on to session two. Uh, may I request Dr. Suresh Sankla for endoscopic management of lateral ventricle tumors. Yesterday we heard him. Today is the second lecture. Please skip the time. Thank you. No, no. We, we have a change. I should have told you. I'm sorry. So, Suresh will uh, talk later because uh, Sridhar is leaving. He is coming here. Sridhar? So, uh, Sridhar will come after Suresh. And Suresh's second talk is gone to Sridhar's. So, you uh, can do it. Suresh is. Take a minute. This is Sridhar. Approaches to giant interpontine 
कवर नो आई सोइंग वीडियो ओके सर बाकी सब ठीक है थैंक यू चेयर पर्सन फॉर इन्वाइटिंग मी फॉर दिस सेशन इट हैज बीन अ गुड एक्सपीरियंस सो फार एंड आई रियली एन्जॉयड दिस साइंटिफिक मीटिंग समथिंग अबाउट द लेटर वेंट्रिकुलर ट्यूमर्स एंड वी सॉ डॉक्टर अतुल गोयल ऑपरेटिंग ऑन ए नाइस इंट्रावेंट्रिकुलर ट्यूमर यस्टरडे एंड दिस इज वेरी एक्साइटिंग फील्ड इन न्यूरो सर्जिकल Uh, procedures as such so uh, i would just go over it uh, quickly when you are talking about the the goals uh, the the intraventricular or particularly lateral ventricular tumor your goals uh, remain the same no matter what kind of surgical approach you have chosen and that includes the to obtain tissue for the histopathological diagnosis uh, try and remove safely as much as possible and uh, restore the csf circulation which is often the cause of uh, raised intracranial pressure uh, and then you have to prevent all those vital uh, neurovascular structures that you do uh, come across during surgery and this is a, a picture which uh, uh, intraoperative picture which shows the intraventricular anatomy of the the lateral ventricle which is here and you are all familiar with uh, these uh, these are delicate structures and this is the picture of the floor of the third ventricle or the third ventricular cavity with all these important structures and now you can understand how important it is to really deal with these uh, uh, delicate structures when you are removing a tumor from this area why endoscopy we have uh, seen that you know the the there are several approaches to to remove these tumors uh, um, from the intraventricular cavity but when you are talking about uh, endoscopy you can have some additional help uh, and that includes or help you to to carry out the surgical goals which is you know tumor removal for biopsy or uh, remove it completely uh, in addition to that you can have the cyst fenestration and when you are using the endoscopy you also have an uh, opportunity to do the uh, endoscopic third ventriculostomy septostomy echidectoplasties and then placement of various intraventricular catheter under direct guidance now this kind of uh, help is not there when you are using the non endoscopic approaches so these are various kind of endoscopic which uh, we already know and i don't have to go in detail uh, i am going to talk about the the port endoscopy that is used for removal of the intraventricular tumor and there are several advantages of this port endoscopy over the channel channel endoscopy and we all are aware of this, these advantages and disadvantages now the neuroports are now commercially available and uh, there are several of them are uh, even uh, manufactured in india now this is the last one uh, is the one which is used by the dr yadav's uh, uh, team at jabalpur and this is very very uh, cheap and uh, uh, portable what we use is uh, this transparent tube which comes as a package for uh, the the metronics uh, uh, drill bits uh, this is appropriate because it is just the internal diameter is uh, 11 mm and the length you can cut short according to your requirement you can use a, a test tube or a small uh, round ended smooth ended tube as a stilet and then you can introduce into the Uh, uh intraventricular cavity this is the internal arrangement of the port uh, where you put the, the endoscope at the top at 12 o'clock position the suction in surgeon's left hand at about 5 uh, o'clock and uh, this one is the instrument whether it's a bipolar forceps or whether it's a dissector or something which is just opposite on the other side and this is the the irrigation channel and this is how you put all the instruments in a specific arrangement although there is no channel for each one they are they can freely be be moved inside the the tube but this is how you uh, put all these uh, instruments inside this cavity and uh, once you tap the ventricular cavity then you put your endosport inside then split the endoport here and then stitch it uh, to the scalp so that you nobody has to really pull it uh, keep it in position 
these are the normal uh, instrument that you use for uh, microscopic surgery are also used for this surgery and this is the closure uh, if there's a burr hole you can put this one if there's a mini craniotomy then you can fix the bone flap like this and closer uh, these are the the uh, common sites of intraventricular or lateral ventricular tumors uh, and can be approached, most of them, the anterior one can be approached through the anterior, the uh, anterior uh, burr hole which is placed anterior to the coronal suture and then the posterior ones uh, can be used according to the, the typical site. So the transfrontal, transcortical uh, burr hole or approach is used when the tumor is located in the frontal horn or in the body of the lateral ventricle, or at the foramen monroe, or uh, anterior third ventricle region. Uh, occipital, uh, parieto-occipital transcortical endoscopic approach is used for the tumors located in the occipital horn and the trigone. So I will uh, show you a few examples how we utilize this uh, method, this procedure, in some of our patients. This is one is a 21-year-old uh, person presented with the raised intracranial pressure signs and symptoms. Uh, and this was the tumor which is starting from the midline, going uh, bilaterally into the lateral ventricle and obliterating the foramen monroe and going into the anterior part of the third ventricle. Uh, since the, the left uh, uh, lateral ventricle was dilated much more than the right side, we chose the left uh, lateral approach in this patient. So the burr hole was done, the port was in, uh, placed inside this, and the, the wall of the port is so transparent that you can see what is going on behind uh, this port wall into the brain. If there's hemorrhage or some injury, you can immediately take care of it. Uh, then as soon as you uh, reach the ventricular cavity, you see the tumor and you start biopsying the tumor. Uh, luckily, in this patient, the tumor was very soft, not like the one which uh, Professor Goel showed yesterday in his uh, operative uh, case. So this was very good, and uh, after uh, removing the initial part of the tumor, the inner core of the tumor was even much, much softer, so it was easy to suck. And as you decompress the tumor, you come to uh, see the, the lateral wall of the uh, ventricle very easily and uh, you continue to do this under direct vision. There are lots of irrigation required. Since this is a dry method, hemostasis is not a problem. You don't even have to use the bipolar even once or twice. Uh, more you remove the tumor, more tumor will come into your picture and then you have the flexibility that you can uh, turn the port on either side, 360 degree angle in order to see the, uh, the, the tumor very, very easily. And this is the core of the tumor, which is so soft that it could easily be suckable. The idea at this point is to decompress the tumor so uh, completely so that the whole tumor mass collapses and you should be able to see all the landmarks into the lateral ventricle and in the uh, anterior part of the third ventricle. So again, I said more you remove the tumor, more tumor will flow into the uh, operative field and there is no difficulty in, in changing the tumor. If this tumor is firm and hard, then probably things are different, but we were lucky in this patient and here is the foramen monroe. You have started uh, seeing the foramen monroe, little bit of bleeding, but all you need is good wash with warm saline. That's it. This is the tumor which is going into the foramen monroe here uh, and into the anterior part of the third ventricle. Uh, you continue sucking the tumor and uh, okay so this is now turning the tube slightly posterior uh, and you see and medial and you see more tumor is visualized here same type of consistency of the tumor uh, decompression is done using simply your suction you can use your CUSA if you have a endoscopic CUSA at this point uh, this is towards the end the tumor is completely removed from the from the ventricular cavity and this is the part of the tumor which is uh, extending into the lateral vent um, anterior part of the third ventricle the foramen monroe going on? Uh, okay fine thanks please let me know about the time huh? just yes okay so this is uh, this is at the end of uh, the surgery the entire tumor has been removed uh, then we went ahead and did the septostomy so that you can see on the contralateral ventricle if there is any tumor left or the CSF flow is, is correct. So this is the uh, 
a septostomy here. You can see good and clear CSF flow. This is the lateral part of the ventricle, uh, the uh, wall of the lateral ventricle. This is the choroid plexus here, which is slightly blood stained. And this is the foramen Monroe, where all the veins are converging. So this is the, the end result, uh, a total resection of the tumor. And uh, these are the post-operative scans showing complete clearance and resolution of hydrocephalus. Uh, removed completely, this is the, the MRI scan done three months after uh, surgery. Uh, and this is the histopathology slide showing this tumor to be central neurocytoma, complete resolution, and this pa patient doing very well. Another similar case, which has been uh, operated by the right frontal uh, approach by some uh, other uh, institution, at some other institution, and this is the post-operative scan. Obviously, they have not been able to uh, address this part of the tumor, which is in the left, left lateral ventricle, because their trajectory was different, and this is the tumor which was left. Patient was symptomatic, so we thought we will, we will uh, approach this tumor using the left lateral ventricle and left frontal horn. Uh, I won't go into the detail of the tumor, but this tumor was also neurocytoma, so very uh, easy to, to remove this tumor using your suction simply uh, and a dissector. I skip this video. Uh, this is the area from where we did the septostomy, and then we did the uh, other part of the uh, other lateral ventricle, and this is the post-operative scan. This was our trajectory. Uh, the port was put in this, and this is complete clearance of the tumor. Uh, from here, we approach this tumor. Another patient with, who presented with Caesar, similar location of the tumor, but this tumor was different, and uh, we managed to remove this tumor also uh, clearly. Little ill-defined tumor, but it was very easy to remove. Uh, this was a pilocytic astrocytoma, small one, and this is the post-operative scan showing complete removal of the tumor. Another patient, 64-year-old man, presented with headaches and uh, a tumor which was in the right lateral ventricle uh, in the trigonal region. So here we use the posterior parieto occipital. Uh, uh, we use the uh, navigation to uh, determine the trajectory and the site of uh, the burr hole. And uh, this was our, our tumor which was uh, uh, resected using uh, the endoscopic port technique. This here we open the ventricle and uh, this is, was all tumor and this was all tumor. So complete resection was uh, achieved in this patient also and this was a high grade uh, glioma required adjuvant therapy post-operatively. Another patient similar uh, 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 midline uh, mass, midline lesion which turned out to be a colloid cyst and this is uh, the colloid cyst removal. And this is uh, complete resection. I'm sorry, so because of lack of time, I will have to just rush to another patient with uh, large colloid cyst obliterating both the foramen and Monroe. We approach this from the right lateral ventricle, and this is the, the colloid cyst preoperatively, and this is after resection, good flow of CSF everywhere. And these are the post operative post operative scan showing clearance of the colloid cyst. Another patient, a large infiltrating tumor turned out to be an ependymoma. It was actually a, a redo surgery. First time it was done somewhere else by open methods and we did endoscopically. Another patient with uh, left parieto occipital region including the occipital horn and uh, removed completely using the same approach uh, with the endoport. So uh, this is a series of about 26 patients done between 2017 and 2020. We have added few more uh, in this series. Uh, all this is the location of these tumors. Uh, gross total resection was um, about in 77% of the patients. Uh, and we were managed to do simultaneously ETV in three patients, septostomy in 11 patients, and uh, EVD under direct uh, visualization, direct placement of the EVD in eight patients. Uh, these are the pathologies that we uh, came across during uh, our uh, uh, study. Uh, one thing I just want to let you know about is the, the, the complication or the difficulties or limitations. So in, in three patients, six patients actually, there was incomplete tumor removal. Uh, three of them were infiltrating tumor, were difficult to remove completely. Two patients had a very firm or hard consistency. 
were not suitable for the endoscopic method at all. And in one patient, the bleeding was a little excessive and it was difficult to control using the endoscopic technique. So uh, incomplete tumor removal was in these patients. Uh, in eight patients, the patient continued to have symptomatic hydrocephalus and six out of those eight required v patient post-operatively. Uh, other complications like seizures, hemiparesis, uh, memory impairment and subdural hygromas were treated in the usual fashion and do not require any uh, surgical uh, uh, intervention. So in conclusion, I would like to say that the endoport surgery is quite safe and effective method for sampling as well as uh, a complete removal of the small and medium-sized intraventricular tumors. The technique is also very effective in restoring the uh, CSF pathways and uh, treating the raised intracranial pressure. Uh, only three factors which are very important in uh, tumor removal. One is the size of the tumor, consistency of the tumor, and the vascularity of the tumor. So a careful patient selection is very important in, in this kind of uh, procedures. Uh, and you must take the help of newer intraoperative adjuncts like navigation, ultrasonic aspirators, uh, fluorescent contrast agents, laser, and all those neurophysiological monitoring, etc. Uh, to improve uh, your results and give the benefit to the patients. I thank you very much uh, for your kind attention and would like to invite you to the uh, interim meeting of IFNE, International Federation of Neuroendoscopy in Hyderabad in October uh, this year. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sanjay. <laughs> any, any comment or questions from audience, please? Okay. That's one question, Suresh. You know, I agree with you that we can use the port for, you know, anterior ventricular frontal mm. horn and mm -hmm. all those things. Mm -hmm. Now the question will be the use of port for the posterior, like you said, from the parietal. You know, when you use a one centimeter or maybe a little bit more of a port in a left parietal, I have no question that this patient will have several, uh, you know, parietal lobe sign after surgery and I think it is avoidable to use at least left parietal approach for a left parietal posterior intraventricular treatment. What do you have to say about this? Yes, uh, I mean, it is the same approach or same problem when you come across a tumor and you want to do the open surgery. When you do the open surgery, you have to do some corticectomy at some place to be able to enter uh, the ventricular cavity and remove the tumor. So this is the same problem. I don't think with using the port, you are coming across a specific new problem which is, which is not there. And yesterday I was seeing your uh, opening. The port will provide the same kind of uh, uh, opening no, no, in the ventricular region. You see the, on the other hand, if you go by transcalosal route, transcalosal, rather than left parietal, Second. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I think. Right. Uh, right. But I guess you know this is the selection of approach issue, and uh, I think you have to really select the approach appropriately, no, and exactly. only those which are you know suitable for uh, this kind of uh, uh, approach, there you no, should in general, use the port. What you showed was beautiful mm -hmm. videos and beautiful, convincing videos, and uh, very good. So right. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. It's at 11 millimeter port, isn't it? 11 that? diameter, yeah. Uh, that's what. Mm. So when you are do, g g couldn't do because of the tumor maybe firm or very vascular, when it, was it possible or did you try to, I mean, in the same setting, uh, going through the same port, maybe slightly bigger, and do with a microscopic excision? You can do that, yes. You can so do that, that in can one, do yes. one sitting, you can have the total excision. Of course, excision. of course. This is another advantage, actually. If you are yeah. really... Uh, you know, find that it is difficult to remove the tumor using the port. You remove the port and just go inside. In one colloid cyst, we had to really change over from uh, uh, port to open 
and it just takes another five minutes to do that because the approach, the mini craniotomy, everything was the was the was there already, you know. So it did not require much to change and bring the microscope in. Actually, okay. I'll, I'll just uh, that's what I was. Uh, he does it. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> you no, have a port. You, you have. I have this. Uh, I use the 10 cc syringe, which is around 10 centimeter diameter. There is a flanks which would not let yeah. it go in, so yeah. there is no need to cut it and stitch it. And if you want to increase it, just put a balloon, finger yeah. balloon on it, yeah. a dandy diddle, inflate it, and then put 20 cc port. Absolutely. I uh, there are several ways of you know approaching this and this is one of the ways okay i also know people who do not use anything you know and simple endoscope into that hole and then remove it this is a very good technique okay thank you very dr sankar nice. thanks thank you now may i invite dr sridhar who will be speaking on approach to joint intrapontine cavernoma uh, thank you uh, chairperson uh, the mind team uh, sorry for having to change the program to accommodate my flight. Uh, a little change to what I'm going to do. I'm going to look at uh, the cavernomas in the brainstem at different locations, which are not presenting actually on the surface. And what do you do, which are a little complex. And then you have to apply a bit of thought uh, to how to remove this uh, with a couple of videos to show the approach. So we all know that this fact that it is densely packed and we have to be careful about it and things like that. And uh, we have all read these articles which have uh, identified safe zones. Uh, there are huge host of uh, approaches which have been described by different people uh, saying this is the best approach, that is the best approach uh, to do this uh, so, and basically which are the safe zones. But if you actually look at when there is a lesion inside the brain stem, some of these safe zones can get distorted and they will not actually be where the, uh, your anatomical markers are. So that is something which you need to keep in mind. This is basically a talk for the youngsters uh, and young neurosurgeons, uh, not for the people in front. So this is an excellent article which I think people must read. It's a very old article, 1996, from Spetzer's group where they said the approach should be the two-point approach uh, where the lesion points. And this is something which is, I think, works almost every time. So this is something which I think youngsters must read. It's an old article, uh, but you must read it. In 2010, again from Spetzer's group, this was a very, again, a comment which I think is very relevant, where they change from the huge, uh, uh, you know, more invasive skull base approaches in favor of the regular approaches like these retrosigmoid, suboccipital midline, or the suboccipital uh, su uh, supracerebellar infratentorial craniotomies. And they call that these are the mo three most uh, used approaches as well as the which is and if you include the uh, the terional or with or without the OZ approach that would almost allow you to access all parts of the brainstem and I think this has become the standard by which you would approach most of these cases. So if you look at from the cervical medullary junction right to the thalamus these are possibly all the approaches most often the retrosigmoid a midline suboccipital with or without far lateral depending on what you want to do. For the pons, it's mostly retrosigmoid. You could uh, do also a telovelar or a lateral uh, supracerebellar infratentorial. Or if it is further anterior, then you go by a, uh, a terional uh, 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 orbitozygomatic approach if you want to. So basically, these are the three approaches. If you look at these three arrows, these are the three approaches that you would use. And uh, this is what all of us would do. These are the three approaches that you would use, whichever way we go, depending on high, how, or low the tumor is. So this is an example of a, a midbrain thalamic uh, cavernoma, little slightly deeply placed, more medially placed, not coming laterally. So our thought process that we would have to do it from anterior because it's anteriorly placed and therefore probably anterior to the third nerve. And that's what 
uh, we thought, and that's how we proceeded. We did a, uh, almost a, an approach like this. And this was uh, like a one and a half approach, what you would do a tyrional, and then we went to the tentorial edge. We located the third nerve. We then, this is the third nerve, we followed the third nerve to the midbrain. Dissected there, get, got the entire uh, place cleared up. Then got to the midbrain surface, the third nerve is here, this is medial to the, to the third nerve. And there we found the yellowish tinged surface of the midbrain, which said, okay, and relatively avascular, and that's where we went in. And that's the blood around the cavernoma. And after, once you reach that, then the surgery is simple. Uh, all that you would do is, is go in with your uh, bi thin bipolar and thin suction, dissect all around, and you would remove it. And that's how basically uh, the cavernomas anywhere are removed. This is the post-op scan, patient did well. Uh, mild third nerve paresis, but nothing very great, which improved over a period of time. This is another uh, midbrain uh, pontine lesion. One year, three months boy, progressive left hemiparesis, left third nerve paresis, and a lesion which was multi-cystic and coming right down to the pontine level. But, uh, uh, and we were really wondering how to approach this. So I decided to first approach by the easiest way, which was the retromastoid. So this is the fifth nerve, this is the seventh, eighth nerve. So we found a large cystic lesion there, we aspirated, uh, and then it was a, it was a cystic uh, cavernoma, so then peeled off the cyst wall. And then we went as much as we could till we saw the brain stem, but I was sure that there was more medially because that's what the MRI showed. So we said we will do a second stage. And when we did us waiting for a, another day, we said we'll do it after three, four days, but he bled. Uh, and then we had to go in as an emergency in the midline. We did an inferior vermis split uh, and then got the cavernoma out here. So sometimes you would have to do it in two stages if you cannot reach the cavernoma, which are very, very big from one side. And we got the whole thing out. Uh, this is the immediate CT scan, nine months post-op. This is the immediate uh, on discharge. This is when I visited. They are from Batikaloa in Sri Lanka. So when I visited there, uh, he was presenting me with a Ganesha. And this is a 10-year follow-up which they have got. And he, this is how he is. Slight hemi residual hemiparesis, but otherwise going to school and doing uh, relatively well. This is the, uh, uh, a large uh, pontine cavernoma here uh, with a, quite a bit of, of uh, matter on the floor of the fourth ventricle, so not really an option. So we were wondering how to go there. And when we did the DTI, I don't have that particular image, we found that the tract of the, the fifth nerve tract was, which when we followed, was going almost leading us to the uh, cavernoma, so that's what we did. So this is the craniotomy. So, open the dura as a flap towards the lateral side. This is the seventh, eighth nerve, opening the arachnoid there. What we tend to do is we open the arachnoid quite widely in these cases, and that is the fifth nerve that we saw. Now, you would see here, this is very, very odd in that it, the brainstem is actually bulging there, making the fifth nerve angulate and go almost under the seventh, eighth nerve. So giving it very little space actually. So we opened the arachnoid of the 7th, 8th complex as well. This is the low cranial nerves there. That's the 6th nerve you can see in the depth. And then we'll use navigation to see where we are and how we could best approach. This is the 7th, 8th nerve. And then we thought this is the 5th nerve dress. Now this is something which I sometimes do when we have to cross the 7th nerve. Uh, and go in, we protect it a bit so that my 
suction and other instruments don't inadvertently, you know, keep hitting it and damaging it. Uh, so that this is the dress of the fifth nerve. So we chose an avascular zone, opened into that. This that did the bile incision with uh, an arachnoid knife, and then used a jeweler's forceps and a 0.2 bipolar uh, to follow the tract of the navigation and uh, reach the lesion. The, the dress of the fifth nerve and just below it is an excellent area to reach lesions in the pons, and that's where the, uh, you can see, start seeing the cavernoma. It's a large cavernoma, so uh, it's there, and we'll now see a gush of blood coming out. And this being quite deep, you have to have uh, long instruments. You suck out the blood, which is around the cavernoma. There, another loculated blood, uh, which is around the cavernoma, comes out. And then you start dissecting all around so that uh, I, I have a very, very thin a retractor which I use to gently retract. The basic thing is to keep the brain away and not really retract the brain. I think the word is wrong. It is just to keep the brain away. The brain can pulsate under that and it will not do anything. And then you keep dissecting around it and then the problem in these large cavernomas is that uh, it, it's, it's difficult to you know, keep track of where you are. So it is very important to maintain the plane of dissection when you are removing these cavernomas. Now we have dissected almost around. We, are, we have reached the normal plane everywhere and then it comes out. Gently, because it's, the opening is actually smaller than the size of the cavernoma, so you don't want to damage as it comes out either the seventh nerve or any part of the brain stem. So you have to sort of manipulate it out like delivering a baby. Yeah, and that's it out. Uh, checking hemostasis. I use flowable hemostat uh, when doing this, and then the cavity is covered with surgery cell. So this is the immediate post-op. This is on the second post-operative day. Uh, here, uh, patient doing relatively well. This is just to show the cavernoma. This is the CT scan, and this is the one-year follow-up MRI. Uh, I think this is the last case of a three-year-old male child with uh, low cranial nerve palsies and left hemiparesis. This is a medullary cavernoma. So uh, this, again, used a lateral approach uh, going right down uh, to the jugular foramen. This is opening the cisterns at the base. Once again, a large opening all the arachnoid so that we see all the cranial nerves very well, uh, making sure dissection of the vessels so that nothing comes in the way. And when you are working in the depth, you don't inadvertently you know, pull on some vessel and it doesn't get damaged when you're doing something in the depth. So this is where we want to go. We can see the difference in color between here and there. But then this leash of vessels are lying right on that. So. What we did was we kept a small cottonoid, dissected it, pushed it away, and then kept a small cottonoid on it uh, just to make sure we don't, uh, it doesn't come in the way because that's where we want to go. So push that away gently, and then kept a small cottonoid on it. Time? Uh, Three four, four and a half minutes. Okay. And then we can now see that the bulging and yellowish uh, 
slide is there. Now all this we use navigation to check also that we are in the right place and we are in the right direction. Again make an incision. So the blood comes out and the blood coming out actually gives a lot of space for you to dissect. And then sometimes you would need to use the suction as a dissector, which I am doing here with zero suction. Uh, because there is CSF which is flowing around, it is not that there is no CSF and you would have to dissect the plane. Now, so there is no space for three instruments. So what you would have to do is use the suction as a dissector, gentle traction on the capsule of the cavernoma and then keep going ahead. So this is, you see the suction is zero suction, dissecting in the plane which is the right plane and then slowly the cavernoma is dissected all around. Small vessels which are there nearby can be cauterized. Keep the power of the bipolar very low and make sure that you don't uh, cauterize the rest of the, the side of the, uh, the, the bed of the cavernoma. That's the cavernoma coming out. That's the, the end of surgery. So that was the first post-op day. Uh, this is the cavernoma which came out and this is the three months follow up, the child doing well and this is when the child came to my OPD. You can see that the child is well, we don't even have to examine the child. So this is another case, uh, again a bleed, you can show a large intrapontine cavernoma, uh, again done by the retromastoid approach and removed completely. Uh, I think so. Uh, this is a 12 month follow up MRI and then we have a 5 year follow up which shows nothing. So I think in conclusion, I think we should keep the approach to these brainstem cavernomas even if they are in the depth very simple and the, it has to be individualized. The use of navigation in this is very, very useful as well as intraoperative neuromonitoring is a must but I think it can be done with good microsurgery and good outcomes can be given. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Sridhar. Any comment or questions? Yes, sir. In your experience, any association with the DVAs, developmental venous anomalies with the Yes. Uh, in a couple of cases, I have none of these, but in a couple of cases, we have seen those venous channels and we make sure we don't put any cautery. The, what I tend to do is put a, either put a patty or put surgery cell on that area so that I know it is there. Otherwise, when there is, you know, all this venous blood coming out, you sometimes can cauterize it by mistake. Yeah, this one. Sridhar, that was a, okay. uh, that was a wonderful collection of cases. Beautiful done. Congratulations. Thank you. Hello, good afternoon, sir. So recently, I have uh, started uh, one more uh, access to such a midbrain, anterior midbrain uh, cavernomas. I did the transtemporal, transventricular uh, choroidal fissure splitting and approached the cavernoma. In the midbrain. In the midbrain, anterior midbrain over the crust and upper part. Sure, of the sure. Crust. See, there are many, many, many approaches, mm. but doing surgery on the midbrain or anywhere in the brainstem itself is complex because you should make sure you don't injure the patient. So, in my mind, I would like to keep this approach as simple as possible. If I can get a simpler approach, I would do that. And that is, but you could do it. If yeah, it the, works for you, access, it's very the good. The access was very good, sir, actually. And uh, you can uh, uh, avoid the ventricular artery. I, I have yeah. done the thalamic thing with the subcoroidal approach, all that. But that itself is, is the approach itself is a tedious approach. I mean, you have to be careful doing it. So, that's what. Uh, bothers me. So if I can do it in a more simpler approach, I would do it. So that is why. Otherwise, it works. Thank you. Sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
May I invite Dr. Suresh Tan for surgical management of trigeminal schwannomas, which is defining the role of various approaches. These two people may want to talk. They are here. Unless they go. Yes, what can I come? We have to talk. We are going to start now. Okay, Don't thanks again. Uh, thanks for the three big guns sitting here. Uh, Lakshmi. Uh, both and my dear friend Harsh for inviting me. What a great two, three day meeting we had and we saw wonderful surgery. And yesterday we thought there was a trigeminal schwannoma, but it turned out to be a cavernous sinus meningioma. Okay, so le let me tell about uh, the experiences we, oh why it is not moving? It's not moving. What is that? No, no, no. It takes a couple of seconds. It's more than couple now. It is now. Let me see. Or something, uh, some start uh, thing should be there. Right? Already Apply. Yeah, okay, fine. No hope now. Okay. Okay, so I don't have any disclosures and uh, this is the institute where I worked and basically, you know, these things can arise, schwannomas can arise in the subarachnoid space, in the posterior fossa, in the dural space, either in the Meckel's cave or the lateral wall or the cavernous sinus or extra durally along the divisions. And this is a simple depiction, middle fossa, posterior fossa along the division. So many classifications have come, I will skip for want of time. And we had the 99 cases uh, in uh, Chitra Institute of this thing. And uh, uh, sometime back, Harvey Cushing had written, this is one of the most uh, difficult tumors to uh, get operated. But over a period of time, uh, people have uh, found that these things can be. Uh, so you are seeing, this is a petrous bone from posterior. This is a superior surface, arcuate eminent. You are seeing a cup here. This cup is called the a trigeminal impression, T-I, is trigeminal impression. So what does that trigeminal impression house? It houses a pouch. That pouch is called the Meckel's cave. So what is this Meckel's cave? Meckel's cave is a dural pouch. And that dura doesn't belong to middle fossa. That dura belongs to the posterior fossa. So this is a dural pouch sitting in the middle fossa between two layers of middle fossa dura. So this is what it is. You are seeing the dural pouch here which is called the Meckel's cave. It houses the trigeminal ganglia. It is sitting between the dura propria of the middle fossa and the periosteal dura of the middle fossa. So it is in the inner dural space. So what is happening is distal to the Meckel's cave coming distal to the Meckel's cave, the dura which is the dura of the Meckel's cave that continues over the divisions of the trigeminal nerve as its epineurium. So that epineurium over the division is actually the extension of the dura propria of the posterior fossa. So what is this interdural approach? It is coming between the middle fossa dura propria and this dura propria which is that perineu epineurium over the division and that epineurium is you remember it is the dura from the posterior fossa so if you can come between these two layers it is called the interdural approach which you can come from either foramen ovale rotundum or a superior orbital fissure okay you can these are the various people say you, you can see some person is there is also sitting here big people are there so you can come from the superior orbital fissure which always many of us do by cutting that meningo orbital brand and you can come back and reflect that dura and expose this area uh, this is cavasus quadrilateral and what is it uh, this is a very important picture here you are again seeing the uh, gasserian ganglion this is just showing the v3 division which is coming through the foramen of it you can see two layers of dura here. This is the dura, the periosteal dura and the uh, periosteal dura and the dura of the uh, middle fossa. You can con come between those two layers by drilling. So you can see the middle fossa dura propria is this dark one. This is the periosteal dura of the middle fossa. So if you drill the bone, you can open into this space and enter into 
uh, that uh, in the dural space, and then you can mobilize this middle fossa dura to expose the Meckel scape. This is a beautiful cartoon which has, I have stolen from one of the presentations of Sebastian Froelich. Again, you can see that this can be one of the division of the uh, trigeminal nerve, either ovale, rotundum, or superior orbital fissure. You can see the dura propria and the periosteal layer. So what we can do is, you know, you drill the bone. And drill the bone, this bone you drill, and then you cut this uh, periosteal dura. Say so this is drilling the bone, and then you cut this periosteal dura, you are entering into this interdural space between the dura proprio, the middle fossa, and the perineurium of the division. That is precisely the interdural approach, which is what you can see here in this beautiful cartoon. And uh, this is one I, I said, I will skip this for want of time. Everybody knows, and we have seen uh, this thing, this video, I will skip. This is an anatomy video, cadaver video, where same thing, sharp dissection, you can, uh, you can uh, this interdural area, you can easily expose. And this is some of the, uh, say normally you have this, you know, uh, this uh, superficial middle cerebral vein. It drains through the sphenoparietal sinus into the cavernous sinus, sometimes to the pterygoid plexus. But at times, uh, this, is, this can have this uh, sort of venous drainage through the sphenobasal sinus or sphenopetrosal sinus. If this venous drainage is there, these are relative contraindications for this surgery. And off late, we have this approach, endoscopic approach, just to this Meckel scape. And people have moved out from this uh, sagittal plane approaches to coronal plane approaches. Here you can see the facial skeleton. You remove the palatine bone. And then you expose the pterygopalatine fossa by opening the posterior wall of the maxillary sinus. You see this pterygoid base, two holes there. One is the rotundum, other is the median canal, which takes you to the quadrangular space, which is uh, uh, lateral to the carotid, straight to the Meckel scape. So if I get time, I will uh, tell about this. This is exactly what is it. These are all lateral to the, uh, superior to the carotid artery. And this is again a picture which I have taken from one of my friend Vinod Felix presentation. Now, this is a large dumbbell schwannoma which we had operated some time back. You can see there is a middle fossa, posterior fossa component. So what we did here is, uh, uh, you can see this is the middle fossa dura propria. We are peeling it. It can be easily peeled away. This is extra, what we call interdural. It is actually epidurally. You can peel the dura totally. If you keep on peeling it, you can expose the Meckel's cave. You can go right up to the uh, roof of the uh, superior petrosal sinus area you can go. So you see the whole tumor getting exposed. Without opening the dura, epidurally we are exposing the tumor. Uh, le let me run it little faster. Once you have exposed it, uh, say what you can do, uh, say you can uh, say CUSA and then take out the whole tumor. You can see even the posterior fossa component uh, can be removed. Uh, through a large enlarged porous. So if the, if the porous is large, if the tumor is extending to the posterior fossa, these dumbbell schwannomas can be removed easily through a middle fossa interdural approach without doing any bony work. So ultimately we are seeing the brain stem there, the whole tumor uh, is uh, removed. Uh, let me move out and show you some other video. This is a large tumor, middle fossa, and you can show a tumor in the infratemporal fossa. Again, the same approach only. It's an interdural approach. Uh, so already tumor is there. When we open, you can see a large tumor. I will just run it faster. You can decompress with QSA. Uh, running again faster. The whole, uh, that middle fossa component and the extracranial component, uh, we have removed and then covering the area. So you can see the whole dura is intact. We have not opened the dura. And this is the post -op picture. Again, a dumbbell swano. Sorry. It is still working here. <laughs> so uh, so th this is at another large tumor. You can see this size of tumor in trigeminal schwannomas. Again, you can see the dura has been peeled uh, back. So this is that interdural approach, which I described, you know, coming between the epidural space uh, and the division of the trigeminal nerve. Here, of course, the trigeminal division cannot be seen, and the tumor is getting exposed there. And then I will run it faster. 
inside the dura is there, inside the tumor, the posterior fossa extension can be removed through this uh, enlarged porous without opening the, uh, and this is a posterior picture. And uh, this is at another patient, again there is a, one carotid is not filling at all, and then again we went through this similar approach. And you can see here, the, I, I think this is extracranial, middle fossa, posterior fossa. Again, that same approach, uh, say in the dural approach, peeling out the dura properly of the middle fossa, and then going into the tumor, and the posterior fossa component, we are removing through this enlarged porous without doing any bony work. Same technique, posterior fossa component is being removed through the enlarged porous. And uh, this is the posterior picture on this side. And uh, suppose that uh, uh, posterior fossa porous is not enlarged, then you have to do this anterior petrosectomy. He exposed this cavasis triangle and then exposed the posterior fossa dura. Then you, you cut the superior petrosal sinus and uh, go to the posterior fossa. This is uh, precisely what we do is we expose the posterior fossa dura in the cavasis triangle. This has been drilled with this posterior to V3, anterior to RK tuminense and medial to uh, uh, greater superficial petrosal nerve. You take out this bo uh, bone, then open the middle fossa dura. This is intradural now. And we are retracting the temporal lobe, tendorium is seen, cut the superior petrosal sinus, and then you get into the posterior fossa. This is what we call anterior petrosectomy approach, which he did for this patient who has a dumbbell schwannoma. But patient has a very small porous, which we couldn't uh, uh, remove uh, through that enlarged porous, we couldn't remove. So here we did the anterior petrosectomy. So again, same, we are peeling out the uh, dura, I'll run it fast. After that, the middle fossa component is removed. Then after that, we have done an anterior petrosectomy and then cutting the tendorium here, the superior petrosal sinus here, and then removing the posterior fossa component uh, through the anterior petrosectomy area. So this is the brainstem part being removed. And this is, these are some of the examples of large dumbbell schwannomas which we have done through this intradural approach. This case is a case totally trigeminal schwannoma. You can see the seventh nerve intact. This is a trigeminal schwannoma. Posterior fossa component, what I did, I did through a standard retrosigmoid. So when it is totally in the posterior fossa, we come and remove through our standard. You can see that trigeminal fascicles can be saved also uh, sometimes. So posterior fossa component, posterior fossa mass, standard retrosigmoid approach. This is the posterior picture. Another patient, I think I'll skip the video for want of time. And these are some endoscopic approaches which I have told you. These are called the coronal plane approaches. You go expose the uh, pterygoid base and which will take you directly to uh, this, is, this operation was done by Professor Gartner while he had come to uh, Trivandrum. And he is doing precisely that endoscopic approach through the pterygoid base. And uh, uh, he is reaching that quadrangular space, exposing the uh, Meckel's cave there and taking out the tumor. And what I want to tell is, you know, if the trigeminal fascicles are displaced uh, medially, our middle fossa approach is the best approach because you can straight go there, fascicles are displaced medially. On the other hand, if the trigeminal fascicles are displaced laterally, this applied to Meckel's cave schwannoma. If it is displaced laterally, endoscopic approach is an another option because you can preserve uh, uh, the trigeminal uh, fascicles. Uh, uh, so this is, you know, prior to 1992, all the cases we are operating through standard subtemporal uh, or retrosigmoid approaches. But later, uh, since uh, 1993, uh, say we started using all these skull base approaches. And uh, uh, this is our uh, uh, 99 cases, radical removal in 85, decompression in 14. And these are some of the examples of uh, uh, trigeminal schwannomas, large ones we had operated through these uh, approaches and all sorts of complications we have had but lost only one case and that case right from postoperative meningitis uh, but we had our share of complications there is no surgery without complication so choice of approach we have all these various approaches when the porous is widened by the tumor mass posterior fossa 
tube component can be removed through that orifice without uh, division of the tendorium. But otherwise, with considerable extension into the posterior fossa, or when porous is not enlarged, we do additional petrous resection. And the tumor is predominantly in the posterior fossa. We remove through a retrosigmoid route. And uh, an endoscopic approach, I told, because if the trigeminal fascicles are displaced laterally by the tumor, it is a promising approach, which people do. Uh, thank you very much. Sir, you want to continue? Myself? Yeah? I want to continue. I will give Changla's talk now. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Sir, <laughs> thank you very much. Okay. Any, mm. any questions I can, please? Any question? Any question? Anybody wants to trouble me, you can ask me, please. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Sudesh. Now, I invite Dr. Siddharth Ghosh. We will be speaking on medial spinoid wing meningioma, surgical nuisances and complaints and complication avoidance. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, at the onset, I want to thank uh, my dear friend Lucky to invite me here for this talk because Kolkata is my place and I always feel better and he has been talking to me over the years and I'm very privileged to be here uh, for this talk. So. I have changed my uh, title a little bit that uh, media surgery of medial spinoid meningioma, not without risk. Why? Uh, the, uh, there are two, I mean, uh, in the last conference, uh, you know, in the skull based conference where uh, Professor Asish Shuri was there, he was telling that two surgery which makes me very humble. He was telling one is craniopharyngioma and one is petroclival meningioma. For me, I think two surgeries which made me humble. One is uh, medial spinoid wing meningioma, and other was other one of of, of course uh, petroclival meningioma. I will skip all this because all of you know about that. But medial spinoid wing meningioma is actually the incidence of spinoid wing meningio meningioma is about 11 to 18 percent, and 50 percent of them arise from the medial spinoid wing. And uh, the the common is from is mostly either from the anterior clinoid or from the medial one third of the clinoid that we all know. So the classifications has gone in two groups. Uh, there are one heterogeneous group. One is the globular type, and an, another is a hyperostotic type, which is an n plug tumor called spinoorbital meningiomas. So there are three classifications which by LMFT. Then one which arises from the superior and inferior uh, part of the superior and medial compartment of the uh, carotid artery and because of this proximal and the dural ring this part of the you know the carotid does not have an arachnoid so these type of tumors are very often uh, adherent to this part of the carotid and as well as the optica but the optic apparatus the advantage is that there will be an arachnoid plane so you can definitely separate it out from the arachnoid from the optic apparatus, but this is the area where it gets severely adhered into the carotid artery. So that's why this, uh, uh, this surgery becomes difficult. The second one is a group two, which arises from the lateral and the inferior component of the uh, carotid artery. And the advantage of this, this part of the, you know, the carotid artery, there is arachnoid coverage. So you can peel it out from this part of the carotid and it becomes rather this part, this type two, the group two are comparatively much easier to remove as opposed to group one. Now comes the group three. The group three is, it goes within the carotid foramen. So obviously these tumors are difficult and the advantage of this tumor is that 
they are very, very early detected because the patient complains of visual loss very early, but these are also one of the difficult group to dissect because again, the arachnoid plane in that area is absent. Now, you know, you know the medials, this, so that, that's why I said this medial spinoid wing meningiomas, it, it definitely has a much more difficult problem because they involve the anterior visual pathway and arteries of the anterior circulation and may, may involve the cavernous sinus. So that's why they have a high chance of morbidity, if not mortality, and the rate of recurrence of the medial spinoid meningioma is rather high. If you go by this, you see if you do a complete excision as uh, Simshan's grade one, then it has got a 99% recurrence, 10 years recurrence. If you do a uh, Simshan grade two, it's a 19%, grade three is 29%, and subtotal resection has got 40% recurrence. So I will not go by this pr uh, clinical presentation because all of you know about this. So. I will skip this and so but it's very important to have a thorough history and physical examination of these patients because uh, so far the signs and symptoms are concerned and the investigations definitely high resolution three Tesla MRI helps us and fat suppression images for the orbital invo involvement is very important and T2 weighted images gives an assessment of the vascular encasement. And CT angiography is always must for this because you will know the relationships of the carotid artery with the tumor. And if necessary, you have to do a DSA because some of these tumors, you can get the, vas if you know the vascularity, you can do an embolization as well as in case the, you know, the in case of injury to the carotid vessels or if you have to occlude the carotid artery, you can plan for a prior ECIC bypass. So the in, these are all I'll skip now. Well, the treatment in my say, opinion is always surgical and surgical only. So is there any role of SRS? Yes, for small tumors in asymptomatic patients or even with smaller tumors which occupying close to the optic foramen should be subjected for surgery. Uh, is there any wait and watch policy? Yes, small tumors in elderly patients in, or patients with a high risk tumors or small incidental tumor in an asymptomatic patient. So extradural you know, clinidectomy is, uh, is definitely needed for this type of tumors in certain cases where it's necessary, especially when it's going to the optic foramen. So this all we know in the rotten specimen. So the uh, surgical planning is very important regarding the size, shape and extension of the tumor, epicenter of the tumor, vascularity of the tumor and obviously the broad attachment. And the re relationship with the visual apparatus, ipsilateral optic nerve, contralateral optic nerve and optic chiasm, relationship with the major vessels and of course the ICA and its uh, bifurcations. And you have to always look for whether the vessel is encased or displaced or extension to the optic foramen, evidence of hyperostosis of the sphenoid wing is present or not, and whether there is cavernous sinus involvement or not. And uh, uh, there are tools definitely and we use because we have that facilities, we use intraoperative navigation, QSA and ultrasonic bone QSA for the clinoidectomy, the last part of the clinoidectomy. So intraoperative neuromonitoring is very useful. You have to place a lumbar drain and you do by the, either by the extended arterial craniotomy or in some cases we need an orbitozygomatic osteotomy as well. So I will skip the steps because I will go to the procedure straight away. And uh, in between um, no, 2015 to 2021, 22, I have a total number of 23 cases, and out of which 11 is a medial spinoid wing meningioma. So I will show a few illustrations and the complications that I had. Now this is a 50-year-old male, a known case of right spinoid wing meningioma, of course rather extensive. Uh, he was given initially 25 cycles of uh, radiations elsewhere. He presented with a loss of right eye, lo uh, eye vision and it's all uh, extraocular cranial nerve palsy. 
Now, uh, I did a, uh, no, when we did the NGO, we found that the right carotid is totally occluded. And, uh, but uh, you see that there is complete occlusion of the right carotid here. And so, uh, but even then post-operatively because the right internal maxillary was uh, uh, embolized. And we did an ECIC bypass because we never know because of the cross circulation may not be good. So it was an ECIC bypass was done. And then the patient was taken up for surgery. There was an extended uh, frontotemporal craniotomy, orbitozygomatic osteotomy, and gross total resection of the lesion, plus transnasal no, tra endoscopic excision of the sphenoid and ethmoid sinus part of the tumor. It came as a WHO grade two tumor, but he had recurrence after one year. So what is it happened after one year? The, uh, the deficit remains same, but the recurrence, he, re he recurred after one year, and but patient deferred any more radiation treatment. Uh, he went elsewhere, is operated second time after one year. And, uh, and there I, I could remove it uh, the second time, but the patient developed definitely a right hemiparesis. This is a lady who is a 46-year-old lady, a known case of left medial spheroid wing meningioma, and pluck meningioma, again atypical. Excision was done by two th in 2018, followed by SRS in 2012. A redo partial excision in 2020, de December, done elsewhere. The right eye vision was progressively lost from 2017 onwards, and C, C apparently has no vision of the left eye. She had proptosis of the left eye with restricted UM, diminished left-sided facial sensation. So you see this CT angiogram is completely encasing the carotid and its bifurcation. So this patient uh, underwent first an extended endonasal excision of the n plaque meningioma plus left frontotemporal -to craniotomy and excision, excision of the remaining tumor on day two. But you see what happened. The patient had severe vasospasm and he had a whole ICA territory infarct. So this is what I do. These tumors are mostly very fibrous and when you try to take it out from the carotid, they develop and this happened during the endoscopy excision itself because the tumor, no tumor had to be pulled and that causes the vasospasm. So developed severe vasospasm resulting in aphasia and hemiparesis and be treated with milrinol. The MRI shows uh, ICA infarct. Patient had partial improvement after three months. This is, a, I was lucky about this tumor. This was a purely clinoidal meningioma and here it could, uh, could achieve a total excision and patient, patient has a transient third knob palsy. And you see the post-op excision is satisfactory. Uh, this is one is rather like a cavernous sinus going into the medial sphenoid wing cavernous sinus. And this was also could be peeled off from the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus and the patient did well. Uh, this is another case which I was talking about type C of Almacti, which was going, going within the optic foramen. If you can see here, it was going within the optic foramen and this patient was operated because the patient came with a loss of, he, he C again was given elsewhere by a cyber knife 21 gray in three fractions in February 2019. She has been symptom free since one month ago when she came to me when she developed sudden visual loss in the left eye. So this was external clinodectomy and the optic foraminotomy was done and the tumor was excised. That the uh, lesion was again very firm and vascular Vision did not improve. Patient was recommended uh, stereotactic radio surgery again for the rest of the things and patient went, uh, it was uneventful after that. And this is another case again, it's again uh, a medial spinal wing meningioma which is going into the cavernous sinus. And uh, this patient did well. I, I did a uh, no pa, uh, Simchan grade four. This part of the tumor was left behind, but the later on, uh, is waiting to have the SRS done. So this is another lady, again presented with, and uh, no, it was embolization followed by uh, craniotomy and excision, and his post-op period was 
uh, un, uh, success, uh, it was quite successful and it was, he had a cyst and the large, uh, you know, solid component. It was uneventful and he did well except a transient six nerve palsy. This you can see the post of here. And this is the re recent case, I, I have a video of that, I will just show it to you. So this is the case which did, did about three months ago. So the, uh, as I was telling the steps for the junior ne uh, neurosurgeon here, most important thing first you open the sylvian fissure. It's very important uh, that if you open the sylvian fissure, uh, this is a sphenoid ridge, as you can see, this is the frontal lobe and this is the temporal here, and you open the sylvian fissure and this, you, and here the tumor was there in the temporal fossa. So you have to do a very, if needed, orbitozygometic osteotomy also because you get very close to the you know, temporal fossa. Then you go to the frontal part of it, then lift the tumor out from it. So the most important thing, you have to get one of the branches of the middle cerebral artery. That's very, very important because if you get the MC1 branches, then you can trace it. The tumor again was very firm and attached to the medial sphenoid wing here, as you can see here. And the most of the tumors of medial sphenoid or uh, clinoidal meningiomas are very firm. And even the CUSA, it, do, uh, it doesn't work in many. You see, this is the MCA M3 branches. And you have to trace it, how it's going. And you have to get the proximal as well as this branch so that you know the middle part, which will be mostly encased near the near the ICA bifurcation. So we try to see where the optic nerve is. And see the optic nerve here. This is the anterior cerebral artery going. And you see the MCA here. So I've got the distal part. I've got the medial part. So I have to see the, where the bifurcation is and where it uh, Especially the most important thing, even the lenticulostriate branches, you have to be very, very careful because the patient develop get hemiparesis even if there is a compromise of one of the medial or lateral lenticulostriate branch, and uh, definitely they have a hemiparesis. So you see the carotid here. You see the ICA here, and and this is the ACA. So this is the bifurcation which is completely encased. These tumors are very firm, and even in the CUSA, uh, no, you, it doesn't go. And you can see you are separating the branches here. So this branch here, uh, the, this part is totally encased. And there only the problem this patient gets in, goes into vasospasm. You have to give papaverin periodically. Just separating it. You have to be a little slow here, not like Atul Gwell. I don't think that all of you practice like Atul Gwell because you have to be faster, but not at the early stage of your career. And so uh, definitely it's, uh, this area is very, very, because patient can go in spasm. You, you separate the vessel, you have an anatomical, uh, no total continuity, but I, in my, see, you see the whole thing, the ICA, uh, this is the MCA here going, the ICA and the ACA here. So I could achieve an ex total excision and patient did well. This is a post-op immediate thing, you see the, the tumor is out, this is only the tumor bed in the post-op within 20, uh, 48 hours MRI. And this is a patient who is, uh, is, is done well. He had a ptosis. Most of the patient developed a ptosis because third nerve is very, very sensitive. And it recovers over a period of three months' time. This is another one. Do you have some time? Two minutes. OK. So this is another one I was telling that uh, clinoidal meningioma. And uh, this is also. Uh, the same thing as I could open the sylvian fissure, very important.
So here again you have to open the sylvian fissure, very, very important, then come into the tumor. Here I, here I had to do a clinodectomy. Uh, first I opened, uh, I was thinking that initially I will get it without it. This is a, you know, the mastoid peristial band here. You have to cut that to get into the superior orbital fissure. Then you do, and this is a, doing the external clinodectomy. And once it completes, then you get into the tumor here. Here, uh, again, you see that most of the tumors are very firm in my experience. They are not easily suckable. So they are very firm. So that's what makes it more difficult. The, you see the optic nerve here? And you use the ca uh, Doppler to see wh where the carotid artery is. And So you are going along the sylvian fissure to get into, try to see if you get one of the branches of the middle cerebral artery, M3 branches, which you can trace. So some of the times where these little, in between you may get a little suckable tumor where you can use the uh, CUSA. It's only three minutes video, uh, uh, so just. So this is the part you have to identify the parent vessel, the ICA. You see the ICA here, and you see the bifurcation here. And this now we are, you are in the sylvian fissure trying to get into the MCA vessels. The MCA bifurcation and M2 branches are very important here because they are the one which normally gets uh, encased here. So there is a whole M uh, sylvian fissure is opened here and uh, tumor is taken out completely. So these are the post-operative scan for the same patient. So that's all. Thank you very okay, much. Thank you, Dr. Bruce. Any questions or comments? So, Siddharth, that was a wonderful case description, description of very complex cases. As you know, as we all know, anterior clinoid meningioma, medial spinoid wing meningiomas, as you rightly said, what uh, Ashish Suri said that these are, you know, troublesome tumor and you make, you, you are humbled by these tumors. See, what is, as long as you are safe, as long as you have not taken any middle cerebral artery vessel or any perforator, you will have a absolutely normal person and he, the guy is completely cured. Yeah. On the other hand, one small mistake and one small perforator you have hemiplegia and death exactly and yeah exactly so it is either here or there so that when to be here rather than there is the trick you agree with that yeah, so exactly. when to you know the most important thing is to do the surgery resect the tumor but avoid any vascular injury exactly. and over the years after doing several cases like this my feeling is you know when you are dissecting from the artery Sometimes the dissection is quite straightforward and simple and possible. But whenever you have any possibility of risk and whenever you are having a feeling that you might just damage, it is better to leave a nubbin or tumor on the artery and have an intact, wonderful patient. Yeah, that's what so, I mean. I also do. This. Definitely, that's a definitely important. Yeah. So never take the risk with the perforator. Mm. If you have one perforator damage, mm. you can have a very disastrous outcome. And that should be the main lesson 
in these kind of operations. Yeah, that's very true. That's what uh, I, I also do the same thing. It was very important to leave something and it is too much stuck to the vessels. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ghosh. Thank you. Sir, I had one question. So what is your policy on dissecting from the optic apparatus, especially when the vision is a problem? Because more often than not, ICA is probably a little easier to dissect, but the optic nerve, even if a little bit traction can worsen the vision. So, I mean, what is your, how do you handle this uh, issue? See, mo uh, this, this group of tumors, no, the mostly you can get a plane in the, for the uh, for the optic nerve and chiasm because there will be always an ar arachnoid over it. So uh, I, I didn't find much problem unless the tumor is going into the optic foramen, where there definitely already a vision compromise and there they can have problem. I had one patient who had visual deterioration, which had gone. I mean, of course, he came with a severe, uh, no, uh, vision problem and that was going in, into the optic foramen. When you take, your, take it out from the optic foramen, definitely there is a chance of visual deterioration. I fully agree with you. Can you do extra dural line out actually always? Uh? Not always in selected cases. Uh, tumor which is going into the optic foramen, otherwise no. Otherwise, otherwise I think uh, the up to the, uh, no, opening up to the superior orbital fissure is enough because that gives you enough space otherwise, in my opinion. Exactly. No, the clinoidectomy I do, but that is extradural. The, the other part is intradural for the opening the optic for me. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. So, to, I invite Dr. Tripathi to speak on decision making in neurosurgery evolution with time and technology. Dr. Tripathi. <laughs> Thank you. I'm really enjoying this uh, conference after a long time. We all had so many Zoom conferences online. I don't like it, like many of you. Let's meet physically, personally, of course, as close as you can be to the person. So my, this talk is, sounds very philosophical, but friends, we have a few front rows and a few back rows. I'm trying to breeze the two rows in my talk because like front uh, chair people, you also will encounter this in your life. Okay, it's just a matter of time. Now we are saying that our philosophy is to leave the tumor behind. But we were, when we were training, the challenge is, can you remove the tumor? Ultimate philosophy is what I've learned from my friends, including Atul, is that you want an intact patient, whatever may be the pathology. You want an intact patient at all costs. And that is asking. So I'll try to give some examples and very normal examples like all of us have encountered. And I'll tell you that with time, how one grows and why we say philosophy only comes out from people who have experience. So I want all the backbenchers, not really backbenchers, the younger people to learn that with time or you know, in shorter time, so you commit less mistakes. Can I have the slides, please? Wait, yeah, decision making. Decision making. So, um, you know what? When I qualified my MCH from Chandigarh in 1989, I joined a public sector hospital called Ispat General Hospital in Raurkula Steel Plant. That time in Odisha, there was hardly any public sector or private hospitals. So we were. I wanted to have a position in PGI, there was nothing. I wanted to have a position in NIMHANS. Dr. Das said that you have a pool officer's post, but there is somebody waiting from the institute. What do you want to do? I said, no, I want to go back to my state. There was nothing. So when I, my first talk in the IMA meeting in Raurkula Steel Plant in 1990, July, was this. 
of course, the slides have changed. I like giving this talk to many groups of people, including the wise ones sitting in the front. This is in making medica. medica. So uh, you see, we grow from student to doctor to surgeon to neurosurgeon to head of the department, senior consultant. I'm very proud to say that three of us, Dr. Jay and myself and Dr. Bosu, we are together. And most of the residents who have trained with us and doctors sitting in the audience, they know how we take a decision. Ego is out of question. In decision making, please keep your ego at home. Do not bring the ego to the table uh, while you're discussing. May it be for aneurysm, may it be for colored cyst, may it be for spine fixation. Now, we are in a group practice, and we must always make sure that three of us agree at the end. We disagree at the beginning on many instances that my colleagues will confer with me. But at the end, we agree because for the patient. And we learn from each other. I learn from my first year residents. They learn from us. And we learn from each other. That's how we, that's OK. First, go to the first slide. Thank you. So that's OK. Thank you. Um, I'll put it on. So, uh, as I said, that I think few of these I have already covered. Of course, there are certain differences. Well, we have difference in efficiency, we have difference in skill, benevolence. I already said, you you are benevolent to the patient. Ethics. I have nothing to say. That is the bottom line of medical practice. We are in medicine because we love it, not for business. Unfortunately, people like ourselves, we work in private hospitals and there are certain business aspects to it. Not to extract money from the patients, but to make sure you have enough profit to run the hospital, put in equipments, run the system. I am very proud to say the medical hospital that you are now in the conference hall is very well run system of hospitals. But the bottom line is they want more revenue, they want more patients. How do we do it? By applying ethics and all these points. Scientific facts, we all know. Do we counsel our relatives of the patients properly? Or we steer them to our advantage? That's a question each one of us should ask ourselves. When we counsel the patient, what is our body language? Is the patient confident that you will do a good job? Because he is seeing doctors. Second opinion, third opinion is very common. And human sentiments, you cannot just tell somebody, it's not America, it's India. We, you cannot just tell somebody that you have cancer, you will live for nine months. No, not, not in Indian circumstances. Unless the patient wants to know. Doctor, please tell me, I am brave enough. I can take it. Otherwise, we don't say there are doctors where you have cancer, you will not survive. Respect for, do you want that to be told to your relative? No. Because we have our life and emotions. At the end is the wisdom that I just mentioned in the beginning that with time and experience, we all develop wisdom. God has given us enough intelligence. Natural intelligence, not artificial with a phone or computer. Natural in intelligence to be wise and decide. Many times we take decisions, we think, should I have done that, shouldn't I have done the other thing? But when you are in a group practice, like, like I mentioned, three of us, we really, at the end of the day, we go back home and sleep. Even if there is a complication, we decided it together and we don't feel that bad. Now, examples. Clipping, coiling, endoscopic, microscopic pituitary, head injury with ICP management or clinical assessment before you do decompressive surgery, shunt or ETV, subdurals, chronic subdurals, boroughs or craniotomy. We all do this while we consent the patient made before normal head injury, when I say normal, doesn't mean normal, it's common head injuries or complicated cases in brain and spine. Friends, you know that the investigations, the radiology, the neuroanesthesia, neuropathology, we talk about all these molecular markers, they have really 
revolutionized our treatment of many diseases. And we have beautiful equipment. You've seen beautiful videos today. I was looking at Dr. Gose's uh, videos and everybody, everyone else who's spoken before. Beautiful videos. You got interoperative imaging. You got navigation. We got everything. End of the day, friends, old is gold. Do not underestimate the, uh, the investigation of an X-ray. Sometimes it give you really good information. And especially for trainees, don't say that I'll see MRI first. No. If X-ray is relevant, please ask for X-ray. You have robotics? Yes, but is it useful? I have a robotic in my theater, in one of our theaters, mostly used by the oncologist, Da Vinci. I don't use it. I don't need to use it. I'll tell you why. Now, imaging techniques like this one, I'm proud to say this was the thesis of my son, Kalyan Tripathi, who has just done his PhD from Washington University, St. Louis. So, this is a new technology of investigating kids, children, who cannot lie still. You have to give anesthesia for MRI. This is digital optical tomography. It's a very unique investigation. By putting some electrodes with a helmet, the child can play, the child can run around, and they will still have the imaging at go as good as the functional MRI. He just been awarded his PhD uh, uh, last summer. Now, ICP Bolt, how many of us, of us put ICP Bolt in India? One, two. That's it. I used to put a lot of ICP Bolts in England. Left, right, look in the diagrams, most of us, Suresh and everyone. Left, right, somebody did a bilateral study, left, right, but have we got funding? 50,000 rupees? Well, not in private hospital. Yes, if it is really indicated, like this case, small hematoma patient was unwell. You have to ventilate the patient, put the ICP bolt, and take a decision when to operate. Some of these hematomas for the younger generation understand that they can increase, the hematoma may increase with trauma, uh, with the history of trauma. The pictures on your right, extradural, no question. Surgery, immediate surgery. From emergency patient goes to theater, life-saving surgery, it's like an emergency cesarean section or ruptured ab abdominal aortic aneurysm. No questions asked. No money, nothing. Straight away. Sometimes, only sometimes, you have to understand that, yes, you take certain decisions in life. And this was the one we used adenosine for the first time for aneurysms in the country to save somebody's life. This was a very complicated, sessile, large, but you see the right vertebral and that's aneurysm and we are operating, you see the lower cranial nerves bridging over the aneurysm, I'm trying to dissect, while trying to dissect it ruptures and this is a very bad location and of course we had the proximal and distal control but not good enough to control the bleeding and that time I just returned from a CNS meeting in Washington, you see that bleeding? And Hunt Badger has presented, had presented his 40 cases of adenosine cardiac arrest. So I said, okay, I told my anesthetist, hey, where is the adenosine? So most of the time when we go to clip aneurysms, I always <laughs> frighten my anesthetist, hey, keep adenosine. Not that we use it all the time. We hardly use it two, three cases only. This one was a lifesaver because you see the bleeding, don't know where to put your uh, clip. Where is the, where is the rupture? So it's, it's very blind and very uh, unnerving. So once you give adenosine, you can arrest the heart for 40 seconds, max. One dose, 40 seconds. If you repeat, there is a chance of atri uh, ventricular fibrillation. So you should have a precordial uh, DC fibrillator. So a difficult aneurysms, we put precordial, and this is at the end of the aden adenosine. Now sudden, the effect of adenosine goes, and then we are secured the aneurysm. So, this kind of research published, this kind of decision, of course, one has to take. Atul is already the revolutionary scientist, I would tell, because you see, other than being a neurosurgeon, he thinks in different angle. I, I am pretty sure that, Atul, your concept of CV junction is already accepted, practiced, and produced, reproduced, 
and your concept of spine also will be accepted, produced. Because it's not that you are forcing, it's, it's that you think, you analyze things in a very different scientific and all the points I mentioned to you in the beginning of my slide, you put everything in it. And I know that, I mean it. Yesterday when we were operating together, the acoustic, he, you are never, at no step of the surgery you will see he is rushing. Especially when it was the seven nerve, he went absolutely still. So that's what, the surgery is a double-edged sword, friends, my younger friends. You can save, you can kill. The facial nerve weakness is not a good thing at all. I'm very happy to say, all the cases we, he operated, we operated together, are doing well. They're out of ICU this afternoon and soon be going home, including the acoustic. So, what I'm trying to say is that this occipital cervical concept, which he himself had done in hundreds and hundreds of cases, now he's saying it was wrong. So this is what it means with time, we, there is evolution and sometimes revolution with people like him and some people sitting in the audience. So we have to adapt with the time and of course aneurysms like this, I don't want to show you, but then you decide to, to coil or to clip. Well, this is a very gray area. I, I asked once Jack Murray, we were co-chairing a session in Calcutta. I said, uh, Dr. Murray, suppose you get 100, subract, 100 aneurysms, how many you will coil? He said 100. Then I asked uh, Spezler, Dr. Spezler, if you get 100 aneurysms, how many you will clip? He said 100. Maybe one or two less. So what it means is, if you are good enough in your job, you will do the job properly. But why centers in India and abroad are slowly changing to aneurysm coiling? There are certain other factors. I, uh, this talk of mine is not for controversy. This talk of his mind is how we change with the time. So friends, yes, coiling is there and Dr. Sukarlan was here earlier in the morning. He mentioned of endovascular surgery, not interventional neuroradiology, endovascular surgery, that neurosurgeons also can train. And I'm sure that is better because we know how to treat subarachnoids. They don't. And patients are with us, not with them. So, clipping, successful. Between three of us, we have clipped more than 500 aneurysms. And whenever there is an aneurysm, even if I have connection to my uh, theater, I am there with hers and, hers and myself, mostly do aneurysms. And Dr. Bosu is also there. So we enjoy operating together. Now, this colored cyst, you can say that, I'm sure, with experience of people like Suresh, Dr. Sankla, he can definitely do, but he himself mentioned at some cases you have to open and take, the, because if it is stuck to the thalamus right vein and the internal cerebral vein, and it's not coming out, do you leave behind or you open and take it out? Because rolling out on the endoscope, of course, he is an expert, but for general neurosurgeons with general neuroendoscopic experience, it is better, I think, to open and take out the cyst and preserve the vein rather than risking it. So these are the decisions. I'm not saying you don't do it, do it, but there is a risk always. Endoscopic third ventriculostomy or a programmable valve. Now when I went to England as a consultant 20, uh, 2009 and 10, all the shunts were programmable. I was using a, a shunt in a patient and then there was some problem. The sister says, oh, change it. Well, we can't afford it. It's almost one lakh rupees. So funding, of course, yes, programmable valve is good in certain situations like NPH or kids because you frequently get subdurals if it over drains. And in NPH, if it doesn't drain, then you don't get the benefit. You can program from outside. We, we put a lot of uh, this uh, programmable shunts. So this is a change. This is time. With time, you change. And with time, you... Now, I've already said about the endoscopic and uh, uh, microscopic. Many of us are still practicing microscopic pituitary surgery, including our master surgeon, Atul Goel. I don't have any hesitation to say I can do as good a job, but of course, the beauty of endoscope is there. You can visualize beautifully. You can do extended surgery with microscope. To do extended transplantation is very difficult, except for, for, for masters like Atul Goel. 
for most of us it is very difficult and of course if you have a carotid injury i wish suppose i was doing endoscope and there's a, i will probably ask uh, lunch time with dr sankla if you have a carotid injury obviously convert it to open because you have to plug it and it uh, the case i mentioned earlier was very difficult to control i held on with a muscle with this thing and there was a, a very bad septum i removing the septum the artery tore it was touches but because it was open i could control it and we took the patient to uh, cath lab and saved his life so certain situation i'm sure all of us will come across my talk this up, uh, this afternoon is basically to let you especially my younger colleagues be aware yes cranial pharyngitis we had a beautiful uh, uh, example by dr jain my colleague so while removing it of course you know you can remove it but you remember his case he left behind little bit and he is worried but then as we know new medical treatments are coming and radiation may or may not be advisable in growing children so uh, very hard and calcified cranial pharyngitis like this it's better to leave behind rather than take out with the hypothalamus i would not never do that so i think uh, lumbar discs we know just one point of caution to our younger colleagues here is that make sure there is not a far lateral disc if there is a far lateral disc it will catch the root above and even if you do a discectomy you leave behind that then you'll have a root above syndrome and a patient still will have pain so uh, fixation of the spine well uh, chandan is there he did a thesis our ex dnb he just passed out last year and we looked at the fixation of course if it is no you know it uh, there is no history of trauma there is no parts defect minimal degenerative lysthesis may not be fixed always but we have plus and minus points and individual case decisions necessary of course uh, atul's uh, new revolution of posterior fixation is also very valid we'll hope to see in future so i think with this i will uh, summarize and this is the same slide i showed in the beginning so ultimately we are human beings and we have different plus and minus you know, points to worry about but please remember at the all cost make sure your patient gets the best benefit not you or your hospital thank you very much for giving time thank you thank you dr tripathi <laughs> any comments who can comment dr tripathi oh thank you sir <laughs> very nice presentation sometimes i also leave the tumor and uh, sometimes i go out of the theater Light. because of this decision like yeah wrong decision rather okay thank you thank you great so thank you very much i am coming back to my role as the uh, organizer one of the organizers so let me have the privilege of felicitating the faculty here this session thank you dr shivasa for chairing the session and uh, dilip had to leave in the middle so uh, have you been felicitated please sir <laughs> he said no i think you were <laughs> no because you are the moderator we okay okay so anyway thank you very much for moderating you can have a flower can I have a flower that thing is there yeah you can you can take it now and then we'll say that you've already been felicitated sir thank with your permission take it twice thank you very much you want to say something or no thank you Thank you, sir. Thank you. Yes, of course. Our baby did it. Thank you, sir. It's a pleasure having you, sir. And as I mentioned earlier, he is the reason for us to have been awarded the DNB permission. So we're running the DNB program, and he very kindly came, inspected, and made sure that we have the facilities, etc. Thank you, Dr. Shivasu. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. No, no, don't. We have more. Don't run away. We have more. Okay. So next is uh, next speaker was Dr. Swastab. Just remind me, where is my list? I don't want to forget anyone. The next is uh, Dr. Suresh Sankla. Please, Suresh, have you been felicitated? You can have one more. Thank you. Sorry. Okay. 
Thank you, Suresh, for coming. And this is your, yeah, this is your prize for coming all the way. Thanks. There's something very special about Calcutta, I'm sure, yeah. once you open it. Thank you. And next is uh, Professor Suresh Nair. You got it already. Okay. Yeah, say, <laughs> Dr. Siddharth Ghosh, I want my colleague, Dr. Sunandan Basu, to please come and felicitate. Sunandan, please, me too. Thank you for coming. You okay? Thank you, Dada, for coming. Every time I invite you, you are there, so thank you very much. And it was a lovely presentation. Medial spinner doing, we all know that. Thank you. Uh, did he get the prize? And last is who? Me. I'll take that. Okay, no, that's fine. Okay. Lokendra will give me something. Thank you. Thank you very much. Subro, Okay. So, with this, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Basu, my colleague. So, with this, we'll go to the next session, which is uh, session three this, uh, today. And uh, we will break for lunch. Only, only I'll tell you. It depends on how we go. We are running late. So, uh, may I request uh, Dr. Lokendra Singh, uh, Professor Bhattacharya has uh, phoned me that he's stuck somewhere. So, I request. Uh, Professor Srinivas, Dwarkanath Srinivas, and Dr. Lukendra Singh, please moderate this session. Dwarka, is there? Okay, you can start. Look, in the, you have the list. Uh, yes, my, my talk. Okay. So, I invite myself for the talk. Yeah, yeah. No, no, I'll, I'll invite you. Yeah. So, Dr. Lukendra Singh is going to speak on a review of use of intraventricular balloon. Thank you. It, it's a surgical, neurosurgical talk, but uh, it is for the youngsters that how you have to innovate sometimes and how innovations can be suddenly very useful. And then we try to publish them as early as possible. And those are few mistakes which we do. I mean, I'm talking about devices. Another thing is that we are the medical people. We need equipments and devices for our patients. But somehow what is happening, the biomedical engineering have come into this. In fact, many IITs have started now neurosurgery, neurosciences center, IIT Roorkee. So they are coming in a big way into this way. And, you know, which is our forte will be taken away from us. So what I want that few of us who are more mechanical minded and innovative, they should really go into this field also. They can be, be operating surgeon also, but devote some time for research and innovations and developing, uh, you know, devices. The Sri Chitra is on the same line, I, I'm very sure. Sri Chitra Institute is on the same lines. It is by the DST, Department of Science and Technology. So I think uh, we have to have this uh, mindset also that we should be innovators also. So techniques are fine, but devices, I'm saying device means money sometimes, a lot of money. So there's a lot of finance also, there's a lot of uh, entrepreneurship in that. So please think from that angle. Uh, I have been invited now for talks for the uh, biomedical engineering colleges also, where IIT Delhi is also participant. And large number of engineers come there now. And uh, we have three days program there. So I have been invited twice to deliver lectures on uh, these. So guys, you know, keep your belt tight and try to do yourself also something. What happened? I said, I finished here.
I'm sorry about this, so don't worry. <laughs> it's, it's on balloon, so less inflation. <laughs> Connecting to Zoom actually. Yeah. Thank you. It's okay. No, she's somebody different. Connector? Connector? Hai. Connector? Connector? Huh. Connector? Connector? Yeah, we can. Last. Yeah, please keep your talks ready.
Sorry about that. Yeah, Suresh, let Dr. Ha. Huh. Sorry, look and you go back next. So, Professor Bhattacharya is here, so he'll be happy to moderate the session. Professor K.B. Bhattacharya is our colleague, sitting on your right. Thank you, sir. Thank you. This is Dwarka here, Dr. Srinivas. Okay, okay. I think, uh, can, I, yeah. can I start? Suresh, please start. Okay. All right, so uh, this presentation I am going to talk about another uh, an, an another uh, 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 difficult and challenging uh, problem in neurosurgery and that is multiloculated hydrocephalus. Multiloculated hydrocephalus as we define it and classify it, it is actually the presence of an isolated CSF compartment or compartments within the ventricular system with as a result of uh, uh, so many uh, uh, infection and so many other phenomena. Uh, in fact, the, the uh, incidence has been uh, mentioned in the literature is 7 to 21, but it is actually doesn't, it doesn't reflect the actual incidence of uh, the multiloculated hydrocephalus and Salmon was the first one who really uh, went into the detail of the incidence in 1970 <laughs> And he found that most of these uh, syndromes and most of these problems because of the multiloculated hydrocephalus are not really analyzed properly and that is why the incidence is so low. Uh, the mortality in the past has been very, very high. It is really about 50% uh, to as high as 70%. Uh, but with uh, the improved management policies and improved treatment and antibiotics and all that, the mortality has reduced significantly. However, the uh, neurological disabilities, particularly the psychomotor retardation and uh, 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 other cognitive problems have now come to the light uh, and it is uh, surprisingly very, very high. Uh, some of the series have even mentioned that the cognitive problems in these children who survive uh, the multiloculated hydrocephalus is as high as 90%, which is very, very alarming. Uh, the typical uh, clinical manifestations include raised intracranial pressure, visual, and uh, so on and so forth. And uh, the diagnosis is uh, MR cis imaging, which is very, very specific for this. Uh, the gold standard is the CT ventriculography with uh, IOHAXOL. So uh, with uh, these uh, introduction, I would uh, like to say that uh, the goals of the treatment, irrespective of uh, whether it is endoscopic or open, uh, remain uh, to reverse neurological deficit or to correct psychomotor disabilities and to improve quality of life. But friends, these are all uh, very, very you know, ideal and uh, uh, not very real uh, goals of this surgery. The real goals of surgery actually uh, is, in surgeon's mind, is to restore communication between the isolated intraventricular compartment so that either uh, the CSF uh, flow is regular with or without a shunt. And if you have to use any kind of CSF device, then it should be a simple ventriculoperitoneal shunt. That uh, can be uh, called as a successful uh, objective or successful goal of this treatment. There are several conventional uh, modalities which I'm not going to talk about. I'm going to talk about the endoscopic procedure. The advantage of endoscopy is that you can, uh, uh, you can provide so many other alternative or additional alternative uh, 
besides ETV, endoscopic septal fenestration, septostomy, aqueductoplasty, uh, choroid plexus coagulation, uh, foramen monroplasty, and many other uh, these intraventricular procedures, including placement of a catheter uh, under direct guidance, visual guidance. So I'll, I'll show a few cases how we treated this complex problem. Uh, this is a two months old child who uh, was uh, treated for uh, um, congenital hydrocephalus when he was just two months old. Uh, this was a typical aqueduct stenosis which was treated with a right-sided v -patient. The child did very well. This is the post-operative scan showing everything is fine. However, the child underwent so many multiple shunt revision, shunt infection, uh, went into bilateral uh, loss of vision and uh, so many other problems. However, the child's general condition remains all right. Neurologically, she remains okay. Uh, she had good uh, learning abilities and memory during her uh, childhood. And she now comes as a teenager, a 13-year-old girl uh, with uh, onset of uh, headache and vomiting and urinary incontinence. And this is her CT scan on presentation showing obviously multiloculated um, uh, ventricular uh, uh, hydrocephalus with raised intracranial pressure and uh, also there are so many you know, five or six uh, ventricular catheters that you can count easily on this scan and on the uh, MRI scan that was followed. So we thought we will uh, try and treat these, uh, this problem with uh, some of these uh, these procedures using the endoscope. So first we do, we thought we will do the ETV to restore the CSF flow. Then we thought afterwards we'll do the intraventricular fenestration to communicate in all the ventricular loculi to do the aqueductoplasty because the basic problem was the aqueductal stenosis. And then we'll remove all the malfunctioning shunts and then if necessary we can put a temporary ventricular access device or a VP shunt if necessary. So this is the first procedure, we did the right frontal bar hole and uh, uh, this is the ETV which was very, very simple except for the fact that there are evidence of uh, chronic hydrocephalus and infection. This is the fourth vent, uh, this is the floor which was perforated balloon and this is the prepontine system showing a good flow of CSF. So this was the first thing. Then. Uh, we also did the septostomy while we were there in the right lateral ventricle and uh, it was also a straightforward. We made a hole and then enlarged it uh, and then uh, we saw that the flow through the right side to the left side is perfect and it is doing very well. Then we uh, did a left frontal bar hole uh, and this is the left lateral ventricle frontal horn and as you can see inside there are so many membranes and so many septi inside. So we started perforating the septi one by one uh, using the same uh, methodology uh, puncture and balloon and enlargement and we also use laser in this patient to uh, make so many perforations in all the arachnoid uh, septations that we come, came across during this surgery and we communicated the entire uh, loculi within the lateral ventricle uh, 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 in one, one while we were in the lateral ventricle and then uh, we try to do the aqueductoplasty so this is uh, uh, aqueduct here and then to our surprise we found an ependymal cyst here uh, which was blocking the aqueduct completely so we perforated it and we excised it and uh, piecemeal and uh, we saw that the CSF flow is complete and with that we were quite satisfied that we have done everything possible and now the CSF flow should be all right and this is the post operative scan showing the you know reduction in the size of the supratentorial compartment of the ventricular system however the aqueduct stenosis was still not up to the satisfaction and the fourth ventricle was enlarged and dilated and compressing on the brain stem. So we thought something has to be done about this one. So then we did the fourth ventricular access uh, and they, they tried to do the aqueductoplasty from the fourth ventricle. So this is the video and we put the, the dilator here and uh, we did not uh, inflate the balloon but we just try and perforate the, the aqueduct which was uh, blocked by a thin membrane uh, and then uh, uh, 
this is the end of it and the CSF flow could be seen quite well from third ventricle to fourth ventricle. So with that now this is the end, end picture showing complete resolution, almost complete resolution of hydrocephalus. There's good CSF spaces opening up. Uh, the fourth ventricle has collapsed completely, the aqueduct has been communicated and everything looks quite uh, all right. And the child also did very well post-operatively and she is on follow-up, she is still uh, coming for the follow-up and doing very well. So that person is now shunt free completely. Another patient, a similar, pa a similar case, I will not go into the detail, developed uh, multiple shunt revisions, shunt infection, ventriculitis and this was the uh, uh, the ventricular state, multiloculated, so many shunts and we did the uh, right frontal uh, approach and then we did the septostomy and the ETV and everything and this is the end of uh, uh, the all procedures and the ventricular system is collapsed, child is asymptomatic uh, and doing very well without a shunt. Another patient who had uh, in early childhood uh, enlarged ventricle and ventricular uh, procedures including a VP shunt and developed the foramen Monroe obstruction here uh, and the left sided ventricle was enlarging and the child was symptomatic so we did uh, in this patient septostomy and uh, then a VP shunt. We also tried to do the foraminostomy but it did not really uh, go successfully and this is the post operative scan child improved and doing very well after that. Another patient uh, this patient also had multiloculated hydrocephalus. Uh, uh, in this patient, we did multiple fenestration, endoscopic fenestration, septostomy, ETV, uh, and she already had a functioning shunt, so we left that shunt in situ. Uh, and this, uh, she also did very well. Another patient with the same situation and a functioning shunt, uh, but we did uh, fenestration and septostomy and left the the uh, functioning VP shunt and she also did very well. Similarly, this patient, three months old uh, boy with uh, ventricular uh, left frontal horn enlargement and blockage of the foramen Monroe on that side. Uh, here we did the fenestration and ETV and septostomy. This is the ETV here and this child also improved and remained quite all right. Another patient with the similar uh, uh, problem, aqueduct stenosis and then the enlarged fourth ventricle. Here we try to put the uh, ETV and then aqueductoplasty using a stent uh, and this is the this is the post-operative scan showing a stent into the aqueduct going into the fourth ventricle and complete uh, restoration of the CSF circulation intraventricularly. So from 2015 to 2019 there were 27 patients treated in this manner with uh, multiple endoscopic uh, uh, procedures in one sitting uh, and these are all the details of these patients. Uh, uh, ETV and uh, fenestration were doing in were done in five cases fenestration and septostomy in three uh, fenestration ETV and septostomy in eight patients fenestration septostomy and VP shunt in four patients and fenestration septostomy ETV and acuricoplasty in seven patients so all 27 patient 19 patient required a VP shunt or had a VP shunt uh, completely in 30% of the patients, the, uh, the patients were completely shunt free. However, the shunt was required, one shunt was required in uh, 16 patients and two shunts were required in three patients. Uh, these are our results. Uh, improvement was seen in about 63% of the patients. Uh, complications were all minor and could easily be treated uh, and had uh, no problems uh, in, in the management uh, of these patient who develop complications. So this is our now protocol, the multiple uh, hydro, uh, loculated hydrocephalus. We choose the endoscopic procedure as a first and we do fenestration as the first procedure. And if we see that uh, the left uh, lateral ventricle is asymmetrical, we try and communicate the ventricles by septostomy uh, and if necessary we put unilateral shunt. If the third ventricular anatomy or the floor anatomy is favorable, we try and do the ETV as much as possible. If the floor is indistinct, then we try and put the uh, VP shunt. We try and do the acuidoctoplasty. If there is acuidoctostenosis which has never been treated before, we try and do that. 
uh, an isolated fourth ventricle, we do the aqueductoplasty from either above through the lateral ventricle or from the fourth ventricle, depending on uh, which way it is uh, more approachable. And if that fails, then uh, ventriculoperitoneal shunt. So in summary, I would like to say that multiloculator hydrocephalus is a very serious problem in which uh, no single treatment is clearly been proven to be the ideal. Neuroendoscopy provides so many, so many approaches and so many procedures uh, which are helpful in the management of these patients. So the goal of the treatment uh, should be to restore communication between the isolated intraventricular compartment in order to avoid shunt or implant a single and simple shunt as much as possible. More than improving the quality of life of these patients, the objective should be to reduce the number of procedures in these patients and number of hospitalizations in these patients. Uh, and considering the complexity of this problem, we should try and evaluate each and every, whether it is every procedure, whether it is old one or a new one or whatever, or a combination. But uh, that should, in your opinion, uh, help the patient. That is the procedure which is the best procedure for these patients. Thank you very much. And this is again the invitation for the uh, uh, conference uh, uh, which is going to be held in Hyderabad in, on October 29th and 30th. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, there are, there is a time for questions. Yeah. yeah, Suresh, that was as uh, your previous uh, demonstration of video. This was also a beautiful presentation. One thing you talked about was, you know, was aqueductoplasty, an introduction of shunt tube in the aqueduct. Do you know who described this first? No, the problem is the person is sitting right in front of you. <laughs> <laughs> See, aqueduct, Which year was that? No, no, long time ago, about uh, 25 years ago. Yeah. And no, this no was the tube, in, insertion of a tube inside the aqueduct. That was the first description of a shunt tube. And also the thing that you described, that introduced the shunt in the aqueduct, bring it out in the fourth ventricle, that was also described by me. And mm. also, shunt tube in the aqueduct in the fourth ventricle and taking in the peritoneum was also described by me. Peritoneum? Yeah. yeah, yeah so from aqueduct to fourth ventricle to the peritoneum. So there are three shunts. So you please mm. refer to this, this article. When uh, okay, when I talk about the history and all that, I will certainly remember this, this thing. Is the <laughs> <laughs> what, what I showed the, the, uh, the patient with aqueductoplasty was not a shunt, it was a stent. And is. this is the stent which is commercially, was commercially available in Japan that time. In India it is still not available. So I managed to get from one of our Japanese friends and introduce See, it. But nowadays what I do is your technique. I put the uh, shunt tube uh, and then fix it with the reservoir upstairs. Okay, I don't convert it into a VP shunt because then the whole uh, whole uh, you know advantage goes away. It still remains within the ventricle. But just to fix it, I bring it out through the burr hole and put a reservoir and fix it with the reservoir <coughs> so that it remains in position. Otherwise, you know, they all slip down and they go into the foramen magnum and cisterna magna. Okay. We have, we have done a whole thesis about 30 cases of, of aqueductoplasty. Huh. But the thing is that the problem was the, during putting the aqueduct, doing the aqueductoplasty, third nerve and wall, what not, yes, what not, yes, all yes. neurological problems mm -hmm. faced by anesthetist. So we, we had a lot of problems. Yeah, yeah. we had perinots, very common <coughs> coming you in know this. What, okay. uh, Suresh, but then it gets resolved. Yeah. I will tell you another issue. Mm -hmm. See, I described this aqueductoplasty, okay? And then I did, in, I remember one very beautiful girl I did, and I still remember the ward where she was and her bed where she was, and I put the tube and the tube slipped very beautifully inside. And post-operatively, there was a bilateral visual, you know, mm -hmm. bilateral mm -hmm. eye movement disturbance. Mm -hmm. And after that, and I have mentioned this in the uh, yeah. subsequent yeah. articles, yeah. that this should not be done. And I personally, I described it, but I completely abandoned I've never done it since after I saw that beautiful girl. Correct. Catheter. So, you know, the, the ventricular catheter is too big to be introduced into the, the aqueduct. And the periaqueductal gray matter is so sensitive that you, you are actually, bound to have all these Actually, problems. Suresh, mm. there are three types of aqueduct uh, shunts are available. I have used those, Indian yes. made by yeah. 
the same person who surgery yes you see they, this is funnel like thing for aqueduct funnel like thing mm -hmm. for aqueduct i have used ah, it. So indian funnel like thing this and this you know of this uh, different different yeah. lengths mm -hmm. you from uh, lateral ventricle from uh, this uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, third ventricle you just go in and slip it in Yes. I've used it. It works very well. I have also used that funnel one, you yeah. know. But you know, the control is not good. You know, once as long as it is introducing, you are all right. Once you leave it inside, you know, that it doesn't go, doesn't go inside only. It remains in the uh, anterior part of the third ventricle. So I have not been, uh, you know, very fond of this. I one. use only in two yeah. patients. I still still use this technique, you know, well. the ventricular catheter, and fix it up. Yeah. Okay. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay guys finally i'm back and uh, lucky has told me that you complete your both the talks right now before this becomes again nasty with me you know my laptop five huh? minutes each come on man let me ask first okay, Atul okay. Goel okay. how much time to take no 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 right my dear friends so you see, this is what I was talking about, that sometimes you are stuck in a very difficult position, uh, situation. And this can be an opportunity sometimes to detect something and find out something new because you are desperate to find out something new. Or patient will have serious issues, serious problems. <laughs> now, these can be chance discoveries because they are not planned. Now, you can see the a large tumor, a huge tumor. This young man presented with headache and then convulsions. And this was the size of the tumor he came with, which we later, uh, later on found, uh, found out on the CT scan, 650 grams was the total tumor. Now we excised it. That was not a big issue to excise it. What happened later on was the problem. You see, the whole cerebral mantle was very, very thin all around the tumor, there was hardly any capacity in, its, in it to hold itself in a position. The moment we started removing the, the uh, retractor blade, it would fall and all the cerebral veins will be stressed to the point we knew that they'll break now. So we kept it there for two and a half hours and we didn't know what to do because we, did, we tried everything. We put a lot of gel foam, so the amount of gel foam consumed was so much that it became so heavy, it was not practical. We took it out. Then I read, I opened internet in the o o OT and used the glue and put a catheter and just closed the, you know, cortisectomy with the glue and filled it with saline. I thought it will work and I just put it and put more glue, but within a minute, it burst open and like a barrage, you know, <laughs> the, the whole... Uh, sail line came out and we didn't know what to do and my beautiful anesthetist as usually he says she was very nice to me usually but that day she started talking uh, shouting at me if you couldn't do it why did you remove this tumor now what we are going to do you put the tumor back my i can't put the tumor back i've removed it piecemeal no i don't know you put the tumor back why did you remove it then then you see that shouting of her gave me an idea, if not tumor, then something like a tumor. So I got the, the suddenly struck to me that I'll, I'll, I asked for a rice tube and took out a glove, the, removed the finger, this part. But it was only a very small one, hardly 200 mils or this thing saline it was holding. Then we got a gynae glove, which comes up to here. And that part we used after removing the thumb and this part, and it could hold easily 600 mills of this thing. We put it there inside. As you can see, look at the size. We inflated it and every day we removed 100 mills of air. Initially I filled it with saline, but the saline was becoming so heavy, so I filled with air and uh, to our surprise, the brain swell, it, it swelled back, you know, it was uh, back to normal size. And uh, this is, we made a small uh, round hole so that later on we can just pull it, pull the balloon out. Okay. Yeah, this is all <laughs> action. <laughs> and so we just fix the bone flap. 
and when later on we removed it, it was published in Journal of Neurosurgery in one go actually, because this was the first such report. Now, obviously it is not a routine device, it's just a rescue device. If you're stuck, if you're in a serious problem, then only you're supposed to have this device. So for youngsters, keep this in mind. You just need a condom nowadays, because you can sterilize the condom and use it so thin and very, uh, it can be inflated to any extent. I've used it 10 to 11 times only since then, since 2008. And another uh, use is when there's an intractable bleeding from the tissue tumor bed inside the fourth uh, the lateral ventricle and you are not able to control it. Just put it there instead of uh, gauze pieces and inflate it, leave it for 24 hours, next day remove it. It works extremely well. So, and I've used it, so I can safely recommend it. The few cases, for example, in this child I used it, and uh, this child had a uh, lot of problems during surgery because the brain started collapsing. So I used it here. To achieve hemostasis, as I said, I'll go a bit fast because Lucky's heart is beating up and down. Now, as I said, the condom can be used. Not the dotted one, please. Brain doesn't want any pleasures. You can use simple ones. And no, no, I'll, I'll explain you how to do that. Now, this is how. You see that they are extremely, they make extremely beautiful balloon. Now, sterilization is important. So you can, any latex thing, any latex thing, you can sterilize using 70% ethanol. Keep it there for 20 minutes. It's fully sterilized. It is authentically proven. So condoms are good entities to keep in a cupboard for emergency uses. <laughs> and this is just to tell you about innovation because the engineers are talk a lot about this. So this is a medical engineering romance. This is what I presented there. But uh, the slide was, uh, so when you want to go for research, young people, you go with some aim. You have to have, you should know what research is all about, why you want to do it, whether it will be useful or not, it is doable or not, what material you are going to use, that material has been tested or not. So there's so many things you have to understand. I, I will tell a bit fast, but what I want to say. So who, who should do it? What for it should be? Where it should be done? So these are many uh, W's which you need, you need to answer. And there are many methods of uh, design, uh, you know, for uh, uh, designing a tool. So I will not go into this. What I want to now go is that I published it. And I was so happy it is published in Journal of Neurosurgery and later on I was told you are a fool. Why did you publish it? Because it's a device. Device has a commercial value. So I published it. I was so happy and I was, you know, showing everywhere I have published it. And I got a patent also. Patent was fine, but for the short of money, lack of money, I did only national patent, not international. I got a call from uh, Dr. V.S. Mehta from, actually, uh, he, he had come from U.S. And he gave me a call from Delhi. Lokendra, your device is being converted into a, <laughs> you know, a, a set, a set of ventricular surgery. And it's being sold there. You have not international patent. So, so all young people, don't jump. If you have created a device, don't jump to publish it immediately, okay? You can publish it later on. So you first patent it internationally, borrow money, doesn't matter, from your in-laws, okay? Or would be in-laws, or could be in-laws, or should be in-laws. <laughs> yeah, anyone. And, and make it, do an international uh, this thing, okay? So this is what I wanted to tell. Uh, second of all, also I will present just now because there is. Yeah, yeah. I, I'll just complete this all. You know. Twenty. Twenty minutes. Now one more thing I want to show you, which I did present in uh, Bombay in 2019. And this will be probably first report uh, 
for the treatment. I am talking about here multi-layered Aiyo, ये क्या हुआ? Select करूँ उसको? तो गुस्सा हो गया क्या? Okay, okay. Sorry, sorry, sorry. My mistake. You see, the chronic septal hematoma is a very common problem. Everybody, but you see, it has. People do it so differently. Somebody will make one bar hole, somebody will make two bar holes, somebody will one bar hole in one mini craniotomy, some will do a craniotomy, and somebody will do just a twist deal. When so many options are available, that means nothing is perfect. That's why only so many options are there, and people are looking for probably perfect thing, and in that process they do differently. Now my uh, attention here is multi-layered. Chronic septal hematoma, not the routine ones, where there are three layers, four layers, you know, more than two layers, and they are very difficult because to treat because the recurrence rate is extremely high. And in one study, the multi-layered hematomas made some 13.4 percent. Is it okay? 13.4 percent were uh, multi-layered chronic septal hematoma, and they are very nasty to treat. Easy to do. But results are probably not that good. So, as I said, most common neurosurgical condition. It's king of controversies. One of the kings of controversies. The annual incidence is uh, one to 5.3 per uh, hundred thousand, and it is increasing now. As the more more age is increasing and aging population is increasing, the more and more uh, these cases are coming. And surgical techniques are simple, but recurrence remain one of the main problems here. Okay, and multi-layered, as I said, the chronic septal hematoma multi-layered are 13.6 percent. I will uh, really skip all these uh, slides. We all know about these. Now, radiology is extremely important. If you find uh, on a CT scan some different densities of blood, uh, please do a contrast study or do an MRI because those will show you very nicely the membranes. So that this that was the important thing which I told. So I I think I will really try to make it short. We all know about the development of uh, chronic septal hematoma stages: early, later, young hematomas, and older hematomas. In very old, the walls can be calcified. Expansion is by rebleeds. Exudates, CSF and entrapment. These are the mechanisms of expansion. Now this is surgery. Multiple surgical techniques are invoked that itself suggests the inadequacy of any single method. Anesthesia may be local, local with conscious sedation, may be full GA. Head position after surgery is uh, 30 degrees versus flat. So there are so many controversies in this. It is an ex uh, and uh, first of all the subdural evacuating port system many people are using, which is an extradural device. Then many people are doing just drainage by a single bore hole, double bore hole, as I said. Normally people will make bore hole two, and from one they will you know irrigate so the. Yields can come from different side, other side till it becomes clear. But it doesn't work all the way, uh, all the time in multi-layered ones. Endoscopic again, many people are endo endoscope enthusiasts are trying to treat it with endoscope. Really doesn't work that way. So recurrence is five to thirty-three percent, which is significant recurrence. Now this is the main thing. Lucky is trying to do like this. Uh, we make an appropriate size craniotomy. I'll tell you, in multi-layered, we make an appropriate size craniotomy. We cut open each subdural membrane separately along the dural opening. With you know, between all these membranes, we clear them. We take out all the exudates and wash them thoroughly. 
then we put the fibular surgery cell nowadays which is available and then we tuck all these subdural membranes with the dura and after that we close it and we fix the uh, bone flap now you see there is a uh, this uh, oxidized uh, cellulose regenerated cellulose which is fibular it has been shown to improve the wound healing of chronic wounds and it has been shown to really you know increase the healing process and it really removes all the negative factors which are there uh, for neovascularization and fragility of the vessels and this is how it has been shown in uh, studies we used it inadvertently without knowing but later on we found out my uh, colleague karthik found out from the uh, literature that it is extremely helpful so why we want to do this because we anticipate that by tucking the membranes all the membrane with, with liga clip with the dura we are closing the space so space is not there the pressure is taken care of and the fibrillar will take care of the all negative factors which are going for the recurrence which are which will help the recurrence so this is how these two things work so as you can see here in this particular uh, film uh, this thing there are four actually four membranes are there just to show one clip our recurrence rate is zero after this we have done around 32 cases but we have uh, all the material available only for 23 so that's why we have sent this for publication because this is the world's first report like this and recurrence rate is zero otherwise earlier we were facing problems so now this is between different membranes after giving a thorough wash and removing all the hemat uh, blood products we place surgery cell and tuck all the layers with the dura then close the dura and put the bone flap so somebody may feel that it is too much of a job but uh, it is helpful okay guys thank you very much thank you thank you lokin how long follow up is the first i did i think some 6 years ago first case Six years ago. No, but there are some new things are coming. One, you know, the people give anti-fibrinolytics, you know, epsilon amino caproic acid, and they uh, for this old days, this chronic subdural you evacuate, and next can you take it is more after one week still. So this drug is a wonder drug. The middle meningeal embolization also. Middle meningeal artery embolization. embolization. These two things I have. Yeah, but uh, this. I don't. Middle meningeal artery embolization has been yeah. for yeah, quite some course. time not very successful. This fibrillar thing works exactly the way anti-fibrinolytic. Yes. Yeah, it does actually. It has lot many mechanisms of action. Yeah. So uh, because for the paucity of time, I didn't tell all this. Sorry, sorry, Lokan. No, it's okay. We have to cut you short because you are a friend. So two uh, o'clock, we will break for lunch, and this is last talk before lunch, and then we'll come back for the last session. डुप्लीकेट साइज कर A good afternoon, everyone. After the big guns firing, I think it is going to be a lull. But anyways, uh, 
Thank you, Dr. Alan Tripathi, sir, Dr. Harshan, and Dr. Surand Basu for inviting me, and my humble teachers, Professor Rishna and Professor Goyal. Uh, this is my uh, hundred consecutive cases of vestibular shawarma in the last six years, operating in the Institute of Neuroscience. I am here in Calcutta for the last eight years after completing my training from Sri Chitra and uh, Professor Suresh Nair, and uh, that's a tribute to him. So, like, uh, let me start with a very unpleasant uh, scan. You know, these are this, uh, as uh, Professor Suresh Nair has men mentioned in one of the articles that uh, we have moved from finger nucleation to internal decompression to capsule uh, dissection. Still, we is, tend to have this kind of uh, uh, outcome. So, and uh, is. Uh, and according to Professor, uh, Professor uh, Goel, this is not an intact patient. We need to give back the patient the life. This is not an intact patient. But there, out here, there is a catch. The first patient is not mine. This was operated outside, came with uh, grade five to grade six housemen, and I had to do the research. The second was mine. But later on, I'm telling you, she, she has improved. She is grade four year, Hausberg Brackman grade four. The uh, other man is grade three, and uh, later on he has come. Uh, he has come intact because if you see the primary uh, facial expression is normal. Now what we aim uh, is to give an intact uh, facial symmetrical uh, symmetry to the patient, and this was a very uh, uh, lady, very demanding lady. Very educated. She was a teacher. She knew everything about it. She had read in the internet, and she said, "Please, doctor sir, please give me my face back. Otherwise, I'll be depressed. I might not survive." So uh, there's so, a tremendous pressure as a surgeon when you have to operate in such a high profile patients. And this is what I gave her. And uh, to a young girl, th this is the most beautiful gift that as a doctor we can give. Like she can start a family later on without any depression. And uh, she went intact home. And for a young man, it, the, this, to give back the confidence and to run his family is very important. So, so this, uh, this talk will be mostly on the preservation of the seventh now because on a, in a vestibular shawarma, we have moved away from so many comorbidities like mortality. And all. I think we have become more safer. And right now, what remains is seventh nerve and the eighth nerve. Eighth nerve, I don't know how to preserve, but seventh nerve, I'll be, I'll, I'll, okay, I'll be sharing my experience in the last hundred cases. So to start with my uh, presentation, uh, this is uh, this uh, angle, cerebral frontal angle, was nicely described as the uh, very bloody angle. Uh, he compared, uh, Harvey Kusin uh, compared this to a battlefield called Gettysburg in which there was so much mortality and bloodshed. Uh, so the initial days of this, uh, operation in the CP angle was equivalent to those blood, um, uh, bloody, I mean, uh, battle. It is the most common uh, tumor in the CP angle, which comprises 85 to 90% of C uh, vestibular shawarmas are 6% of the total intracranial tumors. They have this uh, incidence in 4th to 6th decade, but now uh, because of the imaging we have, we find in younger patient group, Female preponderance is yes, 95% are sporadic and 5% with uh, neurofibromatosis is one, two. They grow at an average of less than two mm per year. Uh, they grow at the uh, transition zone of the peripheral and the central myelin, which is mostly located in this area. This is the internal auditory canal. It could be either two centimeters, two or a few millimeters here and there, but mostly the tumor arises from this area and goes to the systemic segment and later on compresses the brain stem. Major, uh, uh, it's caused due to mutations in the tumor suppressor gene, Merlin, which is located in the chromosome 22. To, uh, for a tumor to arise, both the alleles of the chromosome have to be mutated. Whereas in a case of uh, a syndromic case, one uh, gene is already muted. So they are very prone for developing these tumors. So this is a, this is a basic thing in, in which the present I mean, the patients come with us. But in a practical purpose, uh, I hardly I mean, uh, there are very few, few patients who complain of hearing loss initially. They complain of mostly uh, w headache or walking difficulty. This is more, more of an uh, academic purpose. I follow the Coos uh, gradings, very simple according to the uh, size of the tumor and the location. And uh, mostly we, what we operate these days is the grade 3 and the grade 4 of the Coos classification. And MRI remains the standard of investigation. CT scan in a patient with pacemaker, I had to operate in one pa such patient. Others were all MRI based. Audiometry, yes. Fundus exam examinations for the uh, mostly they are papillodema. There is a papillodema for monitoring of these patients. CT scan, as Professor Shreshner always told us, please look at the high uh, writing jugular well and also to look at the air cells. So this is my standard uh, uh, incision retromastoid workhorse. I haven't operated in any other approaches because I was not taught by him. <laughs> so this is what I've been using for, for the last uh, 100 cases. My positioning, very similar to Chitra. Uh, the mastoid, 
uh, the base is very uh, is parallel to the floor uh, floor of the OT, and with the, so the, the rotation is mostly 30 degree. I always do a crane to be put back the bone flap and fix it. My aim is to uh, remove the tumor near totally. Total is not possible. If you go aim for total, then you're going to damage the patient, the seventh nerve, and uh, you'll not give back that uh, intact patient. So our uh, aim is to, uh, near total. What does this say is, in an MRI, the residue should be less than 2 mm in, at the sleeve of the seventh nerve or in the internal artery canal, or it should be less than 25 millimeter squared. But okay, this all will depend on ele electrophysiological monitoring as I'm going to describe. This is very relative. My 100 cases, uh, tumors of more than uh, 2.8 centimeter or up to 5 centimeter in gra grade, they were mostly, uh, I mean, they were, except for one patient, they all were grade three and four of course classification, female mostly. They presented mostly with hearing and raised ICV with ataxia. Few patients with seventh nerve, five patients. Uh, three with low cranial involvement and fifth, 30th had some sensory fifth nerve component. Audiometry, we didn't have this facility, so only 20 patients underwent audiometry. I operated two patients after radio, uh, stereotactic radiation surgery and five cases radio surgery, which was referred from outside. So this, uh, so this scan, uh, this picture I've taken from one of your presentation, I still believe in this. I, uh, I still believe there's, there's a uh, double fold of arachnoid when you start, uh, start dissecting the tumor. Gradually, once you start... Um, Dissect, I mean, uh, okay, ref uh, reflecting the uh, arachnoid outside, the maximum of the tumor, you can make it extra arachnoid. But again, at the end, when the tumor is at, uh, where the tumor is attached to the eighth nerve and the seventh nerve, there is no arachnoid plane, and there you have to be careful. The rest of the tumor, if you do properly, can be made extra arachnoid. I pr follow this principle. So this was my first patient in 2016, came from UP. Uh, I operated this patient for, the, for eight hours, total eight hours, and uh, I didn't know what to calculate and what to cut. Each vessel looked so important to me, especially the veins, and uh, luckily I gave him, uh, a very in, uh, gave him back um, his uh, symmetry, and this was the uh, MRI two years later, and there's a small component, if you see, over the internal canal, and over the sleeve of the seventh nerve. So this is intentionally left, because from the day one, I've started using electrophysiological monitoring. See, this is a uh, uh, monitoring device, and as a vestibular surgeon, okay, this video is not playing, but what I want to say is as a vestibular surgeon, we'd like to hear that noise, you know, that I think this, in this, yeah. So this is the noise. Uh, this is the sound we'd like to hear. This is the stimulation of the seventh nerve, and but this is one of the easier cases in which you could see the fibers of the seventh nerve and uh, became very easy. But then uh, there are again some other okay. difficult cases in which. These are the fibers. Okay. So, like, uh, see, this is how we uh, localize this uh, seventh nerve. I always try to, uh, uh, I always use this uh, neuromonitoring I mean, probe for dissection, blunt dissection, as well as sharp dissection, and localize, try to localize it at the external audit meters and as, at the REZ. If you have these two points, then gradually, gradually with your, this probe, you can uh, draw the dots and you can save the nerve. So, this has been, uh, this is what I've been doing. And just a small video just to show how we do it. Typically, like dissecting the arachnoid plane, the double uh, layer of the arachnoid, sharp dissection, then again after that followed by blunt, blunt dissection. The idea is to make the tumor extra arachnoid as much as possible. Thereafter, internal decompression must quick, quickly do an internal decompression. These are the low cranial nerves, sharp dissection, and uh, push, it, uh, push it aside. Thereafter, use the probe. I always use the probe to uh, see, uh, uh, 
to, for the reflection of the seventh nerve, it could be anywhere in the book. In the books, mostly, maximum of the cases are in the anterior inferior and the anterior superior uh, position at the external auditory meters. But then I have found even posteriorly. So I always use the probe everywhere, everywhere, uh, to just to see I'm safe. There, and this is finally, I mean, these are the fibers of the seventh nerve. And I'm using this probe again to see where the seventh nerve is. So these are the fibers it's going towards the tumor capsule. After a certain time, in a big uh, tumor, what we, are, what we have found is, uh, is the tumor, uh, seventh nerve is very thin. It's, it's almost merged with the capsule. There, that's, uh, there we have to be careful. It's uh, like if uh, there's a 1 mm of uh, seventh nerve in the REZ where you have uh, initially located, when it goes up to the, it goes towards the capsule at the systemal segment, it becomes almost one centimeter. It, the finding starts in a very broad segment. Then you, that's where you have to be careful. See, uh, this continuation of that video, uh, sharp dissection, uh, uh, dissecting the tumor out of the, uh, away from the brain stem with the help of uh, micro scissors as well as suction. By now I know where my seventh nerve is, so this, my seventh nerve is somewhere there. Again my probe to look, at for, look for the re reflection of the seventh nerve. See that there's no sound in this, but see that was the seventh nerve. I can see it. After a certain time you start visualizing the seventh nerve. You're not going to miss it at all. So gradually dissecting it away. See again the proof. The seventh nerve lies here. This is the origin of the tumor from the eighth nerve. I'm dissecting everywhere. Sometimes the, the seventh nerve can come all the way here and uh, come posteriorly also. So then you have to be careful. Debulk the tumor after you're certain that uh, the seventh nerve is not there. That will make your life easy. Gradually, gradually you progress. In fact, I use the QSA in between, but when it comes near the seventh nerve, then I very careful. I, I'm careful about using QSA. So finally, what we have is uh, see this is the brainstem. This is the seventh nerve coming from the REZ out here. This is the origin of the eighth nerve. This is the systemal segment of the tumor. And the whole thing uh, gradually, gradually under uh, neuro monitoring, I'm doing a soft dissection and uh, removing tumor as much as possible. This will continue. And later on, I drill the IM with uh, Q sub, bone QS. I don't use the diamond drill. And uh, I prefer to, and if the uh, uh, MEP uh, starts, uh, like if it's uh, like uh, less than 0 0.1, then I stop there. So this was the lady I operated, and a uh, very beautiful lady. And I gave uh, back her intact face with uh, near total uh, tumor removal that was done two years back. She has come back without any deficit now. Again, another lady, when, whenever we are operating on a, a young lady, there's always that extra uh, stress you know, to give back that uh, symmetry in the face. So, but unfortunately, if you, if you try a little hard to remove more tumor, you have some grade two, grade three of a deficit. But later on, they have, uh, at six, uh, at three months of uh, follow-up, they come with the intact thing. The idea is to, leave the nerve anatomically as well as electrophysiologically intact. So this is another case after uh, a year of uh, follow-up, there's all hardly any tumor left. Small over the sleep could be there, but a hardly tumor left and she's uh, intact. Another year, 21 year old girl, I'm mentioning ladies because this is very important right now. So uh, th this is the post-op scan, no tumor left. She's, uh, there's no any deficit in this patient. She'll be planned for, this is recently done. Even on old ladies, I'm very aggressive. Uh, provided my electrophysiological monitoring pro permits me, parameters permits me, there is no deficit. Uh, th this, uh, this is the lady with a very poor brainstem uh, plane. Operated, no, uh, at six months there is no deficit uh, residue left, the patient is intact. Another lady, I am again pressing on ladies because this gives me more pressure while operating, no def deficit. Yes, at, uh, at, oh, at, at, all, at a year now, I have, I have a deficit out here. This was intentionally left because the, para the parameters did not permit me to go further. And I've sent this to my dear friend Manjul Tripathi and uh, he was going to irradiate it. See another male, 
In mail, I try to push harder in removing almost all of the tumor, even drilling the internal auditory canal. Uh, and sometimes I get my uh, results, sometimes not. And this is the result two years later, hardly any tumor left. He'll live a normal life. This is the patient, that's why I'm telling you, I'm pushing a little hard and there's a deficit. Now, where to, where to stop is very important later. I mean, that's how you get, uh, do get from experience. But then you should not push hard. You know, if you just, just takes just few seconds to spoil the whole surgery of four to five hours. Now, the patient, if you, ha if you are confident, the patient, uh, of, uh, if you have left the nerve anatomically as well as electrophysiologically intact, I'm telling you, at follow-up, you will have a very symmetrical face in this patient. Do not worry in this patient, uh, in such thing. Again, lady completely removed. Even in old ladies, now if you see at, this is a one year follow up, a small sleep over the seventh nerve, but the patient is intact. This lady had come with a Bell's palsy and with incidental vestibular shawarma. They came from Mizoram, uh, from Shillong, but they wanted surgery. I operated in this patient, and, and when I intraoperative, the, uh, the signature of seventh nerve was coming at only of MAP of le more than 0 0.1 ampere. But it was anatomically preserved. At three years of follow-up, she is symmetrical, but though she came with serongomel. So uh, sometimes you are lucky. You can have, uh, that was uh, the previous uh, tumor's uh, dis dissection was extracapsular. Sometimes you can have this uh, intracapsular kind of dissection if the tumor consistency permits. This was a soft tumor. And this is the probe. This is the capsule. The seventh nerves are running through, uh, through this into the internal artery canal. And the tumor is very soft. So I took the chance of doing an intracapsular uh, uh, decompression in this patient. See? But again, there's this traction. You're pulling the seventh row. It's a little dangerous. But then, uh, gradually, with sharp, blunt, and QSA, you, you, you should be able to decompress it near totally. Again, the probe, uh, the uh, probe from dissection, because then that will just alert me where the seventh nerve is. Uh, another, see, this is, uh, this is the uh, case which gave me instant uh, fame, I mean, two years back, not by anyone, but by my friend Manjul Tripathi. This was a lady, a very, very young lady, executive, working in a very high... Like so just, okay, last, this, yes, yeah, yes. Sir. Please. And big tumor, um, big tumor, she had severe low clinical involvement with uh, cerebral attacks here. And, but if you see the ex external or internal artery canal is expanded out here as well as the jugular foramen is, there's a full of, uh, there's tumor full uh, going over this. And if you look at the coronal section, the both the internal artery canal and the jugular foramen expanded. Now, I'm confused whether, what is the primary source of tumor in this? Uh, maybe both, I don't know in this. So this was a lady, post-op symmetrical face, uh, but she, uh, she, she stayed with us for three weeks with uh, tracheostomy, recovered fully. At six months, there was a tumor residue over the internal okay, uh, jugular foramen as in the th thin rim over the uh, medulla. Central radiation by um, uh, Manjul Tripathi has irradiated at three years later and one year post gamma knife. We have this uh, picture. She is uh, intact otherwise. Residue tumor with fibrous over the jugular foramen and a small tumor over the uh, brain stem. See, the, where we were then and where we are now. So these are the results of doing this. Work. So like uh, in... Due to shortage of time, I can go on actually. Uh, should I stop here, sir? Yeah, I Thanks. think so. <coughs> sir, actually, I had uh, this uh, seventh nerve was preserved in all, my, uh, in all cases, anatomically and physiologically. Uh, house breakman grading, seventh nerve, immediate post op, uh, maximum was from one to th three grade, and these recover. If it's less than three, if it's two, four, five, and six, then again, you're in trouble. Immediate post-op, I had 61.6% of good facial preservation, and at, at the end of one year, it was 92.8%. CSF diversion pre-op six, post-op four. Mortality, I had one. Uh, on the third post-op, she had uncoated bleeding, and there was a tumor in the uh, tumor bed. Maybe I had left some tumor, and she succumbed after 30 days of uh, uh, sepsis. My facial pr uh, preservation is similar to meta-analysis meta published so far. So take home messages need to constantly visualize the thinned out flimsy whitey grish fibers of 7th cranial nerve at the REZ and trace it distally. Look for displacement of, uh, displacement of 7th fibers in IM, anterior inferior anterior superior and try tracing the entire pathway. Preserve big veins over the brainstem. Rest uh, tumor veins and can be sacrificed. Always use neurophysiological monitoring. So th these are my uh, teachers, the gurus, I mean, who have uh, taught me so much. Uh, again, I boast, I mean, I flaunt this picture everywhere. It's a continuous learning process. Uh, recently, I mean, few, five years back, the Japanese were there, learned a few techniques, more techniques from there. Here and there, we keep on learning as a surgeon. We should 
Professor Virgo Dolling was here again, uh, some few more techniques from here and there. So at the end, we aspire to see happy, symmetrical smiles in our vestibular patients. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. I think uh, question, no, no questions? One comment from... Uh, okay, just comment. Congratulations, uh, Deependra. You have surpassed your teachers. Uh, what a wonderful series you have. Uh, under patients with one mortality. And the only thing that uh, case which you showed at Rakhiyosipi, that was the Jugula Puranam Paranam. Unless patient is NF2. They can have lesions both, uh, both together. They can have a vestibular Puranam and a Jugula Puranam. But that looked to uh, me like it was a Jugula Puranam very nice. Congratulations again. Eh? Please continue. Thank Thanks you. Thanks for good work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dipin. That was wonderful. Uh, please don't go away yet. I haven't announced lunch yet. Please stay, stay back. The things will not open unless I say. Anyway, just joking. <coughs> so, I have the privilege of felicitating our faculty in this session, I request Dr. Jay and my colleague to please come over. So uh, first is uh, our moderator, Professor Kevi Bhattachar, Kalanda. <coughs> okay, so we'll, we'll felicitate him with his talk, which is uh, in the last. So what I will do is, I will suggest we will break for lunch now and then come back and finish the session. Very interesting talks are there post-lunch. So I want to see more people post-lunch uh, uh, than, than the other way around. So, uh, Dr. Lokendra Singh, please. Yeah. <clears throat> so, Lokendra, you want to leave? So, uh. thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. So. I have left a message for the ladies to come for closer ceremony, but let us see. Otherwise, uh, the uh, bitter herbs we have to carry for the better herbs. Okay, next is uh, Dipen. Please come over. Well deserved. Congratulations to you. You've done very good job. Excellent, excellent work. God bless you. Yeah, we're very proud of you. So, uh, the memento we'll give later. Okay, we'll send you later. Thank you very much. You've given already. Oops, sorry, thank you. So, and then, of course, um, uh, I think that's it for the session. We'll come back again. Thank you, Hars. So, let's break for lunch. I request faculty to go down to 619 uh, for lunch, and then our delegates to please have your lunch here, and then we'll come back uh, in 15 minutes, not more than 15 minutes, please. Uh, be, have a quick lunch, and then we'll have very interesting talks on various interesting aspects of neurosurgery. Thank you very much for this session.
recorded live. Uh, so, uh, may I invite Dr. Siddharth Ghosh to give his talk, lecture on surgery of large and giant vestibular schwannoma, how his philosophy has changed over the years. Ghosh, please. Ghosh, yeah, good Dr. afternoon. Uh, again, I thank uh, Dr. Lakshmi Tripathi for, uh, for inviting me for this talk. Uh, as I know, we uh, just now we uh, saw one beautiful presentation uh, here. Uh, it was very nice, actually, for a young neurosurgeons doing 100 cases and with good results. Uh, thank you. Thank, thank you for that. And I also was uh, very, very aggressive, as uh, my colleagues know, and, uh, and always used to believe in total excision of, the, of uh, vestibular schwannoma and, for that matter, most of the tumors. But why this topic is more of a philosophical topic it's not really a surgical topic to see how over, the, over a period of years, a senior neurosurgeons like us changes their philosophy a little bit. As uh, yesterday, as Professor Atul Goel, again my very close friend, uh, was operating on a patient and you know, he left some amount of tumor behind. And there are so many factors behind that. Previously, he was in <coughs> you know, KEM, and now he was telling that it's in a private setup, Lilabati Hospital, so you have to be very more, much more judicious. That's very, very important. And we all work in private hospitals, and for us, it's very difficult for a patient to accept a facial uh, palsy or facial paresis, for that matter, if uh, you know, it develops. And we can never say that patients, you know, that when you even leave, leave the anat uh, clear, do the anatomical preservation, Sometimes they don't recover, sometimes they don't. That's what. So as you know, by definitions, where giant vestibular schwannoma we call when it is more than 4 to 4 point, 4 to 4.9 and in group A and group B is more than 5 centimeter. And my talk will be based on that only. So uh, what does Professor Majid Sami say? He says that there are a challenge of cranial nerve deficits and uh, morbidity and mortality are significantly more in these tumors. In my first 25 years, I've always tried a radical excisions in these, but of late, I have a bit judicious in managing these selected cases. So from 1989 to 2014, after 610 cases, I have also become more prudent, thinking that, is there any point of giving the patient a facial nerve deficit by doing a total excision, even if, it, if I could, keep the anatomical integrity of the facial nerve. If not, then it's a, is it not a deliberate subtotal or near total excision give the patient a bit better neurological overall outcome in the present era of radio surgery? So this is exactly what I thought after my 25 years of experience. So in, from, from 2015 till that, I have operated in 93 cases out of, out of which 62 were either large or giant vestibular schwannoma. In 50 cases, anatomical preservation of facial nerve could be achieved, but 50% of them had grade 2 to grade 4 facial nerve deficit. In remaining 50, it was grade 1. In these 12 cases, though I could have surgically, uh, though I could not have sur regular follow-up after a couple of years, where some of them recovered or some not. Needless to say, some younger patients definitely had significant depression, which makes any surgeon sad when they come and meet you in their subsequent follow-up. So in remaining 12 cases, either I did sub uh, sub subtotal or near total resections, and there was no facial nerve palsy, and they were either followed up or given radio surgery. And this is what, again, Professor Sami said, the focus in vestibular schwannoma surgery has long been shifted from a life-saving operation to that of functional and cosmetic recovery. This is after, after his thousand cases. So he said complete resection was possible in 97.9% and deliberate subtotal resection was done in 2.1% cases. So there are so many factors, we all know about the which uh, favors facial nerve preservation. Amongst all, the surgeon's experience, including the volume of cases, is the single most important 
criteria in favor of facial nerve preservation. So this is again the... So controversy regarding the facial nerve preservation, a learning curve was seen again in Sami's group with an initial preservation rate was 28% which improved to 50% later. As you see, this patient, the rectasia and ag agony. So this patient, uh, the young girl is very happy. The other one is obviously not happy because he has got a facial nerve palsy. So there are a lot of surgical strategies and the lesson learned. So preoperative identification of the facial nerve can be done with the help of, you know, high density DTI. And even with 1.5 Tesla, we can do it. And three Tesla is very good. It's, uh, it's very easy to delineate the facial now preoperatively and intraoperatively, as my previous speaker said, it's very important to have a nerve integrity monitor. And I also use nerve integrity monitor for all cases. This is the facial nub, as you can see, the fa uh, facial nub DTI here. And so how do you nerve integrity monitor source? Uh, when you go to the high tumor volume, uh, no, you can give up to uh, start with a five milliampere, and as you go down near the tumor capsule, you give 0.1 milliampere. So all this can trace your facial nerve where it is, and there you can do a, a very a much radical excisions with the help of nerve integrity monitor. So here you can see one case where the nerve has been beautifully preserved, uh, uh, and this is another case where. You know, this is called hybrid surgery nowadays. And, you know, there is a talk uh, from Switzerland, uh, you know, all Roy Daniel, our, our colleague in, from CMC Velour, who is in Switzerland now. They do a hybrid surgery. We don't do it yet, but I'm sure soon it will come. They pre-operatively pre itself, they, uh, they decide that they will do a subtotal section and they have the volume and intraoperatively they give radiation. So this is again uh, navigation. You can ex exactly delineate where you are during the surgery. So the treatment protocol for, you know, uh, for small tumors are very well, well established. Total ex excision and preserving facial nerve functions in many cases, auditory function as well. And radio surgery <laughs> as primary modalities are also being done. And the treatment pr protocol management strategies for the large and ve giant vestibular swanomas are still not well established. Because as I said, not many of us, the skill of Professor Sami, Yasser Gil, El Mepti, Laligram Shekhar, and here between us sitting, Professor Gwell, and also, uh, uh, and also Suresh Naya has been sitting there. He has got an enormous volume, both of them have got much, much, much more larger volume than me because they were in teaching institution. So uh, it's very important to counsel the patient before surgery. However, decision is taken in trap depending on the feasibility of resection after three-fourth of the tumor has been excised. Will you do a total excision preserving facial or will you do a near total or subtotal excision? So total excision technically possible but you have to understand that it is not only the anatomical preservation. Many a time the, fa the facial nerve function does not come back because of the vascular compromise. So in 45% had some reduction in facial nerve function after you know, total excision out of which this is again Sami's group, Matthias and Sami and you see that grade two was 13%, grade three, 15%, grade four, four to 6%, six percent and five and all, 11% and more. So these are the most important thing. As my previous speaker was in young age, and he, see, he has given, no, most of them are females. So it's more in case of unmarried females, because you know, if you leave a facial nerve deficit, they will never get married. Of course, elderly patient more than 70 years, again, you have to be judicious. Uh, and of course, the high risk patient. But the decision comes when it's a middle-aged patient where you where the long life expectancy, you always would try to give a total, a total excisions. But of course, you have to 
always think about whether you would also keep do, do a near total or a subtotal exit chain and give them uh, uh, radio surgery later on. So let me review the literature. For lack of time, I won't go through all the literature, but all the literature is in favor of radio surgery now. And most of the literature coming up now that you do a you know, near total or subtotal dissection and either you follow up and, or later on subject to subject them to gamma knife or cyber knife therapy. We have cyber knife in our facilities. So now let us see what happens in radio surgery. The post radio, radio surgery, 32% regression, then 15, 59% remain same and only 9% progress. Post radio surgery and surgery result. Post radio surgery, 93.9%. Anatomical uh, with anatomical preservation, where in surgery with anatomical preservation, 86.7 percent, and further to 61.5 percent is patients with prior surgery and radiotherapy. So most S modern SRS tumor control rate uh, are of 95 percent, uh, with a bit serviceable hearing preserve preserved in 44 to 59 percent cases. So here you see a nice case which you know, we, I gave, it's a very small tumor, COOS 2, and you had a pre-CK March, it was two, you know, in two, two, 2020, this was the size of the tumor, and we, know, we all know that there is a pseudo progression, you see after three months there is a pseudo progression, and after seven months it was even more, and there was a tumor necrosis, but see what happens after 26 months, tumor definitely is shrunk. So, but always a word of caution should be there because you see this article, the patients with STR have 11-fold risk of recurrence. That's very, very important. So you cannot just follow them up. You have to subject them to some form of adjuvant therapy, mostly radio surgery. You see this gentleman, it was in 2017, patients came to me, I had operated him, and it was uh, no, only a small bait patient did not have any, uh, any seventh nerve deficit that time. This time he came just, just about two weeks ago and I removed and it, was, it became very fibrous and the tumor removed except a small part because it was so fibrous I couldn't delineate. He has a deficit though the facial nerve was preserved, I'm sure he would recover. Now why did this patient recur? We did the histopathology and we found that KI67 index was 2.5%. So that is an important, you know, uh, determinator to see whether these patients can recur or not. So again with this, I will skip all this. So all these are favor of planned, surgery, uh, radi planned surgical excisions and you can plan for either subtotal or near total resection and then radio surgery. You see this patient's uh, young girl, obviously it was operated, and this patient did not have this long back, my about more than 10 years ago, patients did not have any, any uh, seventh nerve deficit. But again, this was anatomically preserved facial nerve, but he, she was lucky, she didn't have any deficit. It was one of my earlier days, more than 15 years ago. Now this patient was operated elsewhere and came with a seventh nerve palsy, I had operated, but his seventh knob did not recover. Again, this girl operated many years ago. She is, she is okay, she's got married with the children and doing well. This girl came from Lucknow. This patient also had operated, but this is again a very young girl, very good looking girl. I left a small amount of tumor because it's very, very unmarried girl. So I had to take a judicious de decision of leaving a small tumor and she's doing very well. And recently I have given her a, a, a cyber knife therapy. This is again a middle-aged lady and it was very fibrous and firm, I, so I left this is a subtotal resections. I have given her radio surgery and she is doing well. This is another young girl, again small tumor and, give, uh, and this I am following, her, following it up and she is doing well. Is that any conclude? Okay, okay, I will give. So, uh, our time is up. Okay.
How uh, uh, full time up? Yeah, or yeah, I just finishing. You can conclude. No, I just want to show that my video is not here. Sorry, the video is not here. Can I show the video for one minute? Okay, if it is coming, uh, playing. Uh, it should come. Why is not coming? Video. Uh, okay, okay. I'll just show the last part. Half a minute. So I have already done a, a drilling here. I always do the drilling. I, I mean, I couldn't show it because of the lack of time. And this is the tumor. I just want to show the, the I, I already traced the face. This is the Petrus drilling has been done. And the tumor. So here also the audio is not there. It is actually now integrity monitor. And I, as my previous speaker, so I also use. And this can be used very nicely for dissecting the tumor. And it always tells us there's a facial nerve here coming out from the uh, internal acoustic matters. So uh, this is a dissector, but in between you can use the nerve integrity monitor. And QSA is always very, very useful for this type of cases because uh, and you can see this here. So as it becomes you debulk the tumor, use the nerve integrity monitor, and you can see. You can gradually reduce the ampl amplitude. We have a neurophysiologist, and we tell her and tell him, and then he reduces it, and then we do it. So this again, you are just taking out the last bit of the tumor from there. They wanted to show the patient. Okay, I'll conclude it. So anyway, uh, conclusion is nothing much. All of you know the capacity of smile, and here is the current focus of therapy, as saving life becomes easier with multiple patient-centric and tailored resection. Thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you very much, uh, Siddharth. It was an excellent uh, presentation and. Uh, one uh, one small comment from him is pre-operatively like what that Switzerland people do. One should not plan a subtotal resection. Yeah, yeah. I also fully agree yeah. that I don't do that yeah, also. Yeah, because, you know, Definitely. Then you get biased. biased. Mm -hmm. And you can remove it like uh, mm -hmm. the event showed with proper monitoring. And if the going is good, you can take it out. It's giving very good uh, facial uh, yeah, uh, yeah. function. But always, you know, if it is not uh, coming out, you can uh, make a decision. Yeah, definitely. I also don't agree with yeah. that. Okay. I just told because of the people yeah. knowledge. Thank you. Thank you. I think we go to the next. Next next presentation is by uh, who, is, who has to cast the fly? Uh, so, Malay or it is uh, Dwaraga? Who has to come next? Malay. Uh, Malay. Oh, okay, okay, because you know, he has to cast a fly. Okay. No, if we, they, uh, those who want to present should provide the boarding pass now. Estonia, 15 minutes, yeah.
seen late at the end of the tunnel. <laughs> late we seen. Sir asked me today, Dwarka, do you do this? So actually, this was actually my first, uh, we started off in 2007, the Movement Disorder Program. And uh, somehow this is one thing which has always stuck with me for the last 15 years. And uh, we have done almost 250 cases of various surgeries uh, in Parkinson's, dystonia, now in uh, OCD and Tourette's and all that. So that was just share my, and this is a very important field which generally doesn't get discussed in neurosurgical conferences. But it's a very uh, neurosurgical thing. It's even though, I mean, when we were uh, students, we used to call it deep boring surgery. <laughs> but it's a very technical surgery. And, uh, and the thing is, the post-op, you need a lot of uh, care. I mean, most of the other surgeries, once the patient is off the recovery period, they do well. But in dystonias and uh, Parkinson's, you have to... Why is it not moving? Huh. Okay. So uh, just a brief history. I mean, uh, even though it was first used, 90, uh, Benabit started deep, deep brain stimulation. 96 was the first patient who underwent uh, GPI DBS. And in 2003, the FDA gave the humanitarian exemption. So it's a very recent surgery compared to the others. And uh, dystonia is defined as a movement disorder characterized by sustained or intermittent muscle contractions causing abnormal, often repetitive movements postures are both. And uh, uh, there are two mine, one is pa pediatric and one is dystonia, uh, one is adult dystonia. So uh, yeah, dystonia has been classified basically on either the axis, which is the clinical characteristics. You could either do it on based on age or body distribution, temporal pattern or coexisting other movement disorders, or with other ma neurological manifestations such as Wilson's. And also you have the uh, axis two, in which has been divided into inherited types like the DYT1 positives, the Wilson's, Leshnihan syndromes, and acquired or secondary dystonias due to either encephalitis or any other infections. And a specific type of uh, dystonia which is known as a tardive. And there have been some idiopathic cases. Uh, yeah. So uh, for dystonia management, there are basically two main scales. One is the Burke farn marston scale and the other is the Twister scale from the Toronto Western Spasmodic Torticollis Rating Scale. Medical though remains the first line of management, it includes anticholinergics and botulinum. And botulinum in fact is the mainstay of treatment for uh, dystonias. Uh, so, yeah. So what is the target we use? The target is generally we use what we call the GPI, the posterior lateral GPI, posterior ventral GPI. Uh, which is located in the uh, globus pallidus nucleus. First there is the pa pallidum, pallidus externa and then there is the pallidus interna. Pallidus interna itself is divided into two parts, the posteroventral part and the anteromedial part. The posteroventral is used as the target and the anatomical fe features targeting are all based on the optic nerve along with the direct vision. Uh, in the recent times, subthalamic nucleus has been uh, coming up as a target but generally the GPI is posterior ventral GPI is the target of choice. So then uh, if you are able to use the MER because in most cases of pediatric dystonia or generalist dystonia it's very difficult to use the MER. MER you use the recordings uh, and you uh, use DEXMED to sedate the patient and then you get what you call the line of electrophysiology coming from the uh, globus pallidus externa, then the lamina, then the GPI and then the optic tract. So this is the trajectory which you are going to use and you have to be careful to choose the perfect trajectory. So what we do is we use a five lead recording and the uh, recording with the uh, greatest length is used as a final target. And this is the quadripolar electrode. Uh, of course the electrodes have advanced, now we have our octo, uh, you have an eight lead electrode, then you have the directional leads, etc. 
but depending upon the response, you can choose the best lead, the best type of quadripolar ele electrodes. So uh, what, what are the outcomes? If you actually see here, uh, there are three basic types of dystonia. This is the primary forms of dystonia in which the best response are what you call a genetic inheritance called the DYT positives. So the DYT positives have a very good response, while the DIT negatives have a lesser response. Writer's cramps also a good response, but then they also are very good for lesioning. And then Meek's camptocormia have a poorer response compared to primary dystonias. Then you have the hereditary, uh, hereditary degenerative forms in which the pecans, the Leshnihan syndromes and all come. And here pecans do the best of among the degenerative types. So I'm just quickly running through it because of the shortage of time. Uh, then you have what you call the secondary forms of dystonia. Secondary forms of dystonia generally turn to do the worst because the anatomy is usually distorted. But there is one particular form of dystonia known as the tardi in which people do very well with deep brain stimulation. So like I mentioned, these are the primary generalist dystonia. DYT positives do well, uh, spasmodic torticollis, meigs, and secondary dystonias. So what are the long-term outcomes? If you see the long-term outcomes, uh, unlike Parkinson, is that once the patient of dystonia has improved, that improvement is more or less sustained throughout the rest of his life. While in Parkinson's, you have a good response initially, and over 8 to 10 years, actually, the response starts coming better. So in fact, dystonia is easier to program, and the improvement is sustained throughout life. In fact, we have had patients for 15 years who had sustained improvement uh, throughout. In pediatric dystonia, again, a very small group has been done. There's been a meta-analysis meta since 2020 on 76 patients. So what are the uh, average improvement you can include is the improvement in BM, uh, BM scores around 44%, but in DYT1, they have around 65 to 70% improvement. The good prognostic factors, again, shorter disease durations, DYT positives, um, uh, younger age at time of surgery and younger age at disease onset. And if you allow the deformity to uh, become a fixed deformity, then the outcomes are bad. Secondary dystonia and longer distress duration are bad prognostic features. So uh, this was one of the earliest cases which we did from, uh, I think, in 2009. Uh, this is a case of uh, predominantly cervical dystonia, but it also has a generalized component. Uh, So this is the dystonia, and he, and he underwent uh, deep brain stimulation. And you can see he gets a good response. And this response is has been sustained over the uh, past, I mean, past decade. In fact, now we have replaced him with, uh, replaced the battery with the uh, uh, permanent, uh, with a, uh, what, uh, with, a, with a rechargeable battery, which lasts for you know, anywhere between 15 to 20 years. So this was the initial experience which we published in 2014. And this is another case with uh, a DYT positive patient with kyphoscoliosis. So you can see, and the, this patient actually went to multiple places. He was treated for tuberculosis. He was treated for scolio. I mean, he was advised surgery for scoliosis. But the dystonia never got picked up. And they said it was psychogenic because of dystonia, because of the kyphoscoliosis, he was acting like that. But if you see, he had a severe primary generalized dystonia. And when we did the genetic testing, he turned out to be TOR1 tor positive. And uh, this was his gait. And he all, already developed a fixed uh, scoliosis deformity, along with severely increased tone. Uh, this patient underwent bilateral deep brain stimulation. And this was him after surgery. Uh, his gait improved, but scoliosis being a fixed deformity did not improve. And this, he sent us a video from the house almost after six months. And you can see uh, the gait has significantly improved along with a decrease in the dystonia, even though the fixed scoliosis per component remains the same. So he might need some scoliosis correction over a period of time. Yeah. So th this was the scores around 69 to 70%, like I mentioned, in DYT positives, they improve significantly. Uh, this has been our experience with uh, women's scores of around 50%, but our scores are slightly less than literature because we do a lot of uh, 
secondary dystonias and also uh, the fact that not many of our patients have undergone testing for genetic uh, factors, so we don't know the DYT status. Uh, also, pediatric dystonia, we've done around 11 cases, which actually one of the largest in literature, though it appears to be a small amount here. The largest series is 13 cases. Uh, we've had a score of improvement of almost uh, 50 to say, uh, around 50% to 60, 50% in uh, pediatric dystonias which is significant when compared to the preoperative status. So there are some unique cases which I'll just go through. Tardive. Tardive is basically a drug-induced dyskinesias. So this is a patient with a Tardive. Uh, he was on neuroleptic drugs and he developed uh, secondary dystonia. And literature says that Tardives do very well with uh, uh, deep brain stimulation. Uh, he was a school teacher. <coughs> And if you see, he was significantly, uh, quality of life was impaired. Yeah, he underwent uh, deep brain stimulation. And if you see the twisters and the BMFDR scores from time of surgery to the improvement, you can see the significant improvement from 51 to 21 and the motor scores from 43 to 13. So this is him, uh, eight months post or post deep brain, deep brain stimulation. You see, he's almost back to normal. Another thing to notice is the weight gain. Most of these dystonia significantly improve their weight because their hypermetabolic state comes down. Uh, yeah, oh, sir. Oh, sir. <laughs> sir, it went off to the last slide already. <laughs> okay. So then this was the first case of. Uh, Camptochormia. Camptochormia is abnormal bending of the trunk. This was the same pa patient preoperatively, and uh, you can see he was unable to keep his trunk upright. He underwent deep brain stimulation. This is the first case. Actually, there are hardly five to six cases reported in world literature, and this was him almost six years later walking with an upright stance. Then again, Tourette's. Tourette's is, uh, uh, I mean, if you have seen the movie Hitchki, you will realize what Tourette's is. Uh, it is uh, usually uh, abrupt, the repetitive stereotypic movement, stereotype movements, and uh, very difficult to control. And this was the first patient of uh, Tourette's done in India. We did it in 2014, 18-year-old boy. You can see the chest beating and the repeated uh, stereotype movements. So this boy was a student, that time he was in Dubai. So I mean anybody who have seen the uh, film Hitchki will realize this. And this was the same patient post-operatively. He is now 28 and just joined a government job and this is his post-op uh, imaging. So this was the first case done in India and uh, you can see the improvement from a score of 96 to 27. Uh, yeah. So uh, the, the, of course deep brain stimulation does, does come with complications including uh, Braddock, uh, I mean this is for uh, uh, Parkinson's, uh, but the hardware related complications include infections, lead migrations, etc. I will not touch on ablative surgery, but it has been used for unilateral dystonia, especially writer's cramp, and pallidotomy has been used for uh, isolated generalized dystonia, but there is significant improvement in, clean, uh, in carefully selected patients. So we still do ablative surgeries. We have done almost some 30 to 40 ablation surgeries, but they're basically for patients with hemidystonia and writer's cramp. So uh, I will conclude because of lack of time. Uh, the outcomes depend on careful place in uh, patient selection. And uh, one thing to note for the younger guys is that DBS should not be delayed uh, because of various reasons. And the earlier the DBS, the better the outcome before fixed deformities uh, come into play. So I would like to thank the neurology team, uh, Professor Paul and Ravi and uh, the psychiatry team of Dr. Janathan Reddy. Thank you. Great talk. Uh, uh,
Sir, for uh, dystonia, there is almost no contraindication, yeah. except the anatomy. Dementia, dementia. Dem uh, sorry, dementia is, I mean, is dystonia is you generally don't get dementia. Yeah. Okay. It's for Parkinson's, Parkinson's with yeah. dementia, you, yeah. it's a generally a contraindication. Yeah. But even Parkinson's also, dementia is very unusual. Yeah. Okay. It's only and in Parkinson's plus you get dementia. Yeah. Different, different. Okay, I think we will move on. Uh, with the next uh, talk, uh, it is by Malay, our dear friend from Siliguri. He is going to talk to us on clipping of ACA, ECOM, junction aneurysm without ciliary central resection. Our experience. Good afternoon, everybody. Greetings to you all. Yeah. I'm really grateful to Dr. Ellen Tripathi and his team to invite me in this talk. I am blind in aneurysm clipping because I have seen the stalwart to do all this. I'll be very, very fast. Each and every neurosurgeon should be able to clip aneurysm. Each and every neurosurgeon. Say, aneurysm arising from the A1, A2 junctions are relatively rare, and, but it happens. Whatever you see in the anterior communicating, like superior, inferior, anterior, posterior, same you see in the A1, A, 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 CO2 junction, and maybe in the right side lateral and the left side left lateral. So this is what everybody knows, that all sorts of 11 pairs of vessels over here, all perforatings are very important. And really, if you don't touch much, you don't put the vasosposum, it doesn't happen much. So A2 segment, eventually it goes to the paracular cell, and all this perforator we have to preserve. A1 has got some perforator. M1 has got the perforator, but M1, basically, if you can relax the brain, you don't need to open the sylvian fissure. <coughs> and then all this recurrent artery of Hubner is the most important. These you really see most of the time in the non-rupture aneurysm. When the aneurysm get ruptures, there are subarachnoid hemorrhage, whole the dynamics of the CSF changes because CSF basically the buffer not to have the vasospasm. So if you see, look at here, is there any pointer? You see, this all Hubner, it can come from the anterior communicating, it can come from the anterior cerebral, even if it can come from the A2 also sometimes. So what we need, we always know that the gyrus rectus is to be resected most of the time, but it may not be necessary just to, this is the gyrus rectus, just to, this is the olfactory sulcus, this is the olfactory nerve, so this should be the gyrus sector. We can preserve this by just putting a gel foam here, here and a big cottonoid. And see, these are the cisterns. Four cisterns we are to, um, uh, we are to decompress. One is cortico-optic cistern, one is sylvian cistern, one is lamina terminalis, and one is interoptic. Interoptic cistern doesn't have any vessels, but lamina terminalis has got all these vessels. And sylvian cisterns, it depends upon how is the relaxation of the brain. But one of the neurosurgeons, forgot the name, his name is Beach. He always does lumbar puncture to reduce the CSA pressure and to relax the brain like anything so that he doesn't need to retract. <clears throat> so these sorts of cisterns which I just mentioned, and the terrional craniotomy is the most of the very standard and very easy going opening. So these 11 vessels you see very difficult when the patient has already got hemorrhage and in the young people because the brain is swollen and all this subarachnoid hemorrhage has got fibrin adhesion and there is inflammation and a lot of the uh, uh, vascular articles, I mean blood vessels, hemoglobin are there, they make a mess glued together in that area. So choice of the side of the craniotomy always to so the dominant place and retraction should be very nice and somebody like Spaisler and Harnish Joa, they always retract with the triangular, you know, rectangle 
suction. With that, they retract. <coughs> and exposure of the epsilon one segment is needed. And you know this gyrus excess resection, it is needed, but it may not be required also. So I'll straightly go to the, my case. 59 years gentleman who presented with headache, neck stiffness, GCOS was good, otherwise he was fine. So this was the CT scan findings. You see, you can see that the perangular cistern on the circle of, around circle of Willis, there is subarachnoid hemorrhage. And now see, this is the aneurysm. This aneurysm is basically at the junction of the anterior commutator and A1. And see, this is, so this is just optical carotid cisterns I have opened. You see, you can see, it doesn't look very nice for me. You say this is basically, we are coming to the, towards optic, See, already the aneurysm dome is coming. If you look at these areas, the, the, we are not going to the middle cerebral, we are going to the anterior cerebral. So because there we have not opened this cistern. I'm moving a bit fast. So the clip has been applied. See, we have not removed the gyrus rectus also. Now we are trying to see the other part See, it is very difficult to identify here all those perforators, Huebner, lenticulostride, but you have to assume with your anatomy that you try to save almost all vessels if possible. Just work around the dome and neck. If the aneurysm gets rupture also, then also it doesn't matter because if it is ruptured, you can just on the rupture area, you can put a clip and then you try to find out what is happening around. I'm going a bit fast. Okay. Say aneurysm has collapsed. More or less it has collapsed. 
collapsed. Somewhere a rent has been observed, maybe during coagulation by bipolar, I have made it, so we had to make an another clip. See, see now the aneurysm is obliterated and there is no bleeding, brain is soft, and you are comfortable. So your job is done. See, this is a post-operative CTNU. This is the terrenal craniotomy. This is the person whom I operated. As it is the left side, I would like to see the motor or comprehension problem of the patient. See, he is following command. He is understanding. He is left-sided terrenal craniotomy. We have not much damage on the speech area or any other area, no ischemia is much more, nothing is there, so craniotomy is good and the patient is fine, so job is done. Now the, you see, this patient I got in Shiliguri sometimes night at 2 o'clock, then this, oh, there is, I mean coiling, I don't like it, as simple as that. Now clipping, each and every people can, it is nothing but a dissection, simple dissection. You just open the all skull base, go to each and every vessels and gradually dissect. And I did the next day morning because before having total adhesion on the base of the brain so that all becomes glued together and it becomes difficult. So, uh, so that is what is I feel that we should learn. So what I see, daily uh, debate likely to persist since both methods have their advantage as well as drawbacks. Despite major developments in endovascular technology, studies have shown that patients undergoing coiling have lower obliteration rates leading to recurrence rate is 7.2% and clipping is zero. And higher Retreatment, coiling is 4.9%, clipping is zero. If you can do it, do the job correctly. Final decision ultimately relies on aneurysm morphology and characteristics, individual patient consideration, medical combo comorbidities, and center expertise is also important. Since conclusively, we believe that gentle lateral basal frontal retraction to the side of the sylvian fissure permits rapid identification of ipsilateral A1 and A2, and improve aneurysm exposure. Risk of individual uh, inadvertent damage to the frontal and temporal lobes, especially in case of tight sylvian fissure, gets minimized. Gyrus resection can also be avoided in some cases. We do not intend to modify the standard approach of sylvian splitting. However, we report our experience on the basis of our anatomic understanding of the techniques and believe that good therapeutic results can be obtained through it. Thank you very much for patience here. Uh, Thank you. Uh, just a couple of comments. Uh, it's a, uh, as you, it's you told, the various projections of ACOM artery aneurysm, it can project anteriorly, anteriorly, superiorly, to superior, posteriorly, posteriorly. The one, if your, your topic is current, so you told that lifting of ACA ACOM aneurysm without sylvian fissure dissection. One projection where it is mandatory to open sylvian fissure and then go and because you know if you if there is an inferior projection, if the dome of the aneurysm is stuck to the parallel tuberculum, the first you retract that is 
time itself, aneurysm will rupture. So inferiorly projecting echo artery aneurysm. You have to do Chilean fissure dissection, go and uh, see everything and then only come. Uh, that is one point which I have to make, inferiorly right. projecting. And then, gyrus retract, that, and you told that you will always go from the side of dominant. That also may not be correct because you superiorly projecting aneurysm. It is the fork you look for, A2 fork. You should go from the side where the ipsilateral A2 is posterior. So if ipsilateral A2 is posterior, that fork is open. Then you, the superior projection aneurysm is easy. Suppose the ipsilateral A2 is uh, anterior. Uh, sorry, ipsilateral A2 is anterior. Suppose, so you should go from the side where ipsilateral A2 is anterior. If ipsilateral A2 is posterior, it comes like that. You cannot go there. For that, it is mandatory you should take out the right. gyrus vectors. Understand? So, inferior projecting aneurysm, I beg to deserve that all youngsters, everybody, unless you are a master, you should not retract the frontal lobes because it can rupture the aneurysm. Understand? That is the only thing. Otherwise, excellent presentation. Anybody, any comments, I think we can move on, no? Okay. Uh, next is uh, uh, by my co-chair, uh, uh, I think next is my co-chair, uh, A.K. Srivastav. Current concepts in the management, of, sorry, concepts in the management of Manila Vastav. Yes. Uh, after that, two more. Right. Top Kutavara. Right? <laughs> Good evening and thanks to Dr. Tripathi and his team for inviting me here for uh, concepts in management of mendoblastoma I decided to choose. So this is a history that was, was first described by okay. Belly and Harvey Cushing in 1925. It's the most common pediatric tumor. Most cases of medulloblastoma arise sporadically, but may also be in many other associative symptoms like Gorlin syndrome, blue rubber blip syndrome, turquoise syndrome, rumestin tabby syndrome, and leaf febron syndromes. This is a timeline of key discoveries. We are interested in because 1926 it started first, then 1953. Surgery, histopathology, adjuvant therapy, and molecular genetics. Now we are focusing on this molecular genetics. <coughs> WHO defined uh, medulloblastoma into two general categories that is, histologically defined medulloblastoma and genetically defined. Histologically defined, already we have already the following this, but uh, now genetically defined is WNT activated, SHS activated, T53 uh, mutant. SSS activated and T53 wild type. Wild type. Non-WNT and non-SS type, which are last group is further divided into group 3 and group 4. This changes the management protocol for chemotherapy. Surgery and radiotherapy is the same, but chemotherapy changes. This is the molecular subgroup where 
we can see that genetic uh, cytogenetic events chromosome 6 loss w and t loss whereas loss and gain of these two chromosomes this is important now we are doing this and this is deciding about the treatment protocol classification algorithm is that in w and 2 2 and 2 of the following should be there beta catenin mutation monosomy 6 methylene proliferating pattern consistent with WNT and gene expression pattern. So all this is like uh, SH, my SH gap 3, gap 1 and SHS signaling SP mutation. Group 3 and group 4 should have one of the, these methylation or gene expression to decide about the group 3 and group 4. Cell of origin changes like the in WNT is basically dorsal brainstem ventricular zone progenitor, which is early in embryonic development. Whereas SHH group cerebral granulation granular cell or neural stem cell, and group three and four is cerebral granular cell precursor, which occurs later in embryonic uh, development through abnormal neural differentiation or deregulation or at apoptosis, which is most dangerous, most severe. Clinical presentation, all of you know. MRI investigation, we have done with the MRI with the gold standard. But the now people are coming up with the radio genomics. That is field focusing and establishing multi-scale association between medical imaging and gene expression data. What we have found that WNT, if this is WNT, we found that this is CP angle midline, whereas enhancement is present and hemorrhage is also present. But in SHS group, it is hemispheric and enhancement is present, but there is no hemorrhage or less hemorrhage rather. Group three and group four are midline, whereas they have shown no minimal, minimal or no enhancement and hemorrhage is seen in group four. These are different uh, radio genomics classification. You know, you all know Chang's staging system. We, have, we are following this for management point of view. So treatment is multi-modality approach, surgical dissection, craniospinal irradiation, combination of chemotherapy. Here is the change which has occurred because of genetic predisposition and genetic analysis. The goals of surgical management is maximum safe resection, tissue diagnosis, relieving mass effect from the tumor, whereas relieving symptomatic hydrocephalus. These are the main points. Like CSF drainage for relaxation is very important in these cases for surgical resection. Whereas two approaches you can take with a transfermian or trans telovelar approach. Transfermian approach. Can I show you the slide? I'll this is a midline arachnoid is open. Our sister magna is open. This is vermis, this is transvermian approach. And CSF is drained so that the cerebellum become relaxed. This is upper vermis and there is a lower vermis. Lower vermis is this. Tumor surfaces is diva spreadaged. Now the lower part is decompressed and decompressed with showed flow floor of fourth ventricle. <coughs> tumor from the floor of fourth ventricle is gently separated. Lateral and deeper part of the tumor is dissected and removed. Floor of fourth ventricle is cleared now.
aqueduct sylvius that is important end point of the surgery is the clearance of the aqueduct sylvius and free flow of csf so in telovirular approach the tela choroidea and inferior mandibular velum which form the lower half of the roof of the fourth ventricle are opened and the lower vermis is retracted as a unit to provide exposure to fourth ventricle this is again video for uh, this is uh, exposure suboccipit c1 and c2 atlanto occipital membrane yeah this is the rx band now so over the bay over the spinal cord and brain stem which is open so that the csf is drained out and pressure is released and at this stage we take the biopsy of the arachnoid as well as csf both for mandibuloblastoma this is a tonsil pica tumor we are seeing here and this is a cerebellomedullary fissure this telovirular approach and this is a tela choroida which forms the roof of the fourth ventricle this is open and now the tumor is dissected all round surface devascularized and use of cusa is important because of avoidance of uh, any traction over the brain stem this is of choroidal plexus of the fourth ventricle floor of the fourth ventricle is cleared of the tumor and then use of cusa and the residual tumor is being taken out the lateral part of the tumor is being dissected from the cerebellum and floor of the fourth ventricle is exposed so the gross pathology which we found ha huh, that reminds me that the first case was wnt whereas the second case was shh positive this was the microscopic pathology and the management of hydrocephalus in for few cases we started with short division of uh, dexamethasone and pre operatively we did extra ventricular external ventricular drainage following resection between 10 to 14% of patients have hydrocephalus requiring csf diversion <coughs> so one canadian pre operative prediction rule was uh, developed which has shown variables if it is more than 2 years 3 score papilledema 1 moderate to severe hydrocephalus 2 severe metastasis 3 and if score was more than 5 or equal to 5 were taken as a high risk for the management of chemotherapy uh, after surgery and radiotherapy chemotherapy these are the complications which we faced the oh, most important was cerebellar mutism which arises in 20 to 48 hours 
post operatively diminished speech to mutism. It was divided to, from dividing the cerebral, vas cerebral vascular vermis or detection on medial cerebral surface, which we later on we did the telovelar approach and we didn't apply any retractors over there. Of course, brainstem invasion is the one of the cause of cerebral mutism. So, according to that, we just stratified that risk, uh, low risk, standard, high risk, and very high risk, uh, depending upon the molecular characteristic. 11, chromosome 11 loss, non-metastatic, and no chromosome loss in standard risk, whereas metastatic, high risk, and very high risk. High risk cases are like case, age is three years or younger, and diagnosis, leptomeningeal dissemination, residual tumor is more than 1.5 square centimeter, and metastatic stage. Can you go back on and go? Uh, okay, okay, okay. Okay, okay, next one. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> risk stratification and radiotherapy protocol, which is what we are following, for high risk patients, post FOSI radiation 54 to 58 gray with high dose craniospinal radiation followed by adjuvant chemotherapy. For average risk, post surgical radiation, the same one, but reduced dose craniospinal radiation with a 23.4 gray followed by adjuvant chemotherapy. And a role of conformable boost radiation and proton beam radiation has protective role owing to dose limitation to cochlea and temporal loops. Two cases I had sent to Chennai, proton beam, Dr. Rupesh. So they are doing well. Chemotherapy protocol, we have again standardized risk and following regime A, which contains cisplatin, lomostin, and vincristin, whereas regime B is cisplatin, cyclophosphamide, and vincristin. These are 8 to 14 day cycles and different. Surveillance imaging considered every 3 to 6 months especially during the first two years of follow-up. Frequent imaging is questionable right now. Absence of progression on cranial MRI has been found to be highly predictive of absence of progression on spinal MRI. Whereas recurrent disease can be present at primary location, posterior being the most common site or a distant site, and no effective curative treatment for the recurrent disease is present, except that re-surgery. So this case was a very interesting case. Four-year-old boy presented with nausea and vomiting. On examination, child was agitated, crying. This was his uh, MRI. Mass with patchy enhancement and associated metastatic lesion located throughout the cerebral hemisphere. This was initial presentation. Post-operative MRI, this is post-op. The medial portion of the lesion has been taken care of. But the lesion remains in the bilateral, semis, bilateral uh, cerebral hemisphere, totaling 1.5 centimeter square. So we took it as a high risk case. And post op radiotherapy, there has been some interval in improvement of leptomeningeal spread and nodular lesions. However, there has been recurrence for disease in fourth ventricle, even after chemotherapy. High risk case. This lady, uh, I operated in 2007. She came up with this uh, MRI, and now after 15 years, she doesn't have any this thing. But her, her chromosomal analysis showed WNT type of uh, uh, loss of six chromosome six and WNT type variety. We have labeled her as a we labeled as a WNT variety, and she is doing well. So various therapies have emerged as a high priority as treatment success has improved drastically in recent decades. And among the recent advances, molecular subgroup is certification of mandoblastoma. And guided chemotherapeutic regimes hold the most promise for targeted future therapies after surgical intervention. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Srivastava, for that excellent overview. A uh, couple of comments. Yeah. I'll say, uh, for very high risk case, uh, do you resort to autologous stem cell rescue? and high-dose chemotherapy. 
that is one of the things we will do for high dose the, chemotherapy we and the stem cell started. risk the stem cell uh, the stem cell we have not because yes, uh, one case was reported one case had been reported which is which does not show any um, no, no, advantage no no autologous stem cell rescue with the high dose chemo is recommended for uh, high, high risk, risk high risk high risk uh, and let me one more thing your group 3 and group 4 what is the difference actually now what i thought you should Group four usually show enhancement. Group three will not show enhancement. Oh. You showed both won't show enhancement. Hemorrhage. The difference is hemorrhage. Hemorrhage. Enhancement. Group four will show enhancement. Three three will not enhance. Three will not enhance because my cases all cases they have enhanced. Hemorrhage was not there. Why why P fifty three mutation is a poor prognostic indicator for SSH. But not for uh, wind. Why it is not a, a poor uh, prognostic indicator for WND type? That might. Okay. <laughs> okay then. Thanks. Eh? Thank you very much. And uh, we go to the next session uh, where you know I should invite uh, uh, Professor K B Bhattacharji ji, a history of a legendary neurosurgeon. Is he around? Sir, you can please come, sir. You can start talking now only, sir. <laughs> so we'll do the felicitation at the end of this, and then the closure ceremony. Yeah, yeah, yeah. After oh no, after this means after this session, of course, Saurav. Saurav is a dear friend. Mouse, <coughs> take Uh, chairpersons and dear friends, today it must be a very peculiar day in the history of neurosciences, not only in Calcutta or India, maybe in the whole world. Because I guess this will be the first time a neurophysician will talk about a neurosurgeon. The reason, twofold. The reason, twofold. One, my very, very good friend, lucky in consultation with Harsh and Sunandan, the entire neurosurgical team loves me so much I don't know for what reason they decided they would ask me to talk on that and number two is that many of you know that I have got a kind of an obsessive addiction interest in history of neurology not only neurology of medicine as a whole But intentionally, I've kept the name unknown to you. A great neurosurgeon. Then few names immediately crop up in the mind. Is it the father of neurosurgery, Harvey Kushin? Is it his one-time student and later his betinoia, Walter Edward Dandy? Is it Sir Victor Horsley? Is it well, the Penfield, is it Paul Busey? Egas Monitz, he worked as a physician in London, in Lisbon, but I personally rate him as a surgeon, a man who had the guts to inject into the carotid. In 1927, or did a prefrontal leucotomy for which he got the Nobel, is not a physician, he's a surgeon. Two, somebody in the present generation. Who am I going to talk about? The this is at the insistence of Lucky. Lucky told me <coughs> to speak on this great man. A humble tribute <coughs> to a supreme genius. Now, I think some of you possibly know that I wrote a book, Writing is My Passion, My Obsession in a Way, in 2011, eminent neuroscientists, their lives and works, and that included not only physicians, surgeons, pathologists, imaging people, whatever. There were 127 men there. The names I told you right now they were all included in that book, about five to six, seven pages I wrote on them. 
but I didn't include this great man for the simple reason that book didn't contain any article on anybody who was alive at that time because it creates problems and complications. Now we are here. I forget the name of the surgeon. You might be able to recall that one great surgeon, Thomas or uh, Brown, something like that. Thomas Brown. Thomas Brown from Queen Square. This is the tribute. In a small village of lies in Turkey, two things happened. One, an earthquake took place. And second, Mahmoud Ghazi Yasugil was born. Nobody knows which one is the cause or which one is the effect. I mean, I can't think of any greater tribute from a human being to another human being. Professor Yasser Gill, in his younger days, appareled in the apron, a trainee, at present, you see it? Can I use the cursor? Yeah. At present, he's aged 97 now. He was born in 1925. Well, obviously, this one, he's with the operating microscope, but it with somebody else, but it clearly suggests that it was not in the OT because he's not in his OT gown. So it was in his lab. We'll come to that. He's, it was a Turkish and his early education was at Arkana, which happened to be once upon a time the capital of Turkey. He visited Germany for his medical studies and studied medicine at the Friedrich Schiller University at Jena, which is Switzerland. And his whole life he worked, up to 1994, he worked at Zurich. When I went to Zurich for a meeting, I happened to visit just because we were taken there. His mentor was a great man, Hugo Kreinbull, who was from Zurich. It was in 1953 that he started working in the neurosurgery department after his return from Germany. And he started with the Basel University of Zurich. From 57 to 65, there he worked, and there he did the transpalatinal exploration of the hypothesis in frogs for a research work. Now, this is Greek to me, this is alien to me. The neurosurgeons will understand the gravity of this work. He was an assistant professor, he moved to USA. He, he was an assistant professor and then a professor at the University of Vermont, USA from 65 to 67. And the first brain bypass surgery was done on the 30th of October 1969 with Peyton Dooney in a surgical microscope. He returned to Zurich first as an associate professor in 69 and then the professor, the chairman in 1973. And this he continued till 1993 when he retired. 1925 born, 1993 retired. But this giant of a man with endless enthusiasm couldn't stop there, and he hasn't stopped yet, I know. He moved to Arkansas University, where he's still active in operations, teaching and research but Harsh told me, day before yesterday, that he is no longer operating. You people will know better than me. I mean, he's aged 97. I presume that at the most he is possibly assisting others or advising others on certain matters of operation.
But after graduation, he started performing experimental microanastomosis. That's very important. He started in a lab. He, direct, he didn't go directly into the human being. He started working in the lab on small vessels and on autopsies. And in psychiatry, he had a stint where one patient revealed a tumor in the brain. He met his mentor, Trianbull, in Zurich, and he mastered techniques utilized by Cushing, Dandy, and Horsley. He spent some time on cerebral angiography in the animal lab on vascular anastomosis. At the moment I uttered the word cerebral angiography, my mind goes back to Igas Monitz. A few words will not be out of context. It was in 1927 that they did this operation and he presented before the French in a French in a, in a, in a, in a meeting in France. Though he was awarded the Nobel Prize not for this operation but for prefrontal leucotomy in intractable schizophrenia. So Monitz first did the cerebral angiography and I can't think of it but somebody injecting a needle injecting a needle into the carotid artery. In the lab, he developed microsurgical skills with microneurosurgery, and he had an outstanding acumen in developing microsurgical techniques, which you, the surgeons, I think I'm the only physician here, and Modusha is there. I think we are the two physicians here. You all know what all techniques he devised. He had immense patience, and he was not game for fast neurosurgery. He operated under bright light, sharp adjustable magnification, and his modification of the operating microscope. I heard it from a man who trained with him. You have, many of you must have worked with him or at least seen him in action. His microscope is something very special which moves with a head tilt. He just touches the microscope. You all know that. And it moves. He doesn't have to use a, his hand for movement or for, mag or for uh, adjustment from high low power to high power, etc., etc. And he developed numerous microsurgical instruments. The, another person in the world I know of who devised an immense number of micro instruments is Michael DeBakey in cardiosurgery from Texas University. Once I was going through his biodata, I mean, what all, how many, hundreds of instruments he discovered, I mean, he invented. He named the bipolar forceps, Mali's forceps, and the adjustable non-traumatizing brain retractor as the Leela forceps. This is after his friend and his daughter. He felt the equipment in those days in neurosurgery inadequate and insufficient. So he was in search of some new developments in the surgical technique and surgical instruments. He made important contributions such as what I said, the floating microscope and angiography instruments. A microscope used in brain surgery, the outstanding role in the removal of aneurysms and he's revolutionized this field. I first came to know about Professor Yasagil in the mid 80s when the concept of anastomosis between the superficial temporal artery and the middle cerebral artery as a bypass operation for a stroke was pretty hot. That was the first time I heard about it, but I understand now, I don't know I'm right or wrong. This operation basically couldn't uh, stand the test of time. Nobody does it. That's what I gather. Maybe I'm wrong, I don't know. You, you can tell me later. His remarkable achievements were the extra intracranial bypass surgery, which I said, this was in 1967. He did 130 operations in the same year and 7,500 till 1993. That was in Zurich. He spared branches of the anterior communicating artery during surgery. I don't know how important it is. You all know what it means. He introduced techniques a craniotomy in 1984 through a pathway which is given the name Yasser Gil Highway. He treated epilepsy and brain tumors with instruments of his own design and he differentiated micro-AVMs from angiographically occult ones. 
Sometimes in angiography you may not find an aneurysm, the microaneurysm. He defined them as AVMs with an idus of less than one centimeter. There were four types of the sylvian fissure that he identified during the operations. And he has been generally accepted, his classification as the most perfect of tentorial mirin tumors. This is for you. It's Greek to me, Hebrew to me, whatever you can say. No idea what I'm showing you. Please make out for yourselves what are all these. Some. This is just a glimpse of what he devised. Uh, th this, kind of a, this kind of a projection, a picture, at least 10 I can show before you, his own designs. Larry Rogers has recently written a book, The Father of Modern Neurosurgery. It's a biography on Yasukul. I was going through the review of that book for the preparation of my talk. And there he wrote on the outcome of cerebral angiography. I'm, I'm a bit perplexed about it. You can tell me what this situation was. He was shocked when he saw the X-ray images. He examined them first in the dark room before the development. He found that the middle and the anterior cerebral arteries were not apparent, as expected. So he did a carotid and obviously. He saw the basilar artery instead, as it lay against the brainstem, along with the posterior cerebral and the superior cerebellar arteries. So it means he injected the posterior circulation, the vertebral artery. But he had never seen a vertebral angiogram before that, and he went straight to his mentor. Look, the vertebral artery. And Cranbull stared at the film in disbelief. It was true. The vessels of the posterior fossa were now clearly opacified. Now, is it a serendipity? I'm, I'm asking the neurosurgeons, how could it happen? Atul and, uh, Atul and I have a question to ask you. How could it happen? How, while doing a carotid, that escaped, but the posterior basilar that was revealed by serendipity, but how? Yeah, we got excited when we did that, Kalanda. We used to get excited. Oh, I see. The moment we inject and we slowly withdraw hmm. to make sure we are in the carotid, but we get excited. <laughs> Sir, we got a vertebral angiogram. Oh, I see. <laughs> This is above my brain. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> so this is what happened. So he is the inventor of the posterior circulation imaging as well in a serendipitous manner. Sir, you have three minutes more. Yes. It's so over before that. Yes. It will be over before that. Yes. Thank you. Peter Janetta, he described. Quickly he removed the cotton pledges, triangular had applied, and began to dissect the aneurysm's neck free of additions. In a minute or so, the full extent of the neck was visible. Carefully he slipped the clip into the aneurysm's neck and released its spring. Instantly the aneurysm slumped to one side limp. In another few seconds he removed the temporary clips and watched the internal carotid artery refill with blood. The aneurysm still limp, now no longer a threat. Jaineni, the patient's name, awoke in the recovery room as if Nothing has happened. Simplest of all operations were carried out. Together with Cushing, hailed as the greatest neurosurgeon of the 20th century, trained around 3,000 colleagues from all over the world, several hundred, obviously, national conferences, international, etc., etc., 330 papers, 13 monograms, and his sixth volume publication to micro neurosurgery is the most comprehensive review on the subject. 73 to 75, President of the United Schools, and it is nothing for him and neurosurgery's man of the century, 50 to 99, because before that we had Cushing and Dandy and Horsley and others, Penfield. This was offered, was honored in the Congress of the Neurological Surgeons annual meeting in 2007. <coughs> so at the request of Lucky, I finished my talk with the same slide, the greatest tribute <coughs> a man can offer to another human being. No one knows which one is the cause and which one is the effect. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
You have ten minutes, ten minutes. Very good afternoon. I am thankful to Tripathi sir, uh, Harsh sir and Sunandan sir for giving me the opportunity to talk. Uh, just the genesis of this talk, because we have uh, seen and learned from mesmerizing neurosurgeons like Professor Atul Goel and Suresh Nair sir on these last two days. I would just, uh, a brief backdrop of this uh, small uh, topic of mine was that I, like all truant neuroanesthetists, I hesitated on doing this case with sir. So, sir said, okay, well, let's go ahead and we'll uh, definitely be fruitful. And it became a learning point for me. So, coming uh, to this topic, it's a double trouble in neurocritical care. So, <coughs> this was a 43-year-old female uh, with a severe headache two weeks back. As you can all see, the CT scan brain showed uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage. She was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis in 2005 and was not on any immunotherapy. Just going to with the background of this, she had a relapsing remitting type of disease, diagnosed with transverse myelitis, started losing her vision, was on pulsed corticosteroids and cyclophosphamide, for which she improved a bit of her power. But uh, as you can see that she definitely had a diagnosed multiple sclerosis, demyelinating CNS lesions and was on uh, um, some amount of immunomodulating drugs. She uh, this she was diagnosed in CMC Velour. So uh, they, what happened is that they also diagnosed her with a spinal intramedullary lesion and uh, they had operated her and they found extensive demyelination and a thinned out cord. And then uh, as in view of a worsening disease, she was put on interferon therapy and she was released. So this was long back. Now, she comes to us with a ruptured SH with a poor grade aneurysm, we uh, decide to clip her. So <clears throat> the one point that I want to highlight in this case was that she had extensive, uh, extensive exfoliative skin lesions, which we consulted the dermatology. They said it's probably a drug allergy. It was a lot of ambiguity, a staphylococcal epidermidis. Anyways, uh, we couldn't make the diagnosis till then. So the DSA confirmed an ACOM and we went ahead with clipping. So I will not discuss all these perioperative challenges and anesthetic challenges, they are always there. So just going to the post-operative course, on day one and day two, she was almost M5 preoperatively. She became M1. We thought it might be a new onset infarct, it might, it might be a, a bad ABG picture. So it was a bad ABG picture, but the CT scan was almost normal. There were, the clip was in situ. There was no new infarct, no acute hydrocephalus. But generally, uh, the next day onward, she started her, uh, her creatinine level started increasing. We had to take a nephro opinion. So on a slight discussion with the nephrologist, we sent her autoimmune panel. And then to our surprise, to my surprise also, it turned out to be a lupus. So this is one of the second case that I handled in my life. The first one being in my institute, All India, where uh, I had a case of scleroderma presenting with a aneurysm. So coming to the review of uh, literature, just uh, there is a coexistence of SLE and multiple sclerosis. And that's what I just wanted to highlight this only one slide that it is rarely reported, 17 cases till now worldwide. So probably we have a case here in our, in our hospital. So 
they can coexist and the reason mostly it is with uh, relapsing remitting type the there are several etiopathogenesis and lot has been discussed in literature but what makes this case unique in my in our hospital is that mostly all the literature had already diagnosed the autoimmune disorder prior to going to surgery in this case there was already a demyelinating lesion we operated it and the second lesion, second demyelinating disorder or autoimmune disorder manifests after the surgery so that's something that is different here so the incidence is 3.9% to almost as high as 14% they can present with ischemic stroke sacular aneurysms berries aneurysms so the terminology here they have discussed in this study is neuroplastic vasculitis arterial outpouching causing degradation of the endothelium and extracellular matrix so the implication from the neurosurgery or the neuroanesthesia side is this two things the DIND and the DCI delayed ischemic neurodeficit and the delayed cerebral ischemia where we have a study in the Asian Journal of Neurosurgery that their delayed ischemic DIND after aneurysmal SH in autoimmune diseases they have a good amount of volume of cases where they have documented this in our case till the 7th to the 10th day post-operative she remained M1 we had to tracheostomize her and then slowly so it's almost been a month that she is in our hospital she has become M6 again so that's the good outcome that I want to project here so why the two questions why the SLE was not diagnosed early coexistent diseases they mask the lesser dominant unless there is a stressor in this case it is a subarachnoid hemorrhage and it remains quiescent for a long time it has been documented and there were overlapping symptoms so do we operate so when sir called me up that day that what went through your mind when you said no to my case so <coughs> there I want to just is one learning point to me yes we should so this is a systematic review and uh, uh, of a record linkage study of risk of subarachnoid hemorrhage in people admitted to hospital with selected immune mediated disease and they have the last one I just uh, I'm sorry that's the systemic lupus erythematous which I have wanted to highlight it has the maximum incidence of a uh, uh, of uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage with immune mediated disease they say that they some there is a mortality benefit if you clip the aneurysm early but the Glasgow outcome scale being 5 to 6 that is a severe upper and lower disability at 3 months of the study so it's a data compiled the largest I could find since 1999 to 2011 so with this I just summarize a very rare entity multi-system involvement always a challenge for the neuroanesthetist but definitely the one thing that I want to highlight she was not on any immune therapy in few of the case trials that I or case reports series that I came across patients on immune therapy have a better outcome post clipping so that's the thing that we should keep in mind we should continue the immune therapy and early surgery is always helpful thank you so much thank you thank you, thank you. for that very interesting case just hold on what was the cause of uh, lactic acidosis you have the patient on uh, propofol anesthesia <laughs>
Uh, well, uh, to the younger generation guys over here who are training, neuro navigation and OAM is the one which uh, you would love to have it because you don't know when one of the lawyers or the judges, I don't want to call them by name because many of my, uh, my classmates, they would go in the court and say that why didn't you use it and they would fine you. And they can do it and someone in the medical council will also say yeah, you should have used it like an odd man out. Uh, but saying again, but you have to be with the basic things like prof over here that you need to know your anatomy. It's whether you use a neuro navigation, it's just like a flight path. I was other day unfortunately on a flight and had the worst life experience which you all probably know that we were in a free fall and everything and by the time I landed I thought I'm going to die. And it was frankly speaking, speaking over here and talking about that and that, that I'm going to die and I'm, okay fine. I think so the, while operating it's far more easier when we. But the pilot who was there, he was on a track path. He had to divert it. Then you have a one minute free fall when the plane is just falling down. But he used his manual and his experience to get the flight up. So end of the day you use your C arm, you use your O arm, but still you need the basic concept because the latest case which is going on in UK is with the O arm, one of my, I know him, I shouldn't criticize anybody, has managed to put an L5-2 pedicle screw in the same side. So with our O-arm, they have managed to do it. So this is a, I'm, uh, just, uh, there was no, I want to, the disclaimer regarding the conflict of interest. I haven't taken any financial helping or anything, but would love to take it. Uh, this is what we are thinking. Uh, this is what we are thinking at the moment. It's just a joke, where am I? What, where is my target and where do I reach my target safely? This is the one thing which I should be always for the junior and what type of implant I'm going to use there. And I have to preserve the anatomy. This is the reason I still love to go and uh, sometimes pop into the cadaveric uh, space and see the anatomy and everything. Uh, stealth has been always a dream of mine which I've been using all the time. Uh, just to re reach it safely, uh, just quick word for the juniors that for the stealth uh, with the MRI, the bony anatomy is not good, whereas with the CT scan, if you can fuse it, the bony anatomy would be really good. So this is the other thing which the future which we are seeing, the, this is the stealth tracking your things and everything over here where you can put it your pedicle screw with the latest software but I think so if we can get the software where you can put the uh, C arm and the stealth together it will be an added benefit with increasing using uh, MIS kit the timing of operation has come down a lot the patients are being discharged next day so this is what the thing this is the spine navigation which the kit is there which I'm not able to get it. I have to squeeze my arms to Professor Tripathi to get it, but he won't bend down. He will, it is, no, it's in the airport, we will get it. So I'm waiting for the day when I get this one, the O arm. So once it comes in, I think so a beautiful C arm. If you see the literature and everything, misplacement of screw and everything, that it's less than one person, an experienced hand also. But the O arm, the one thing, the radiation features are pretty less compared to this. So this is the O arm, it's pretty handy. People are using interoperative CT and all the navigations. But other thing is that if we can use these things, it will be beneficial to the newer generations and everything. But I would still, there, there are uh, courses and, uh, which is going on in Bangalore and Goa Medical College where you can still put in the pedicle screws and everything, C1, C2 down. Uh, uh, on the cadaveric, so they, they take all the junctions and everything which you can get the OM. Um, I wouldn't advise Prof because he's a, I don't know, he, uh, when I see him operating on C1, C2, I just get frustrated, when can I do like that? And the, this is what I would say, that discover whatever navigation for posterior cervical fusion, he has this concept and this is pretty good. So with the advent of all these things, what I would say to the younger generations that kindly use it whenever you need it and the navigation is pretty good technique. Thank you very much. Uh, I just want to give thank you to everybody. Yeah. All and the also, sponsors. Uh, just help in felicitating yeah. the last session. Just, uh, I would thank, thank all the sponsors over here. Uh, 
from uh, Medtronic to Mia Surgicals as Linux and also medical super specialty hospitals with the catering services, IT services, they have been really helpful. I don't want to personally, uh, I do want, sorry, personally thank all the speakers over here, Prof is here, all the Prof no, and Prof. Sir, thank, thank you, thank you. you, uh, you have given me the DNB students and there, and we are very proud that all my dear DNB students at the moment are doing well and they have passed their exams and everything and they are get, getting excellent number. As a safe surgeon, that's what I tell them. You don't have to be a very excellent surgeon, but what I tell them is that you have to be a safe surgeon. That's the first criteria for any surgery which you do. Uh, thanks everybody for coming. Where the March date is already announced by Dr. Tripathi uh, for 2020, and I will just felicitate all the other people, please. We finished uh, three minutes ahead of time. Yeah, okay, and, thank and you. Thank you very much, Suresh. Professor so K. you manage a little bit. Professor K. Bhattacharya. Kalanda is left. Okay, we can give him his uh, office is next to mine. Malay, please. Me too. Me too. Sir, well done. We are very, very proud of you and your association has really helped us, you know, in planning various things including uh, publications of very interesting cases. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Dakar. Of course, uh, the last but not the least is my best friend and my younger brother, Dr. Basu. I have one more younger brother, Dr. Zain, of course. But uh, thank you, me too. So uh, with this, uh, this is the cotton closing, and uh, we we. But yeah, I was just going to say that we, unless we thank the ladies who have come all this way, so let me call out uh, Sister Arundhati, please, and uh, Dr. Asmita, please, and uh, our beautiful ladies, Dr. Professor Naina Goel, please, and Dr. Professor Vinita. Nayar, please, please come, all of us will have a photograph together. Well, thank you very much for coming all the way. I know you are rushing for your flight, and of course, she is the last. She will get a special gift. And uh, Mamza, please come. Don't hide. I have to go back home. And uh, may I uh, give this privilege to uh, Dr. Zain, my colleague, to please felicitate the wonderful ladies. <laughs> so, this is for Arundhati, Sister Arundhati. Thank you. This is for Dr. Asmita. Thank you so much. This is for Madam Dr. Goel. Thank you. This is for Dr. Vinita Nair. And this is for my lady. <laughs> so let's have a nice photograph. Thank you, Harsh. Please come here. Anyone wants to be in the picture with the ladies are welcome. Please. And I think everyone, please come. Thank you, please. And thank you all very much.